Let's get Swifty. Often hailed as one of the greatest animated series of all time, Rick and Morty is jam-packed with everything that a media lover enjoys. Pop culture references, a multiverse, dark humor, gross-out humor, the four humors, blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. There's plenty to discover as soon as you look a little deeper, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. We've got over a thousand Rick and Morty facts collected over many years, all packaged in one convenient video, just for you. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. Let's see just how crazy a boy and his grandpa can get. We'll kick things off with the timeline to make sure that everything is laid out nice and easy. No curveballs. Yet. Though this does leave out season 6, but we'll get back to that very soon. For now, here's the complete Rick and Morty timeline. So far, from back in 2019. Remember life before the 20s? You know everything that you're familiar with in your three-dimensional linear experience of space and time? Forget all of that immediately because we're about to embark on a journey of multiverses, universes, and parallel timelines that's so all over the place that I can only hope we don't get Cronenberg'd in the process. That's right, people. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're taking a stroll through the timeline of Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland's Rick and Morty. Some of what you're about to hear is based on unconfirmed fan theories and our own educated musings. With all the mysteries and questions we still have with the end of Season 3 of Rick and Morty, giving this show the definitive timeline treatment is next to an impossible task. If you do have alternate theories on, say, which Morty is the original Morty, then go ahead and let us know in the comments. First, let's get one thing straight. Because this show has so many parallel universes and intersecting timelines, it's important to note that virtually every character in this show has some other parallel universe counterparts. Each reality in this series has its own Rick, its own version of Morty, Summer, Jerry, you get it. Just keep that in mind as we go through this timeline, which is really less of a line and more like a tree with lots of different branches that also got yarn bombed by someone who doesn't know how to knit. Also, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to be taking the Rick and Morty that the series begins with and that Rick and Morty, the show, continues to mostly follow throughout our Rick and Morty. Okay? Does that make sense? No? Great! We're off to a flying start! Okay, pause for deep breath as I curse all of the possible worlds that led me to untangle this insane timeline. Let's get this started. Beth is born around 1980. Let's begin where many fan theorists do, at the birth of Rick's daughter and Morty's mother, Beth. Rick and Morty isn't very clear on exact dates, but in a season two episode where Rick drops Jerry off at Jerry Daycare, he dates the drop off form 11215. And Beth was 17 when Summer was born, and Summer is around 17 at the start of the series. And not much time passes between season one and two of the show, besides six months of frozen time, but Beth isn't aging then, so we can surmise that Beth is around 34 or 35 during most of the series, which means that when she's born, it's around 1980. Beth's mother remains a bit of a mystery. Fan theories range from her being the teacher from the Magic School Bus, Miss Frizzle, to her being a blonde woman Rick is shown having sex with in a memory once who turns into a monster. The latter's been debunked, and the former is, uh, confusing. The only real glimpse we get of Beth's mother isn't all that reliable. I hope you can hear the quotation marks around the word real there. It happens when our Rick is trapped in Galactic Federation prison and fabricates a memory for his captor. The false memory brings Rick back to the day he invented the portal gun, which he says is the day I lost her, presumably referring to Beth's mother. In the memory, she's shown to be a blonde, freckled woman named Diane. As she and Beth are about to join Rick in the car to get some ice cream, a portal appears above their heads, out from which drops an explosive device. Both Diane and Beth are killed. This tragic accident impels Rick to invent the portal gun. And then Rick tells the captor that this is a totally fabricated origin story. Well, good, I'm glad we got that covered then. The short of it is, Beth is born, but we're not sure who gives birth to her. Beth grows up in Froopy Land, and most without her father. 1980s to early 1990s. According to Rick, Beth is a scary f kid because when she's growing up, she constantly asks Rick to make her terrifying toys like a sentient switchblade among many, many, many others. We don't otherwise know too much about the events of Beth's youth, but we do know that Rick creates an entire extremely safe world for her to play in called Froopy Land. In Froopy Land, nothing can hurt you. The ground is rubbery, the water is breathable, and the creatures are harmless. Beth plays in Froopy Land with her friend Tommy, who ends up disappearing in this uh, 
magical land. Beth may have purposely pushed him into a honey pond and left him there, or he accidentally lost his way. Who can say? You decide what to believe. Besides Fruity Land, Beth's childhood takes place in Muskegon, Michigan. During this time, Rick is still mostly absent from Beth's life. Beth later says she only asked Rick to make her those scary toys just because she wanted his attention. So tragic. Rick disappears from Beth's life around 1994 to who even knows what the hell Rick's time frame is. Beth is mostly raised by her mysterious mother. Rick is often gone, something that according to the show's co-creator Dan Harmon, Beth holds against her mom. Meanwhile, Beth continues to idolize her super genius dad. During this time, Rick does a ton of intergalactic traveling. He disappears completely from Beth's life 20 years before the series begins. This would put Beth around age 14. As the show goes on, we get glimpses into what Rick is doing during this time. Mostly, it seems like his rogue anti-establishment actions piss off a lot of beings from all over the galaxy. Rick and his friend Birdperson also likely spend a lot of time together. Pictures in Birdperson's current day house show younger versions of Rick and Birdperson playing in a band together and standing by what appears to be a rudimentary aircraft. Rick and Birdperson also fight in the Bird Wars together. Specifically, they battle at Blood Ridge on Gap Flap's third moon against the Gromflamites. The pair are rebels in the eyes of the Galactic Federation, and the war they fight in this period of Rick's life doesn't end here. To protect themselves from various governments trying to hunt them down, a large group of Ricks on the central finite curve, whatever that means, form the Citadel of Ricks. Essentially, they create a government comprised of Ricks to protect themselves from other governments. Our Rick was never keen on the Citadel, seeing as he is the Rickest Rick of them all, and it's a very Rick thing to do to distance yourself from any kind of governing body, apparently even if it's yourself. The Citadel is said to be at least 15 years old, so it comes into existence before Morty, who is 14, is born. However, many Mortys inhabit the Citadel today. Beth and Jerry get pregnant at prom, around 1997. While Rick is off adventuring, his daughter Beth is living a normal teenage life. She meets Jerry Smith, who takes her on a date during their senior year of high school to the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, performing the music of Alan Silvestri in the park. This is where Beth and Jerry have their first kiss. Beth and Jerry end up going to prom together. That night they have sex, and Beth gets pregnant with Summer. In Dimension C-137, and the dimension our Rick and Morty travel to mid-season 1, Beth considers getting an abortion, but ends up having the baby instead. Beth and Jerry don't get pregnant at prom, alternate 1997. But Beth doesn't give birth to Summer in every dimension. In Dimension C-500A, Beth gets the abortion after prom night and doesn't end up marrying Jerry. Thus, Summer is never born, neither is Morty, and Beth and Jerry go on to have their separate successful lives. Beth becomes a renowned surgeon operating on humans instead of horses, as she does in C-137. And Jerry becomes a famous actor, starring in Cloud Atlas and Tom Hanks's role and doing cocaine with Johnny Depp. Both are lonely in their success, however, and end up eventually finding each other and reuniting in C-500A. Morty is born both with and without Rick, around 2000. Beth and Jerry have Morty three years after Summer is born. At this time, Rick is still out of the picture, and Morty grows up to be your regular, average Morty. But let's part ways with our Morty and slip into a different hypothetical timeline, shall we? Now, this is mostly conjecture, but I'm only getting into it because it stems from a very compelling fan theory that we covered on Cartoon Conspiracy once. You should go check it out. As I already mentioned, our Rick seems to have memories of a baby Morty, which doesn't make sense if he only entered Morty's life right around the beginning of Season 1, when Morty is 14. This could be caused to believe that our Rick actually comes from a different dimension, one where he was around for Morty's early childhood. In this timeline, the fan theory goes that our Rick grew up closely with his Morty and taught him everything. As a result, that Morty got to be super smart, approaching Rick genius level. For some reason or another, our Rick abandons this Morty, maybe because he realized he was becoming evil, maybe because the two geniuses were increasingly at odds. Either way, this abandoned Morty, who grows up to become evil Morty, will get to him more later, begins to plot ways to gain power over all Ricks. Or maybe he just wants his own original grandfather back, who knows. His actions later in the series could mean that neither or both of these scenarios are true. We know that our Rick has declared himself Rick C-137. If he's the Rick from the world of evil Morty, then there are two explanations. Either he started pretending to be C-137 once he entered that world, the one he inhabits at the beginning of the season, or he is indeed from C-137, and our Morty is not. Our Rick returns to Beth's life, he and Morty begin adventuring around 2014. Finally, the series begins in what's probably Dimension C-137. Yes, I know it might not be, but let's just stick with that for now. Rick, wasted of course, wakes Morty up in the middle of the night to take him on their first joint adventure of the show, which almost destroys the entire world. Luckily, it doesn't, so that they can go on another adventure. Rick takes Morty out of school to help him retrieve a mega fruit seed, which has the power of making you super smart. Rick makes Morty hide the mega fruit seed way up inside his butthole to get past intergalactic customs, which they do, but not without leaving multiple aliens dead in their way. When Rick and Morty return to Earth, Beth and Jerry are prepared to ban Morty from going 
on any further adventures with Rick, because, you know, they want him to go to school instead. Then the Mega Seed, which is still in Morty's butt, kicks in, making him appear incredibly smart. Both Beth and Jerry reconsider the band since Morty is clearly learning from his adventures with Rick, sort of. Rick excitedly rants about all the adventures he and Morty will go on once Beth and Jerry leave the room. Meanwhile, Morty is experiencing the after effects of the Mega Seed. He loses all intelligence and starts drooling and twitching on the garage floor, but whatever, the effects are temporary. Probably. In the period that follows, things are about as normal for the Smith family as they can possibly be. Rick gives the family dog Snuffles human-level sentience, Rick and Morty visit a theme park that exists inside the body of a homeless man, aliens trap Rick and Morty and accidentally Jerry inside a simulation so they can steal Rick's formula for concentrated dark matter, you know, the usual stuff. Morty also tries to lead an adventure with Rick where they end up going to a court for murdering giants and Morty is almost sexually assaulted by a jelly bean. Meanwhile, Beth achieves self-actualization with a Meeseeks and Jerry kind of improves his golf game, but not without some existential horror. You know how golf is. Rick and Morty destroy their version of reality, and I guess we're not doing dates anymore because at this point the series has started, so we're not going to be focusing on dates anymore. Until we will. Again, stay tuned. We know, or are at least pretty sure, that our Rick and Morty inhabit C-137 in episodes 1 through 6. Then, Rick makes a big mistake. He brews a love potion for Morty that's supposed to make Jessica, Morty's crush, fall in love with him. It doesn't go as planned. Okay, it does it first, Jessica falls for Morty, but then to make a longish story short, the potion makes everyone else in the world fall in love with Morty, and then it turns them all into Cronenbergs. Based on writer-filmmaker David Cronenberg's famous fleshy body horror monsters, the Cronenberg people of C-137 are frankly terrifying. Our Rick and Morty decide to abandon this world for what we'll simply call the New Dimension, where they live for more or less the remainder of the series. Meanwhile, the C-137 versions of their family, Beth, Jerry, and Summer, remain in the newly Cronenberg C-137, though they are not Cronenberg themselves. Rick and Morty move to a new dimension. Our Rick and Morty can't just leave C-137 and hop into some new dimension at random. That could really mess with the space-time continuum, as if Rick isn't haphazardly doing that every day, but I digress. They have to find a world where they can perfectly slot themselves into a place left empty by another Rick and Morty pair, not to mention a world that isn't Cronenberg. Rick is able to find exactly this. He brings Morty to a version of Earth where the resident Rick manages to rectify the whole Cronenberg situation. However, immediately after, that world's Rick accidentally kills himself and Morty in a small explosion, providing a perfect opening for a different Rick and Morty to take their places. So our Rick and Morty arrive from C-137 to this New Dimensions version of Rick's garage where they find their own hideously damaged dead bodies. Rick and Morty proceed to bury those bodies in the Smith's backyard. After a harrowing burial, harrowing for Morty at least, Rick and Morty are able to take the place of their dead counterparts in this alternative world, and it's heavily implied that Rick has done this several times before, fun times had by all. A Cronenberg version of Rick and Morty moved to C-137. Meanwhile, back in the Cronenberg world, another Rick and Morty arrived. See, all along there had been another dimension, which we'll call the Cronenberg dimension, where everyone was born Cronenberg. The Rick and Morty in that dimension accidentally turned everyone there into regular humans. Mirroring the actions of the Rick and Morty who escaped the newly Cronenberg C-137, Cronenberg, Rick and Morty escape their newly human planet to arrive in C-137, where they fit right in and have no other Ricks or Mortys to contend with. Life goes on for our Rick and Morty in this new dimension. Yep, things for Rick and company stay normal. Morty fathers the child of a sex robot, then Summer and Rick go on their first joint adventure to the sex robot's home planet, and Rick and Morty watch Interdimensional Cable for the first time. Summer also gets a job working at the Devil's Antique Shop, and he, being the devil, betrays her. Rick and Summer then spend months bulking up so they can beat the devil up, which they do. It's awesome, and DMX plays. It's just an A-plus time. Evil Morty enters the picture. Our Rick and Morty are called to the Citadel because the Council of Ricks believe that our Rick, C-137, is is behind the murder of multiple other Ricks. His portal gun is the proof. According to its record, it was at the exact timelines and places of the murdered Ricks when they were killed. To vindicate himself, our Rick escapes the Citadel with Morty to track down the killer Rick. They eventually find him inside a fortress guarded by countless Mortys, all strapped to the exterior. Ricks don't really have emotional attachments to their Mortys. Rather, they use their Mortys as shields. A Morty's lack of intelligence is able to disguise a Rick's genius. Rick calls this a camouflage. It's helpful for Ricks to keep Mortys around as human shields so that the many intergalactic creatures trying to chase down Ricks, and there are many, won't be able to detect them based on their uniquely genius brainwaves. Each Morty is hooked up to an apparatus that repeatedly stabs into both sides of his torso. The constant agony amplifies their ability to shield the presence of a Rick. Inside this gruesome fortress, our Rick and Morty find an evil Rick and Morty pair. Note that the evil Morty wears an eye patch. that's how you can tell that he's evil. Evil people wear eye patches. that's just the truth of the universe. While evil Rick tries to download our Rick's memories, our Morty gets locked into a room with all of the other captured Mortys. 
our Morty successfully stages a Morty uprising, saving our Rick and resulting in the death of Evil Rick. Our Rick and Morty report back to the Council of Ricks to say that they found the real Rick killer. All of the captured Mortys are then set free. Meanwhile, some Citadel Ricks inspect the dead Evil Rick only to find that he's a robot operated by some remote technology. My god, I've seen this technology before, one of them says. Cut to Evil Morty walking out of the fortress with all of the other Mortys. He removes his eye patch to reveal it was a gadget used to control Evil Rick all along. He then disappears into the massive crowd of unassuming Mortys. Remember the theory we mentioned about our Rick possibly being Evil Morty's original Rick? If that's true, then a comment from our Rick in this episode makes a whole lot of sense. He tells our Morty, a cocky Morty can lead to some problems. I'll explain when you're older. Perhaps the problem is what this evil Morty has become. Rick freezes time. Beth and Jerry go on a Titanic reenactment vacation because Titanic is Jerry's favorite movie. This leaves Rick and the kids to throw an intergalactic rager. Key characters from Rick's past, like Squanchy and Bird Person, attend the party. So does Summer's friend Tammy, who ends up hooking up with Bird Person. They leave the party together the next morning. Like any good party, it gets out of hand, and the Smith's house ends up trashed. As Beth and Jerry approach the house, angry about the apparent mess, Rick freezes time. He and the kids end up taking six months to repair the house and enjoy all of that frozen time. Of course, freezing time has its consequences. Once Rick unfreezes it, he more and Summer end up in a decaying dimension. They ultimately wind up shattering time into 64 different timelines before they can get back to their original one. They're also held hostage by the time police as a result. Now do you see why doing a timeline of this show is so difficult? Speaking of difficult time mapping, let's get into ticket number 5126 and Mr. Poopy Butthole. This period begins in January of 2015. So this is where things start to get really fuzzy, but stay with me. Shortly after the party and the following extended cleanup, Rick and Morty leave their current Jerry at a Jerry daycare center called Jerry Bereed. Jerry Bury, for those who don't remember, is where Ricks and Mortys can leave their Jerrys for safekeeping if the latter accidentally stows away on any intergalactic adventures. It even has a ball pit and a fake Beth. When Rick and Morty initially drop off Jerry in the episode, Rick labels his own dimension as C-137, but next to Jerry's dimension, he writes, not applicable. That Rick and Morty get a ticket labeled 5126. They then get on with their evening, playing arcade games, foiling assassination attempts, you know. The Rick and Morty from this episode eventually return to pick up their Jerry. They're given a Jerry who happily greets Morty and icily greets Rick, but then another Rick approaches them. He says, wait, do you have 5126? The Morty we've been following all episode pulls a ticket out of his pocket, only to discover that it's a ticket from the arcade they went to earlier in the episode, so these two Rick and Morty pairs just trade Jerry's. Ticket theory, as it's commonly called, is a popular one. First proposed on YouTube by the Save Point Guild, some believe it indicates that parts of Season 2 take place with an entirely different Rick and Morty pair than the one we're used to following. Plus, many believe that the universe switch caused by the ticket swap would be used as an easy way to get Rick out of prison at the start of Season 3, because it would mean that our Rick had never been to prison or something like that. And that didn't end up being the source of Rick's jailbreak, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Even so, the theory extends to a subsequent event. A parasite invades the Smith's home by impersonating the family's longtime friends, only they're not impersonating real friends, but rather implanting false memories of their shared histories with the Sanchez Smiths in the family members' minds. At the start of the episode, when the parasite arrives, Rick is seen discarding a bunch of glowing green rocks, and they look just like the ones Rick picked up at the end of the episode featuring Jerry Burry. We also learn that in this timeline, a character named Mr. Poopy Butthole has been a close friend of the Sanchez Smith family for a long time. Beth, however, begins to doubt that Mr. Poopy Butthole is a real friend and not a parasite, so she shoots him. Too bad, though, because he's super real. Mr. Poopy Butthole is severely injured, but uh, don't worry, he'll be fine. Now consider this. Our Rick and Morty have never interacted with any Mr. Poopy Butthole at all, yet the Rick and Morty in this episode clearly have spent a lot of time with him. Mr. Poopy Butthole even appears in the intro of this episode, showing a reality in which he'd been along with Rick and Morty for all of their adventures. But that's the only episode intro he appears in. Maybe the Rick and Morty who fight the parasites and the Rick and Morty pair we see collect the glowing green rocks before picking Jerry up at Jerry Burry are the central characters in those two episodes, and those two episodes only. Or maybe we're thinking way too deeply about this. Not that that's anything new on on this channel. Things change at Bird Person's wedding. Again, things more or less return to normal. Rick and Morty save the world with a performance of their smash hit Get Swifty. Rick takes Morty to the microverse he created to power his flying car battery. Rick turns into a tiny version of himself and joins Morty and Summer in high school, where he becomes insanely popular. Beth and Jerry go to alien couples therapy. Jerry almost sacrifices his penis for the famous civil rights activist Shrimply Pibbles, etc, etc. Then the whole Sanchez Smith family gets invited to a wedding. Rick's friend Bird Person is getting married to Summer's friend and Tammy, remember? 
remember how they'd met at the party. At the wedding, though, Tammy's true colors are revealed. Turns out she'd been an agent of the Galactic Federation this whole time, implanted in the Smith's Children's High School to lead the Federation to Rick and his colleagues. Seventeen of the most wanted people in the galaxy are at Birdperson's wedding, including Rick. Birdperson is shot, but don't worry, he lives on as Phoenix Person, and Rick escapes with his family to a very small, uninhabited planet that looks kinda like Earth and supports carbon-based life forms. I don't know why they had to wait for that planet, though, I didn't see any problem with the Screaming Sun planet. Meanwhile, Mr. Poopy Butthole gets addicted to painkillers. Don't forget Mr. Poopy Butthole's storyline. After Beth shoots him, he starts taking painkillers and winds up attacking a pizza delivery guy. That's all on the Poopy Butthole front for now, we will keep you updated. Earth joins the Galactic Federation. Let's get back to the Sanchez Smiths, who are clearly unhappy with their new lives. Seeing his family's unhappiness, Rick does something very un-Rick. He decides to turn himself in so his family can go back to Earth. Rick gets imprisoned by the Federation, and the Smith family ends up on a very different sort of Earth than the one they'd left behind to attend Bird Person's wedding. Earth has joined the Federation, so the whole place is teeming with aliens and uses the Federation's currency. Jerry gets a job with the Federation where he brings in a six chewable figure income because he gets paid in edible pills, which seem to have replaced food entirely, though I'd just as easily believe that they just told Jerry that to get out of paying him. Summer is miserable and wants desperately to get Rick back to fix things. She has the bright idea of retrieving the portal gun that was buried with the dead body of their dimension's original Rick, which Morty told her about in a previous episode, Rick's D Minutes. A Federation-controlled robot sees Summer and Morty with the portal gun and goes after them. The kids then use the portal gun to escape. Eventually, Summer and Morty wind up in C-137. In case you forgot, that's the world where this show started, the one that Rick Cronenberg in Season 1. There, Summer meets her C-137 self and her C-137 parents, the family that our Rick and Morty left behind. They're living off of Cronenberg flesh and clearly doing lots of exercise since they're all super jacked. Morty takes this time to express to Summer just how little Rick cares about them. After all, he did leave Summer C-137 in a totally messed up world. Our Morty and Summer end up getting captured by the Federation while they're still in C-137, but but naturally, Rick ends up saving them, but not before breaking out of prison, taking the value of the Federation's currency, and more or less ensuring that Earth goes back to normal. Beth and Jerry decide to get divorced, and things get pretty dark, bruh. When Rick returns with the kids, Beth instantly sees him as a hero, and Jerry does not, to put it lightly. In fact, he makes Beth choose between himself and Rick, and uh, yeah, guess who Beth picks? That's right, this is the beginning of the end of Beth and Jerry's marriage. Well, it's kind of been crumbling since day one, but this is where we first hear the D word, divorce. Beth and Jerry decide it's time to get one, thus ushering in a whole new era for the Smith children. Summer and Morty go through all of the typical phases of kids whose parents get divorced. They try to ignore it, they get angry, they blame themselves, they travel to a post-apocalyptic dimension where they're free to hunt mutant humans and murder challengers in the blood domes, all standard stuff. As Summer and Morty process their emotions, Jerry moves out, and things get real when Beth, Summer, and Morty go to family therapy together, and Rick turns himself into a literal pickle to avoid it. This is the approved time for you to type I'm Pickle Rick in the comments. Once you're done, please return to your seat and keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times. All the while, Morty is becoming more self-sufficient. He solves puzzles by himself when working with the Vindicators, a Rick and Morty take on the Marvel franchise, the Avengers, and he figures out how to restore Summer to her normal size when she accidentally turns herself into a giant after her boyfriend leaves her for a girl with bigger boobs. Finally, when Rick and Morty decide it's time to relax, they go to a special detox spa. The spa removes all of their toxic qualities, like Rick's over-the-top egomania and Morty's bumbling self-doubt. Morty essentially turns into Jordan Belfort from The Wolf of Wall Street, and it's Rick who has trouble persuading Morty to do the right thing for once. This means reuniting their toxic selves with their non-toxic selves, which they eventually do. The reign of evil Morty begins. In an episode that departs from our Rick and Morty almost entirely, things are going down at the Citadel. The place has become a bureaucratic societal nightmare. Ricks kill Ricks, Ricks kill Mortys, same old story. No one seems to be satisfied with their quality of life. It's time for a change in power. Good thing it's election season. The candidates, multiple Ricks, and a single suave Morty face off in a debate that the Morty clearly wins. This takes place after candidate Morty fires as Morty campaign manager. As campaign manager Morty watches the debate on TV at a bar, a Rick wearing a trench coat approaches him. The Rick then hands campaign manager Morty a manila envelope full of secrets. In an unprecedented upset, candidate Morty wins the election at the Citadel, becoming the first Morty ever to rule the place. As many in the society rejoice at the change in power, candidate Morty then shows who he really is. He quickly gets rid of all of the Ricks who defy him in the Shadow Council, you know, the Ricks who actually control the Citadel, and by get rid of, I mean, he murders them. Naturally, this leads to an ominous speech wherein President Morty swirls his drink and foreshadows his dictatorship. When campaign manager Morty attempts to reveal President Morty's true character, he's released into space, where he dies. With him goes the manila envelope full of secrets. It opens up showing pictures that reveal President Morty is actually evil Morty, and that he's likely still controlling some robot Ricks. And then, whoops, we never see him again for the rest of the season. 
Beth and Jerry embrace the single life. Fortunately, our Rick and Morty and their family stay removed from the actions over at the Citadel, at least until season four? Anyway, Beth and Jerry continue to lead separate lives. Jerry dates a three-breasted alien who loves to hunt, and he tries to integrate her into his life with the kids, and then that ends up with the alien trying to hunt Summer and Morty, but that all gets resolved, so don't worry about it. Oh, and remember Fruppy Land, Beth's childhood playground world? Well, her old friend Tommy is still in there. Beth and Rick go to retrieve him when she hears that Tommy's dad is about to be sentenced to death for his son's alleged murder. I mean, he did disappear very mysteriously at a young age. Turns out that Fruppy Land has gone from a safe, friendly play place for children to probably the worst nightmare of all possible timelines. Seriously, of all the messed up things Rick and Morty has introduced us to, Fruppy Land is probably the most depraved. You see, to survive all of his time in Fruppy Land, Tommy procreated with the sweet Fruppy creatures and then ate his offspring, and it gets even worse, but that's that's all we need to get into right now. In trying to get Tommy out of Fruppy Land to save his dad from a government sanctioned execution, Beth realizes that she's just like her dad. She ruthlessly murders all of the deformed Fruppy creatures, and Tommy bringing back only his finger to clone. The existence of the clone, though, ends up saving Tommy's dad's life. Speaking of clones, Rick makes Beth an interesting proposition. He can make a perfect Beth clone, he tells her, so that she can be free to wander the galaxy and have adventures like he did when she was young. Beth gives this some serious thought, but we're not sure what she decides. But just as the show says, it doesn't really matter what she picked, because whatever she does, it's still symbolic of her making a choice and having agency in her own life. That's, that's an important lesson that's gonna come in handy again in, like right now. The Smith family gets back together without Rick. By the end of season three, Morty has been through enough adventures with Rick that he starts to really get it. Or maybe he's just growing up like any teenager would. His self-esteem has increased, and so it seems has his intelligence. He even talks back to the President of the United States, who keeps calling Rick and Morty to help them solve alien problems, but won't take a moment to pose for a selfie with Morty. Rude. Keith David, I expected better of you and your golden voice. Rick certainly thinks it's rude. He gets on his high horse about the President taking a selfie with Morty, and a physical fight between the President of the United States and Rick Sanchez ensues, but Morty's over it. He steals Rick's portal gun and leaves leaves the White House as Rick and the President continue to duke it out. At this point, Beth has no idea whether she's a clone of herself. After a phone call with Rick, she learns that if she were a clone that had become self-aware, Rick would have to kill her, so she goes into hiding from Rick and the rest of the Smiths join her, including Morty. Beth and Jerry decide to get back together. Oh, what was that about having agency in the face of uncertainty? Morty calls Rick, who's still fighting with the President, to tell him that he stole his portal gun and that he and his family aren't hiding. Rick, obviously deflated, ends his fight with the President and promises to leave him alone forever in exchange for the use of his highly inefficient portal. Rick uses the president's portal to arrive at the Smith's hiding place. He comes with a gun, which he reveals is to kill Jerry, not Beth, who Rick insists is not a clone. Still, the family wants nothing to do with Rick. Not even Morty wants to adventure with him. Then Rick returns to the president, this time wearing one of Jerry's fly fishing outfits. He introduces himself to the president as Fly Fishing Rick, which the president immediately falls for. He says he'll give Fly Fishing Rick a call if he needs any help with alien matters. Back at the Smith's house, the family settles down for a delicious dinner from Panda Express. When Rick enters to return Jerry's fly fishing attire, Beth tells him that he can't be rude to Jerry. She and Jerry and the kids are a family now, she says, and from here on out, things will be like season one again, except more streamlined this time. Based on this timeline, forgive me if I don't buy the streamlined part, Beth. Rick, singled out from the family, does not look too amused either. Mr. Poopy Butthole is now a proud dad. But wait, season three isn't over just yet. Mr. Poopy Butthole makes one last appearance to apologize for not being in the season. He was busy getting married and having a baby instead. Congratulations, Mr. Poopy Butthole, you've... You, you won season three. It's been a tough road and you deserve the best. That timeline probably sparked a whole bunch of memories you thought you'd forgotten, huh? Well, to make things even wackier, how about we see how Rick and Morty has changed over the years? Believe me, they've changed a lot. So here's the evolution of Rick and Morty. You might be asking, how can you make a then versus now about Rick and Morty? It's only been around for like three seasons. Well, it's been a wild multi-dimensional ride and a lot has changed. Hi, I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator and today we're comparing Rick and Morty's first season to its third season. This is then versus now Rick and Morty. Don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon to become part of the notification squad. <laughs> The focus of the show. While Rick and Morty used to focus on, well, Rick and Morty, the show's lens has widened to capture the entire Smith family. Most of the early episodes could be summarized as Rick and Morty go on an adventure, but newer seasons go on a different route, with episodes focusing on premises like, the show explores how the Smith children are affected by their parents' divorce. Season 3 also brought us our first Rick and Jerry episode, and our first episode in which Beth and Rick have an adventure of their own. Ah, father-daughter bonding, over finding a man who's been committing bestiality and incest in a world Rick created. Still. 
bonding. Basically, we've seen a shift from episodes that just star Rick and Morty to a format that supports an ensemble cast that drives unique plots. Story, plot, and setting. Speaking of plots, we can't skip over the divorce. While Beth and Jerry's unsatisfactory marriage served as a butt of many jokes back in the day, the joke's over. Beth and Jerry get divorced in Season 3's first episode. This major change gave rise to many sentimental themes that came up in Season 3. The divorce plot is actually inspired in part by Harmon's real-life experience with parents that experimented with separation. His words, not ours. Harmon says, everybody's got a story about one of their parents acting differently in a separated context. Like how awkward their dad looked in a subtly different outfit. <coughs> Jerry's newsboy cap. Then you've got the alternate timelines. Sure, early Rick and Morty explores these alternate timelines whimsical ways, but now these alternate timelines and Ricks and Mortys have become deeply ingrained in the show. Remember your surprise when we first learned that there were alternate Ricks and Mortys? Or when we discovered that all the Ricks come together to form the Council of Ricks? Well, now an episode that features an established society of alternate Ricks and Mortys, Rick Lantis mix-up, seems totally natural. We've come a long way from the early days. And don't forget that Rick has introduced the idea of a series arc for the first time. Sure, it may have started as a joke involving the now-famous McDonald's Szechuan sauce, but it's still a significant departure from the format used in the pilot and early seasons of the show. And don't worry, we'll dive into the Szechuan sauce later. Tone. Rick always had penchant for dark humor. For example, his cute catchphrase, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub, actually means, I'm in great pain, please help me. But in season 3, the show's really leaning into its dark tone. However, the creators may not agree that the show's gotten darker over time. When questioned by time, Dan Harmon said it was kind of hard to say if the show is darker now than it once was. But we beg to differ. In season 3's first episode, Rick Shank Redemption, Rick reveals that all of his supposed love for his grandkids was just a grand scheme to get rid of Jerry. And it works. This is the episode that resulted in Jerry's divorce. That divorce not only marked a big change in the plot, but it also signaled a change in tone. Things are about to get real for the Smiths. They have to face real life problems and their consequences. While in the early seasons, Rick is pretty adept at avoiding or running from the consequences, they catch up to him and the Smiths in season 3. And sometimes the consequences are just plain sad. We're thinking of the peak you get into Jerry's moldy, cockroach-filled bachelor pad. And let's not forget the themes of racial violence, oppressed factory drones, and mind-emptying nostalgia in Tales of the Citadel. New writers. On the topic of writers, before season 3, Rick and Morty didn't have any female writers. Now the show's writing staff is nearly half female, showrunners aside, with four women in its writer's room. Jessica Gao, Jane Becker, Erica Rosby, and Sarah Carbiner. This isn't Gao's first writing gig at Adult Swim. She also wrote for Robot Chicken, where she was, again, the show's first female writer. Overall, Adult Swim doesn't have any shows with women showrunners, which Gao says is a bummer. Humor. If Rick and Morty had a soul instead of a big black hole, it would be made of jokes. Rick and Morty's distinctive humor is what draws many fans of the series. Believe it or not, the creators have amped up the humor a lot since the pilot. Someone over at Denon Geek even calculated the number of jokes per minute in Rick and Morty. In seasons 1 and 2, the average jokes per minute, or JPM if you will, clocked in at 5.4 and 5.96 respectively. Less than Angie Tribeca's 6.17 JPM in season 1, but more than Veep's average in season 4. Now in season 3, Rick and Morty has reached a new record, with a total of 9.16 JPM. That's a lot of laughing. Rick and Morty's jokes have always been ridiculous. In the first season, the humor was dark for sure, but it was more surreal. Early season jokes were steeped in the strange planets they visited, and Rick's classic off-color humor. But now that the show is in its third season, the writers are including more and more self-aware jokes. For instance, the writers played a lot with self-referential jokes in the Pickle Rick episode, as a result of the widespread fan anticipation. They also psyched us out with the Rick Lantis mix-up episode, in which we thought we'd see Rick and Morty travel to the lost city of Atlantis, but instead got Tales from the Citadel. And they deprived us of Interdimensional Cable 3. Root Interdimensional Cable. You know, the lack of Interdimensional Cable in Season 3 hit us hard enough that it deserves its own discussion. Interdimensional Cable has been a trope that devoted fans have learned to anticipate with every fiber of their being. Season 3's version of the episode, which was typically improvised by Roland and Harmon, was largely scripted. We think this took away some of Interdimensional Cable's manic charm. One of the inspirations behind Interdimensional Cable came from Roiland's love of short form weird stuff. These episodes let him showcase all the hilarious ideas writers came up with during their process that otherwise wouldn't have made it out of the writer's room. Morty's Mind Blowers, Season 3's stand-in for Interdimensional Cable, is different because it features ideas that writers pitched to the audiences on Twitter before they decided what made the cut. Plus, they're all about Rick and Morty instead of wacky space creatures with eye holes or turbulent juice. Celebrity Cameos Celebrity cameos crept up the A-list in Rick and Morty's third season, getting all the way to Susan Sarandon, who plays the family and poop-eating therapist in Pickle Rick. Nowadays, Rick and Morty attracts plenty of big-name celebrities like Christian Slater, Nathan Fillion, Joel McHale, and Jillian Jacobs. The latter two also starred in Harmon's Community. Earlier seasons counted fewer celebs in the credits, most of whom were specifically comic actors. These include Jordan Peele, Keegan-Michael Key, and David Cross. Animation and Style Fans on Reddit have noted the difference in animation and style from when the show debuted versus now. We may have been paying too much attention to the fart jokes to notice, but when you look at stills from Season 1 versus Season 3, you can see a clear difference. The former uses thicker lines and brighter colors. The latter has more nuanced shading and looks slightly less cartoony? 
Just take a look at Rick's Drool then versus now. You'll see it there for sure. Doc and Marty. Before there was Rick and Morty, there was the real animated adventures of Doc and Marty. Sound familiar? If the show's obsession with Back to the Future wasn't clear enough already, the pilot features two familiar characters, Bizarro Rick, aka Doc, and creepy wall-eyed Morty, aka Marty. While the real animated adventures of Doc and Marty isn't really a pilot for the show we know and love, it's where Roiling created and fell in love with the characters. But if you compare Doc and Marty to Rick and Morty, you'll notice some very distinctive differences. For one thing, Doc and Marty takes place in a nightmarish MS Paint hellscape. It borrows backgrounds from the Care Bears, and when it's not set in bastardized care lot, you can see posters of Smash Mouth in the background. Thankfully, a lot changed between Doc and Marty and the first episode of Season 1, but Roiling's voices for Rick and Morty are very close to what you'll hear in the series. You don't mess with perfection. Show Intro Sequence The intro sequence of Rick and Morty changes every season, and thanks to one notable Season 2 episode featuring Mr. Poopy Butthole, sometimes twice per season. Overall, it went from heavily featuring Jerry in Season 1 to not even showing him in Season 3. Here are some notable Jerry moments in the Season 1 intro versus the several non-Jerry scenes in Season 3. In Season 1, you've got Jerry shooting monsters, Jerry helping Robot Morty with his homework, Jerry and family attacking Rick, and Jerry giving birth. Jerry appears again in Season 2's intro, but he's disappeared entirely from Season 3's intro, which instead shows Butthead Morty watching porn, Summer chilling with Hunger Games Summer, Morty's escaping out of school building window, and Rick shopping at the Morty store. Maybe this is because Season 3 is when Jerry moves out, so he's no longer in the picture? Fanbase Rick and Morty started out as a pretty niche show. It wasn't for everyone. It definitely wasn't for everyone. But by its third season, Rick and Morty was the number one rated comedy on TV, over primetime series like The Big Bang Theory and Modern Family. Of course, this means the fan base is now huge compared to earlier seasons. New York Comic Con was crawling with Ricks, Mortys, and Meeseeks this year, and Dan Harmon has to think twice before throwing on a Rick and Morty shirt when he gets dressed in the morning. He says that now he's guaranteed to get comments from fans if he does, making him feel like an egomaniac. And we can't neglect to mention the dark underbelly of Rick and Morty fandom, the trolls. After the writer's room shakeup, trolls dock several of the show's female writers. In response to the toxic fandom, Harmon said, It's offensive to me that there's some white male fan out there trying to further some creepy agenda by protecting my work. I've made no bones about the fact that I loathe these people. It fucking sucks. Marketing and merch. And with a bigger fan base comes more merch. In early seasons, Rick and Morty didn't have much of a consumer impact. Now it's popular enough to revive a lost sauce that McDonald's used to promote the Disney movie Mulan in 1998. After McDonald's brought back the sauce for one day in early October, the fast food giant saw the demand was so great that they're bringing it back again this winter. Ending credits. In early episodes, the logo for Dan Harmon's production shop, Harmonious Claptrap, which comes at the end of the credits, featured clay figures of him next to a red-haired woman. Harmon and his wife split up between Rick and Morty season 2 and 3, so now the Harmonious Claptrap logo features a clay figure of Harmon alone, lying on the couch where he and his clay wife used to sit. Characters All of the characters in Rick and Morty have changed a lot for a show that's only been running three seasons. Since we've already looked at some of the big changes, like Jerry and Beth's separation, let's just focus on the Rick we're left with at the end of season 3. In Rick's own words, we have a character who went from being in control of the Smiths to the lowest status character in his own lame family. Then Rick held sway over Beth because she'd been afraid he'd leave again. He stayed on top of Jerry by belittling him, bossed Morty around, and angled for Summer to seek his approval. For present Rick, all of that power is gone, at least until next season comes out, when I'll surely have a big white Santa Claus beard of my own. Now we're really getting into the meat and potatoes. Ready for some rapid fire facts about Doc and Marty? I mean, Rick and Morty? I bet you are. Our first 107 Facts video about this series was a commercial and critical success, garnering rave reviews from legendary critics like Caleb Craft 10 and Red Cherry Beast 787. Over 3 million views on this one. From 2017, here's 107 Rick and Morty Facts You Should Know, Part 1. Every once in a while, a TV show comes along that's so wonderfully weird it strikes a chord with viewers of all ages and backgrounds. Rick and Morty surprised cartoon fans everywhere when it debuted back in 2013, and it's only gotten more popular from there. Which is why 107 Piddly Little Facts could never fully encapsulate such an amazing show. My name is Tim with Channel Frodorator, and today we're going even deeper into the backstory of this dynamic duo. Are you a diehard fan? Just wondering why everyone loves this show so much? We've got something for everyone as we count down 107 more facts you should know about about Rick and Morty. Let's get started. Number 1. Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland have been pitching shows together since 2005. The first show they pitched to Fox was a sci-fi, and although the network passed, the show went on to evolve and inspire a lot of Rick and Morty. Number 2. Harmon actually began developing Rick and Morty after he was fired from his position as executive producer on his show Community. Harmon makes his feelings on the matter apparent in Season 2 when he references the show and parodies its characters on television in the episode Autoerotic Assimilation. Number 3. Just before Harmon called him about doing a show for Adult Swim, Roiland was in the process of 
developing an incarnation of Rick and Morty for Fox that was more grounded in reality. This scrapped pitch revolved around a grandfather who was close to death moving in with his daughter, a single mother who worked at a hair salon, and his impressionable grandson. The grandfather was an overall terrible person, and because he was so close to death would coax his grandson into helping him commit a series of horrible crimes. So other than the single mother and close to death bits, not much change. Number 4. Royland has always been a huge fan of Adult Swim, so much so that he planned to make Rick and Morty only 15 minutes from the start to fit in with their original content. Harmon pushed the idea of doing 22 minute episodes because it would mark a first for the network. Number 5. The creators knew it would be a battle to get the show approved, but they also knew that if they could get the show to a focus group they would more than likely be greenlit. Sure enough, the network wasn't sold on the show in the beginning. After the pilot, they ordered two scripts as a trial. Number 6. Contrary to popular belief, Harmon and Royland never showed the real adventures of Doc and Marty to Adult Swim when they originally pitched Rick and Morty, as it would have obviously destroyed the duo's odds of getting the show picked up. Royland has gone on record saying he even went through an unsuccessful effort to remove the short from the internet during the pitch process. To his knowledge, the executives over at Adult Swim still haven't seen it, and Royland thinks it's better that way. Number 7. Doc and Marty aren't the only versions of Rick and Morty created by Royland. Rougher versions of the duo's voices and designs have appeared throughout several Royland failed pilots, including the Poloni Family Comedy Show, Relative Insanity, and The Unmarketables. Number 8. Adult Swim went all out with Rick and Morty's marketing campaign prior to the first season's premiere. In December 2013, the citizens of New York City may have noticed flyers on lampposts inquiring about buying a used spaceship. If you were to go to 23rd Broadway, you would see that Rick's ship had crash-landed in front of the Flatiron Building with Morty still inside. Rick could be seen sitting on a bench nearby, feeding his alcoholism. Number 9. Adult Swim had a similar installation at an Adult Swim-themed carnival outside San Diego Comic-Con in 2015, with Rick crashing his spaceship into the ground another time. Only this time, he's triumphantly walking away from the wreckage with beer bottles at his feet. According to Royland, this particular installation received backlash from various anti-drunk driving organizations for promoting drunk driving. In fairness, I think that anything Rick does shouldn't be counted as promoting. Number 10. Harmon and Royland share similar taste in music, but Harmon takes none of the credit when it comes to the excellent soundtrack for Rick and Morty. Number 11. Royland's favorite episode of the series so far is Rick Potion Number 9 from Season 1. He claims he loves the episodes for the fast-paced action and unavoidable dark ending. Which, if you created the show, I think you can say that the ending was avoidable for you. Number 12. Royland voice characters in an unofficial stop-motion animated episode of Rick and Morty created by fan Dieter Wagner. Number 13. Once during a visit to New York City, Royland visited a strip club where he got so drunk that he began talking to the dancers in the voices of Rick and Morty. Unfortunately, he didn't have the money to tip anybody. But he got around this by finding dancers that were fans of Rick and Morty and paid them in character sketches on napkins. Number 14. Rick and Morty's theme song wasn't actually created for the show. It was originally the theme song of Royland's failed pilot called Dog World. You can see other Dog World references in Rick and Morty. Number 15. According to Royland, the small W-shaped mouth the characters occasionally make is a specific reference to a similar expression that Ren frequently makes on Ren and Stimpy. Number 16. Many people have suspected that Royland and Harmon may take hallucinogens to help them write the show, but this is not the case. It turns out they just have weird sick minds. Number 17. The writers admit they try not to worry about offending people. Once you do that, you put restrictions up in the writer's room which can block the flow of creativity. So even though it's not their attention to offend people, they don't try to avoid it. Number 18. Although the show parodies a lot of famous movies, the writers never start off with a movie in mind. Instead, it just sort of happens organically during the writing process. Which when we're talking about Rick Potion number 9 is pretty easy to see, but when you have an episode centered around The Purge? Number 19. The Rick and Morty outline dictates that the story exhausts what audiences already know within the first act, so the show never becomes boring or slow. And I appreciate this, because even if you start with a common trope, there's still plenty more to explore. Number 20. Rick and Morty's own Ryan Ridley used to freelance to a company that bought slogans to mass produce on t-shirts. In fact, Ridley is the man behind the classic t-shirt, quote, I do my own stunts, which was initially, I do my own stunts, they're just really lame. The company had to edit it down. Number 21. Most of the designs start off as less of an idea and more just a general feeling that the writers try and capture on a whiteboard. Royland really wants to release a Rick and Morty concept art book because so many awesome characters and designs only get used once in the show. Number 22. Adult Swim allows the writing staff to explore their creative freedoms and push the envelope as far as the jokes go. But Harmon has said that this adds pressure on the writers because if the show dips in quality, they have no one else to blame. Number 23. Harmon and Royland admit the secret influence behind many of the alien designs is excrement and genitals. Some may be more apparent than others, such as the Zagarians from the season 2 premiere.
year. Number 24, Adult Swim initially didn't want Royland to voice Rick and Morty. Harmon was able to convince them to let Royland voice Rick, but Morty was still in uncertainty. Adult Swim was originally looking to have the likes of Billy West or Tara Strong voice the character before Royland was able to win the network over with a few auditions he did playing both Rick and Morty. Number 25, all of the characters' backstories are already thought out and haven't been revealed by choice. The writers will reveal all according to plan, but until then, you only get subtle hints. Number 26, according to Royland, Rick is openly pansexual. This claim is further supported by his relationship with Unity, who is consistently referred to as it, as opposed to he or she. Number 27, Sarah Chalk auditioned for the role of Beth over the phone while she was staying at her friend's cabin in Canada. Number 28, aside from Rick, Beth is really Dan's favorite character. He relates to her and feels the character is really grounded and very real. Number 29, Royland claims that Chris Parnell always nails his lines for Jerry on the first take. Despite this, the show's standard operation procedure mandates that one take is simply not enough, so Parnell usually gives them around 30 perfect takes of a line. Roland almost always uses the first take, though. Number 30, when Parnell was asked who would win a rap battle between his most popular characters, Archer's Cyril Figgis, 30 Rock's Dr. Spaceman, and Jerry Smith, he voted for Jerry Smith. Parnell claims this was simply a gut feeling. Number 31, the idea of Jerry and Beth's relationship spawned from how marriage is often portrayed in media with the constant question of, is this going to work, without ever showing a resolution. Also, the creators liked the idea because they felt it's a more realistic portrayal of most relationships. You have the single worst marriage I've ever witnessed. Number 32, the reason Jerry's father enjoys watching his wife have sex with another man while dressed as Superman is because it's the first thing that comes to Harmon's mind whenever he hears about people's odd fetishes. Number 33, it's not referenced too often, but Jerry makes mention of a traumatic childhood a few times in the series. The creators refuse to comment on the subject any further, but did imply the possibility of exploring the darker side of his history. Number 34, Jerry appears to be a recurring name for father figures throughout Royland's work. In addition to Rick and Morty, Jerry was also the name of the father character in his failed pilot's dog world and Toro and Moro. An interesting side note, the Jerry and Toro and Moro was actually a genius inventor. Number 35, Rick was originally meant to drive a flying car, but this idea was scrapped when Harmon and Royland realized this was too similar to the flying DeLorean from Back to the Future Part 2, and decided to change it into a UFO to avoid any potential legal issues. Number 36, the website that Rick babbles on about in the pilot, rickandmortyadventures.com, is a working URL that will send you to Adult Swim's website if punched into your browser. Number 37, early on in season one's development, the writers would often pitch ideas and write episodes in Royland's garage, and even during small hiking trips they took together. Number 38, according to Royland, the show's writers discussed incorporating a big secret into the series overarching plot that would ultimately be kept away from the viewers. The secret was uncovered midway through the first season when the writers found a conspiracy post written by a user on Reddit that was startlingly accurate. Royland hasn't said which post of these he's referring to for obvious reasons. Number 39, many episode concepts begin life as random phrases and desires blurted out by Royland in the writer's room. For example, he may shout something along the lines of, I want a testicle monster to appear in an episode. It's then up to the writing team to build a story around the request. Number 40, ever wonder where Rick and Morty gets its wide range of pop culture references? The Rick and Morty staff collectively refer to writer Mike McMahon as having an encyclopedic knowledge of books, films, and TV shows. He can be found in the writer's room, constantly pitching other writers various sci-fi concepts and jokes based on properties from across the genre's history. Number 41, the A and B plots of episode Lawnmower Dog were originally intended to be two separate episodes. One of them solely focused on ripping Inception a new one, while the other was a full-blown Planet of the Apes parody, but with dogs. It was Harmon's idea to merge the two episodes into one in order to showcase how crazy the show could be. Number 42, in the episode Lawnmower Dog, Rick mistakenly refers to Snuffles as Ruffles. Ruffles was the name of the Doggerson's family pet human in Royland's dog world. Number 43, while Harmon's idea was ultimately the path taken by the crew, Lawnmower Dog had a problem combining two dense storylines into one episode. The script wound up being a whopping 40 pages long. That's 10 pages longer than the average Rick and Morty script. This meant scrapping and minimizing a lot of jokes and elements, including a dream world that resembled Middle Earth that became the site of a hot and steamy orgy, which wound up becoming the sex dungeon scene in the actual episode. Number 44, in early drafts of the classroom scene in M. Night Shyamalan's, the classroom was supposed to break out into an orgy between Jessica, Morty, and Mr. Goldenfold and the other students, but was cut for obvious reasons. Number 45, M. Night Shyamalan's plot is based on that of 1964 film 36 Hours. The film revolves around an American GI kidnapped by Germans who attempt to convince him that World War II is over so they can get important allied tactical information. Number 46, Morty was originally meant to rap for the crowd in M. Night Shyamalan's. According to Ridley, one of 
of the verses of this cut rap was a chicken in a peanut and a house with a raisin run around together in a tiny little station. Number 47 in M. Night Shyamalan's There's a Mailman in the Simulation who constantly refers to Jerry as my man. This is a reference to the movie Big starring Tom Hanks, in which Hanks' character is greeted by a mailman that exclaims my man upon seeing him. Number 48. In season one, a single episode averaged about 100 jokes, which comes out to about five jokes per minute. Episode eight, Rick's Minutes, had the highest number of jokes for the season, totaling 146 jokes. Number 49. Rick's Minutes has an identical concept to one episode of Justin Rowland's older series, House of Cosby's. In the fourth episode, the characters find an intergalactic transmission receptor from an alien spaceship, which they hook up to a television set and watch bizarre alien TV shows from other planets. They're trying to get information, you see. Number 50. Harmon played the Saturday Night Live announcer in Rick's Minutes. When the announcer goes through the names of the various cast members and reaches the photo of the three strange looking aliens, he says, uh, I'll get back to that one. That was a real bit of confusion on Harmon's part when he was recording the sketch and going through the illustrations. He genuinely didn't know what to make of them. Number 51. The writers don't intend on parodying pop culture often because they feel that instantly puts them in competition with South Park. In fact, the Lawnmower Dog episode was already being written and animated when the South Park Inception episode aired featuring a similar Freddy Krueger plotline. Number 52. To avoid overlapping plot lines with other shows, the creators decided to keep Rick and Morty in the sci-fi genre, so any future references that are made won't likely end up in an episode of South Park. Number 53. When they completed the season one finale, they weren't entirely sure they would be back for another season. If they were picked up, they planned to pick things up exactly where they left off with Rick having to unfreeze time. Number 54. The original ending for autoerotic assimilation wasn't nearly as dark as the final product. It simply called for Rick to angrily tear his lab apart in a fit of rage, only to calm down shortly after. But Harmon thought that wasn't dark enough for Rick. The writers originally opted to have him activate a device that generates a black hole that Rick would contemplate entering. Harmon once again chimed in, saying the writers were on the right track, but he thought the suicide attempt should be somewhat left to chance. Something of an accident. Number 55, the episode Something Ricked This Way Comes features a character named Scroopy Noopers, who's voiced by video game voice acting legend Nolan North. The character was named by Harmon, who is mocking the way Royland comes up with names for his characters. Number 56, in the cold open for Me Seeks and Destroy, the spaceship that Rick and Morty fight demonic versions of the Smith family on resembles the ship Event Horizon from the 1997 science fiction film of the same name. Number 57. The original design for the ball fondlers were reminiscent of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The ball fondlers also existed in a world where people's arms were too short to fondle their junk, hence the name. Number 58. X Gone Give It To You was not originally intended to be the song that played when Rick and Summer got their revenge on the devil. The crew just played a bunch of different songs over the sequence and DMX won out. Number 59. During pickups for close Rick counters of the Rick kind, it was discovered that Chalk could burp on command without the aid of beverages, a talent that I'm sure makes Royland very jealous. This inspired the crew to incorporate the joke of Beth inheriting her father's belching at the last minute. Number 60, the fourth dimensional beings seen in A Wrinkle in Time closely resemble the Langoliers from the Stephen King story of the same name. Both creatures have an association with time. The Langoliers eat it while the fourth dimensional beings police it. Number 61, when the Council of Ricks was first introduced and the multiple Ricks and Mortys were shown, the very first Doc and Marty characters were placed in the scene, but later removed to avoid any legal issues that might come up. Number 62, the badges worn by the Council of Ricks were made into real badges and given to the crew as gifts when they wrapped production on season one. Royland encourages anybody that find ones for sale online to buy it no matter how much it costs. Number 63, Bird Person was modeled after Hawk, a character from the 70s TV series Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Number 64, Harmony jokingly likes to blame what happened to Bird Person in season two on his divorce, but ultimately the beloved fan favorite was gunned down in an attempt to keep the audience on its toes. Number 65, the cyborg photographer seen in The Wedding Squanchers is played by Aaron Hansen, perhaps better known by the name Ego Raptor. He's also responsible for the awesome series One Half of Game Grumps and my personal favorite, Sequelitis. Number 66, Rick's microverse counterpart Zeep Zanflorp is voiced by none other than Stephen Colbert of The Colbert Report and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which makes it appropriate that Zeep's mech suit deploys an eagle. Number 67, Royland is a huge Degrassi fan, to the point where two Degrassi cast members, Cassie Steele and Aislinn Paul, were actually cast for the first season and Steele was brought back for the second season. Number 68, Royland had no idea who Alfred Molina was when he was cast as the devil in season one, something that frustrated Ridley, who is a big fan. When recording wrapped, Ridley asked for a photo with Molina, so Royland did as well. Ridley asked why Royland would want a picture of an actor he didn't know. Royland responded that if Ridley wanted a picture with him, it must have meant he was worth having a picture 
taken with. Alfred Molina is a prolific actor with a resume boasting such films as Raiders of the Lost Ark, Boogie Nights, and Spider-Man 2. Number 69, famous documentarian Werner Herzog guest starred on the show during season two for the episode titled Interdimensional Cable 2, Tempting Fate. During the episode, Herzog gave a monologue about how humans are fascinated by their own penises. Number 70, Summer's voice actress Spencer Grammer is the daughter of actor Kelsey Grammer, who has also dabbled in the realm of voice acting, most notably as Simpsons villain, Sideshow Bob. Number 71, in a sense, Spencer Grammer really is responsible for developing the character Summer. Before the actor's touch was given to the character, Summer was essentially a one-dimensional stereotype. Number 72, the top that Summer wears in Raising Gazorpazorp is a real Marc Jacobs top that Royland picked because it looked cute. This did not go unnoticed by Marc Jacobs International, who retweeted an image from the episode commending the show for its incorporation. Number 73, when the episode Raising Gazorpazorp was sent over to standards and practices, the Rick and Morty staff were concerned that the Gazorpian sex robot would be a huge issue that would compromise the episode. In the end, everything went surprisingly well. The only request standards and practices had for the crew was to alter the size and shape of the robot's mouth. Number 74, the Gazorpazorp design was modeled after the alien in the 1985 film Explorers. It's a personal favorite of Royland. Number 75, Adult Swim is not allowed to rerun the episode Raising Gazorpazorp during prime time due to the fact that a 14-year-old boy knocks up a sex robot. Number 76, Rick's use of the word retarded in Something Ricked This Way Comes was an attempt by Harmon to argue a valid use of the word, and expected to receive heavy resistance from the executives at Adult Swim, but he never even heard a peep from them about it. Number 77, during the same episode, Jerry humiliates Morty in front of the Plutonians by telling a story about how Morty threw his poopy underwear out a window when he was younger. This is something Harmon did when he was a child. Number 78, the Rick and Morty puppets used to promote the season one DVD were created by special effect artist and character designer Ben Bameth. Bameth was a finalist on the sci-fi show Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge. He's also the boyfriend of Justin's sister, Amy Royland. Number 79, some of the writers may seem a tad under the influence during the DVD commentaries. That's because they were, and because of this, multiple recordings had to take place before they recorded tracks they could use. Number 80, the writers went into season two of Rick and Morty wanting to make Rick more human, and that meant making him more vulnerable and less on top of everybody and everything. One of the ways they displayed this vulnerability in humanity with Rick was auto-erotic assimilation, where Rick's emotions are challenged with his love interest, Unity, and he doesn't come out on top like he always does. To quote Ridley, his reckless behavior begins to bite him in the ass. Number 81, though the writers try to humanize Rick, they refuse to delve too deeply into his backstory. They swear that they'll never reveal things like how or why Rick became an alcoholic. Royland feels that explanations like that take responsibility away from the character's actions and makes them unrealistic. Number 82, originally for the second season, there were plans to revisit the original family left behind in the Cronenberg world. The episode was supposed to be part of the season finale, but the idea was nixed due to writer's block. As good a reason as ever existed. Number 83, the first two episodes of season two were leaked online before their intended release. These episodes were supposed to be released online for the press to review. It's also worth noting the copies of these episodes weren't 100% finished and had subtle animation and sound issues that seemed to have went unnoticed by the general public. Despite the early positive reception they received, Harmon and Royland urged people not to watch the leaked content and view future episodes when and how they were meant to be seen. Number 84, Royland was drawn into the show for an animated cameo. In season two's Get Swifty, he can be spotted tied to balloons and wearing a sign that reads thief during the first ascension scene. Number 85, season two, episode four, Total Recall, had the most jokes out of the entire season at 150 total jokes. Number 86, the episode Total Recall was inspired by the concept of the character Dawn from Josh Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Screenwriter Mike McMahon suggested the idea in the writer's room because he was in love with the concept of a character planting themselves in someone's memory as a disguise. Number 87, how did the parasites in Total Recall get into the Smith residence? Go back a few episodes to Morty Night Run. Towards the end of the episode, you can see Rick loading glowing green rocks into his ship, and if you look closely at these rocks, you'll see tiny pink pods latched to them. At the beginning of Total Recall, Rick is dumping these same green rocks into the trash right over the shoulder of Uncle Steve, the first parasite. According to Justin Roiland, these pink pods on the green rocks are the parasite eggs. Number 88, when he's making burgers in Total Recall, Rick claims that he's good at making burgers like Tom Cruise is good at making drinks in a movie called Cuisine. Its correct title is Cocktail. Number 89, one of the memories the alien parasites plant in Rick's memory is the catchphrase, lick, lick, lick my balls, which he allegedly says all the time. While this isn't true for Rick, it is true of Doc from The Adventures of Doc and Marty. Number 90, at the beginning of The Ricks Must Be Crazy, you can see a poster for Three Brothers, the much anticipated sequel to the critically acclaimed season one joke, Two Brothers. Number 91, the character Aberdoff Linkler was created during a lecture Harmon gave 
gave to his writers. During his speech, Dan asked, is there any way you could make Abraham Lincoln or Hitler comedically potent again? Then he basically answered his own question. Number 92, according to Harmon, he was based on a G.I. Joe character named Serpenter, a villain created by Cobra utilizing the combined DNA of Napoleon, Julius Caesar, Hannibal, and Attila the Hun, just as Averdolf Linkler was created from the combined DNA of Abraham Lincoln and Adolf Hitler. Number 93, the lighthouse keeper in season two was supposed to be voiced by Harmon, but because his monologue was too long, Ridley stepped in to record the monologue with a speedier accent. Number 94, Summer's season two love interest, Toby Matthews, is played by Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch. Roiland similarly lent his voice to Gravity Falls, playing the characters Blendon Blandon and Bobby Renza. Number 95, the Gravity Falls Rick and Morty portal gag wasn't the only connection between the two shows. When you're watching Rick and Morty, you may notice a recurring background character with curly blonde hair wearing rainbow suspenders and a shirt featuring American football with Roman numerals on it. This character was meant to serve as a connection between Rick and Morty, Gravity Falls, and an unaired show called Murder Police created by Royland and Hirsch's mutual friend, Jason Ruiz. The Roman numerals on this character's shirt, 1835, correspond with a certain letter of the alphabet. In this case, RCE. And when the same characters appeared in Gravity Falls and Murder Police, the football would feature different sets of numbers. If you put these three codes together, they would reveal a secret message. Unfortunately, Royland was the only one of the three to follow through with this plan, and the secret message will go forever undeciphered. Number 96, the passionate bromance between Royland and Hearst is shown again in Big Trouble in Little Sanchez. When Beth and Jerry begin their couple's counseling, you can see Gravity Falls antagonist Bill Cipher on the computer monitor. Number 97, the Rick and Morty Simpsons couch gag pays tribute to more than just The Simpsons. It also has a few nod to Matt Groening's other show, Futurama. Immediately after exiting the portal, the Planet Express ship can be seen flying through the sky. Morty also walks past a soda machine labeled Slurm, a highly addictive soft drink from Futurama. There's also a man with a brain slug. Number 98, the show's runners didn't want to end season two on a cliffhanger because they thought it was a bad idea. Originally, the finale was going to be a two-part episode, but the writers couldn't settle on an idea for the second part, so instead they left audiences hanging. Number 99, with the writing deadline quickly approaching, a filler episode was written at the last minute to replace the second part of The Wedding Squanchers. That episode being Look Who's Purging Now. Number 100, due to the lack of time, Look Who's Purging Now was written by Harmon in less than a day. While the process was stressful and frustrating for Harmon, he now states it was the most fun he's ever had writing an episode. Number 101, Harmon was struck with inspiration from Star Trek episode Red Hour to make fun of the sci-fi trope of The Purge. Number 102, Harmon rewatched both seasons for inspiration on the third. He's expressed his excitement to finally revisit stuff now that the show is a little more established because he was always paranoid about revisiting things in season two. Number 103, season three will be the first season to feature women in the Rick and Morty writing room. Number 104, Harmon wants to do an episode of Rick and Morty that would transport the characters into a reality much like a Bethesda game. It would tell the story in a style similar to the Elder Scrolls or Fallout games, dialogue options and all. He would also like the art style and animation to reflect the 3D rendered models of their games as well. Number 105, Ridley claims that the writers have seriously discussed creating a comic book spin-off of Rick and Morty called Tales from the Thirsty Step, an anthology of stories focusing on the adventures of the various characters that frequent the Thirsty Step, the bar that Rick and Morty go to in Me Seeks and Destroy. Number 106, the demand for merchandising has gone up since season two so much that even the network is a little shocked. Usually Adult Swim doesn't rush the process, but Hot Topic had been hounding the company to produce more merch for the hungry fans. And finally, number 107, there's a strong possibility for a Rick and Morty movie in the future, or at least a television movie. The creators have stated that if they make it to six seasons, they will give a movie some thought. We couldn't just stop there. The wait between seasons has always been torturous, so we kept folks satiated with some additional facts about the mad scientist and his sap of a grandson. This is 107 Rick and Morty Facts You Should Know Part 2. What do you get when you put an alcoholic grandfather and his socially crippled grandson into a world of interdimensional chaos? A big slice of truth and misanthropy. Now you might be thinking to yourself, hey, didn't I see this video before? Why don't you ask the smartest people in the universe, Jerry? Well, you wouldn't be totally wrong because we're actually going back to some of our favorite 107s and updating them. Uh. Hi everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator and it's time to get riggedy riggedy wreck son because we're about to give you 107 facts about Rick and Morty Season 1. And away we go! 
Rick and Morty was created by Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland. The series premiered on December 2nd, 2013. The show was renewed for a second season that aired in July 2015 and a third season in July 2017. That's a full two year gap. Dan Harmon is known for creating the hit NBC comedy, Community. Justin Roiland was no stranger to animation before Rick and Morty. He was known for his voice acting work and for the animated web series House of Cosby. You can hear him play everyone's favorite lemon-headed Earl on Adventure Time and speaking of the Earl of lemon grab his infamous lines unacceptable and the thing the thing, the thing, the thing have both made it into Rick and Morty you can also hear Justin Roiland on Rick and Morty. He plays Rick and, and Morty. Dan Harmon also co-founded Channel 101, a monthly short film festival in Los Angeles where all of the films and pilots are under just five minutes in length. Rick and Morty originated as a crude short that Justin Roiland created for Channel 101. After Harmon was approached by Adult Swim for television show ideas, he and Roiland worked together to develop the series. The original short was actually a parody of the Back to the Future film series titled The Adventures of Doc and Marty. It featured Doc Brown and Marty McFly. When Harmon and Roiland presented it to Adult Swim, the characters were then changed into Rick and Morty, where sure you can guess who became who. Beyond Back to the Future, the creators were also inspired by the general mad scientist archetype, Cat in the Hat, and the Ford Prefect from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when creating Rick. Adult Swim originally wanted the show to consist of 11 minute episodes, but Roiland pushed for longer episodes. Prior to working on Rick and Morty with Harmon, Roiland created three animated pilots for Fox, which all failed. And just being honest, I've checked them out personally and I think they're all pretty funny. Feeling burn out by network development, he was initially unreceptive to outside notes on the series' pitch. There were three directors on Rick and Morty and six storyboard artists. Two per director. According to Erica Hayes, a board artist on the show, they generally have around two weeks to thumbnail and two weeks to clean and one week to revise their storyboards for each episode. The episode Rick's Minutes and the first season's finale both required all hands to be on deck. Artists on the show work digitally using Cintiqs and Max. The series is animated and boarded using Toon Boom software and Adobe After Effects is also used. John Chris Felucci's Ren and Stimpy was a big source of inspiration for the show. Justin Roiland's cartooning style is heavily influenced by The Simpsons. At his San Diego Comic Con panel in 2014, Justin Roiland also cited Pendleton Ward as a main influence. Justin and Dan broke down the show's story, sold the show's pilot, and then proceeded to write its first draft all in the same day. The draft took six hours to complete and was written in Dan Harmon's unfurnished community office on the Paramount Pictures lot. If you're a fan of Rick and Morty and you watched the 26th season finale of The Simpsons, you may have spotted some familiar faces. Rick and Morty appeared during the episode's couch gag, which was written and animated by Dan and Justin. In the Gravity Falls episode, Society of the Blind Eye, some of Stan's belongings are sucked into a portal. They include his notebook, pen, and question mark mug. If you squint and pay attention to the Rick and Morty episode, Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind, some some miscellaneous objects pop out of one of the portals. They include a notebook, pen, and question mark mug. Dan Harmon performed the flu hat and rap in the episode Rick Potion Number no. 9. Harmon also makes a cameo in the show as the bird person in the episode Rixy Business. In the episode M. Night Shyamalan Aliens, the simulation people do a weird glitching thing that's supposed to replicate cartridge tilting. You've probably noticed that the pupils in Rick and Morty's eyes are nice and fuzzy. It's a holdover from the original short and something that Justin Roiland enjoys as a stylistic choice. Oni Press publishes a Rick and Morty comic adaptation that's written by Zach Gorman and illustrated by CJ Cannon. Kyle Starks eventually took over for Gorman when he left the series. And if I do say so myself, those comic adaptations are fantastic. If Dan could summon Mr. Meeseeks, he would have one every time he answered an email to tell him, Ooh, Dan, you did a good job on this email. Yeah, I know my impression is terrible, but I gave it my best shot. He would also say, but I don't think your humor is registering. Maybe you should make it clear that you're kidding. And he would also use one to organize his Facebook page, which I think we could all use. If Justin, Royland, not myself, could summon Mr. Meeseeks, he would have them tell him jokes and try to make him laugh. If they got a really good big laugh out of him, then they could die. Mr. Meeseeks was originally going to be a neon taupe, but the color didn't resonate well with viewers. Justin Roiland got the inspiration for Mr. Meeseeks from his friend's cat, whose name was Ski Seeks. The inspiration didn't strike until years later though, when Roiland tried to liven up a writing session with the phrase, I'm Mr. Meeseeks. Towards the end of the show's second episode, Morty asks what a world populated with intelligent dogs would be like. Rick's response is a reference to a Cartoon Network pilot that Justin Roiland created called Dog World. According to Dan Harmon, 
on a Reddit AMA, a Schmeckle is worth approximately 148 US dollars. When he's speaking with Morty, Rick has a tendency to say Morty's name a lot, like, like a whole lot. Justin Roiland has actually said it's a verbal crutch he's been trying to pull back on. Come on, Morty. Please, Morty. You have to do it, Morty. It's really no secret that Beth has issues, but Dan Harmon once explained that, quote, Beth thinks her dad is better than her mother because her dad had the brain and guts to leave her, end quote. It's how she copes with blaming herself for the separation of her parents. Justin Roiland loves Tim and Eric and would love to have them on the show. Rick and Morty was one of the first shows to premiere a new episode on Instagram. The season one episode, Ricksy Minutes, was uploaded to the show's official page ahead of its usual air date. You may have already forgotten, but this was back in the time when Instagram videos were limited to 15 seconds. In order to put the entire 22 minute episode up, it was split into 109 15 second clips. Yeah. Harmon sees Rick and Morty as two sides of the human brain. Morty is the childish, naive, and curious half, while Rick is the gruff, selfish, and unapologetic side. Together, they're two ends of a battery that powers the show. In the episode Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind, the Eric Stoltz mask Morty is a reference to Eric Stoltz's role as Rocky Dennis in the movie Mask. Fun fact, Stoltz was originally cast as Marty in Back to the Future, but was replaced by Michael J. Fox. Remember that balloon popping game that Jerry played on his iPad? Adult Swim made it real. It's available on the iPad iOS and Android app stores and is called Jerry's Game. Justin Roiland regularly checks Reddit and Tumblr for feedback on the show from fans. He and the staff do their best to keep them happy. In the episode Rick's D Minutes, the vast majority of the alternate universe trailers, TV shows, and commercials shown were improvised by the voice actors. This style of episode occurred again in the show in season two, where characters watch television featuring commercials and teasers that were ad-libbed during recording. And honestly, that's my favorite episode. Rick's D Minutes used more improv than usual, but Rick and Morty's scripts are usually usually written using retro scripting. This means that actors are given an outline of what the characters are meant to say and then ad-lib the exact dialogue. In the episode Anatomy Park, Morty and Annie are chased by Hepatitis A, which is then crushed by Hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is much friendlier, which stems from the real life fact that Hepatitis C is usually benign in the short term. The episode is also a parody of Jurassic Park. Dan Harmon, Justin Roiland, and four of the show's earliest writers, Eric Acosta, Wade Randolph, Ryan Ridley, and Tom Kaufman are all alumni of Channel 101. In an alternate scene from the episode Rick Potion Number 9, alternate Rick and Morty explode into pieces and Rick has to scrape his scrotum off the ceiling. <laughs> Rick's burps are 100% authentic. It's gonna be great, Morty. All kinds of science. When recording Rick's dialogue for an episode, Justin marks lines he wants to do burp takes for. He has the audio engineer continue continue recording and uses a low calorie beer and water to get air in his stomach. Then he reads lines trying to catch the burps in the middle of them. In his own words, quote, the whole process is disgusting. Morty is technically Morty Smith Sr. since he's raised by Morty Jr. Summer hates Yahtzee. Beth is originally from Muskegon, Michigan. Roland originally said that while other shows keep track of story arcs and character lists, Rick and Morty intentionally discards these restrictions so the characters and plot can move more organically. While they may still disregard certain restrictions, later seasons have introduced continuing story arcs like Bird Person and Rick going into prison. Sarah Chalk, the voice of Beth, thinks the animation of Rick and Morty is beautiful. She also says she would love to be able to draw. I mean, you know, same here. I can't draw for anything. Sarah has previously played another blonde doctor. Fans of the comedy series Scrubs know her as Dr. Elliot Reed. Chris Parnell, the voice of Jerry, is a sci-fi fan, and he absolutely adores the universe that Rick and Morty takes place in. Justin Roiland has said that there's a possibility of Mr. Meeseeks returning. Quote, that box seems like a pretty useful tool to have around in a pinch. Certain moments in each episode were improvised by Roiland, a big example is the cold open in the show's pilot. The scene where he plays with Morty in the alien scammer ship was also improv. Justin records the voices for Rick and Morty separately or in real time back and forth, depending on what they feel would work best for the scene. Some of the show's story ideas have come from real events that have happened to its creators or people they know, but the characters are 100% made up. Roiland loves using his voice record outtakes as intakes. Dialogue editor Tommy Meehan is very much in sync with his humor and makes some surprising choices on what to cut in. Morty Jr. hates cartoons and video games. His favorite TV channel is the History Channel. Harmon has compared the show's tone to British sci-fi franchises like Doctor Who and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He feels that they're able to give audiences so much more credit to be able to handle darkness or edginess. In fact, they don't consider any topic completely off limits or too dark for the writer's room because that's usually what makes the writers and then the viewers laugh the hardest. Do you see yourself walking in Morty's shoes? Harmon feels that the sidekicks in the shows he mentioned are stand-ins for the viewers. He can't connect with the all-knowing lead 
did so, he identifies with the innocent admirers. The animation for Rick and Morty is divided between Starburns Industries and Burbank and Bardell Entertainment and Vancouver. Storyboards, designs, color keys, and backgrounds are completed in Burbank and assembled in Vancouver, with some production assistance provided from the Philippines. The creators of Rick and Morty often push boundaries with their jokes and storylines. Luckily, they aren't the first cartoon to do so. When writing, they found it helpful to use South Park as the model for what an animated series can get away with. The title of the episode, Lawnmower Dog, is a reference to the film The Lawnmower Man. In the film, a scientist gives a mentally handicapped gardener super intelligence, and in the episode, Rick gives the family dog Snuffles artificial intelligence. Jerry majored in civics in college and has worked at an advertising agency and the Galactic Federation, but unfortunately was laid off from both jobs. Poor dude. Roland believes that Beth is fine with Rick dragging her kids around because she doesn't want him to leave again. She also really doesn't care that much. A plus parenting, Beth. Rick's catchphrase Wubba Lubba Dub Dub was meant to be a joke on stupid catchphrases. In Roland's words, it's a horrible cringeworthy catchphrase that I just made up in the record as an outtake that made its way into the show. In the season two finale, Rixy Business, the meaning behind Rick's catchphrase is revealed. Bird person explains to Morty that in his native language, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub means I am in great pain, Please help me. Despite Bird Person's insisting, Morty isn't convinced that Rick was being that deep. Do you believe him? Morty's dog Snuffles is based on Justin Roiland's dog, Jerry. Jerry is also a Maltese. In the same vein as many other Adult Swim shows, Rick and Morty's writing staff is not unionized with the Writing Guild of America. Roiland predicts that an adult Morty would look a lot like Jerry, but have some of Rick's fantastic abilities. I guess you could say look for the adventures of adult Morty in, in like a hundred years. Which celebrity guest star is Justin Roiland trying to nab for the show? Well, he said, quote, hoping to get Jesus Christ on the show once he returns and all that. Rick's been trying to figure out how to make time travel work, but Justin Roiland doesn't think he'll ever figure it out. Quote, because it's stupid and he knows it. This is actually tied to Roiland's stance that time travel stories suck now because there's nothing new to explore. Despite Rick and Morty's Back to the Future background, he said he'll never do a time traveling story. While this may disappoint some fans, they can still look forward to Rick and Morty jumping between dimensions. Jerry is a big fan of Titanic. If you pay close attention during closer encounters of the Rick kind, you'll notice that he has a picture of the Titanic on the wall of his study. And he also takes takes Beth on a Titanic-themed romantic getaway in Rixie business. Justin Roiland has revealed that there's a bigger picture to the show, but he loves the episodic nature it already has, so the serialized plot will be subtle. Whatever you do, don't look to Rick and Morty for scientific accuracy, because the creators do very little research and focus more on storytelling. They do look into science and sci-fi to help with episode concepts and Rick's gadgets, but have a more Star Wars approach to things. Cool devices aren't explained, but seem plausible in the distant future. The head of Adult Swim personally reads each episode outline and script and calls the creators to share his thoughts. He does what he can to help them get away with their more risque business and even fights with standards and practices for them. In Harmon's words, he's the greatest man in all of television. In Roiland's, he is a hero. The creators of Rick and Morty do their best to not alienate new viewers. It's one of the reasons that Roiland shies away from a serialized plot. Harmon described the style of season one as a car driving 90 miles per hour in a straight line and season two as the car taking a corner and hitting a few mailboxes. This is because he felt season two was cooler, but also more out of control. The season two episode, Look Who's Purging Now, written by Dan Harmon, Justin Roiland, and Ryan Ridley, was Roiland's favorite episode of the season. In season one, they scrapped a story idea where one of Rick's ex-girlfriends was a hive mind. Rick and Morty would be at a space convention and spot one of the six original hive members. They try to avoid her, but realize that the hive had expanded to thousands of people and be spotted. Sound familiar? This story popped up in season two. Voicing Mr. Meeseeks as well as Lemon Grab leaves Justin Roiland with a throbbing headache and the need to rest his voice. In a 2016 panel, the creators revealed what's in Rick's flask, sort of. Roiland said that Rick is a, quote, connoisseur of all good liquor, so he's always sipping on something different, and he gets it from a dimension where Hennessy is a dollar for a 750 milliliter bottle. Justin Roiland thinks that Rick's penis is the size of a three-year-old's arm. And on the other hand, Dan Harmon feels like Jerry is hung. The Mazzy star cinch at the end of Rick Potion number nine is thanks to Justin Roiland. They're one of his all-time favorite bands, and Dan is also a fan. The title of the episode, Me Seeks and Destroy, is a reference to the Metallica song, Seek and Destroy. The title of the episode, Raising Gazorpazorp, is a reference to the film, Raising Arizona. The episode has numerous references to the film, Zardoz, including the floating head, societal 
metal structure, red color, and bizarre crime sentences. The Cronenbergs are named after David Cronenberg, a Canadian filmmaker, screenwriter, and actor who is known for his body of horror films. Closer Encounters of the Rick Kind is the highest rated episode of the very first season. King Jellybean has also appeared in a short that Justin Roiland made for Channel 101. He's Crumply Crumplestein, the host of the show Unbelievable Tales. King Jellybean was voiced by Tom Kenny, who also voices SpongeBob and Ice King. The name of the shop in Something Rick This Way Comes is Needful Things and is a reference to the store in the Stephen King novel of the same name. In Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind, one of Rick's memories of Morty is picking him up as a child, which is actually kind of interesting to note because Rick has been absent from his family for like 20 years. When he's insulting the devil's products in Something Rick This Way Comes, Rick references the Twilight Zone. Jerry has an antique coin collection that replaces George Washington with R2-D2. He claims that Beth hates him because he bought them. The show's main Rick and Morty are the Rick and Morty of Dimension C-137. It's implied that C-137 is the reality in which Rick Cronenberg the world in Rick Potion Number 9, but it has yet to be stated which dimension it was that they escaped to and are currently in. The Council of Ricks in the episode Closer Encounters of the Rick Kind is a parody of Marvel's Council of Reeds. More than the frequent burping, Adult Swim was concerned with how many times Rick says Morty's name. In the episode Rixie Business, the song that plays at the end of the episode is titled Booty Bass Shake That Ass Bitch. I I can I even say that? At the office where the creators work on Rick and Morty, there's a pile of Nerf guns and flickering fluorescent lights because no one's come back to fix them. Season 3 kicked off a bit of our Rick and Morty renaissance. The wait was so long, folks were foaming at the mouth for more. When this season dropped, oh boy did we eat it up. So many memes and so much mayhem, from Pickle Rick to the Szechuan sauce incident, Rick and Morty absolutely claimed the crown of king of pop culture. Let's delve into 107 Rick and Morty season 3 facts you should know. It finally happened, people. After nearly two years of waiting, season three of Rick and Morty has graced our televisions, and needless to say, we have a lot to talk about. Hi, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and it's time to grab your portal gun and hop on over to a dimension where the Szechuan sauce flows like water, because we've got 107 facts about Rick and Morty season three. Let's get started. <laughs> Season 3 of Rick and Morty was first confirmed by Justin Roiland partway through Season 2 on August 12th, 2015. After what felt like an eternity of waiting, Season 3 actually premiered one year, five months, and 28 days later on April 1st, 2017. The air date, April 1st of 2017, is almost exactly a year and a half after The Wedding Squanchers, which aired on October 4th of 2015, as stated by Mr. Poopy Butthole at the end of the episode. A year and a half would have been three days later on April 4th. The first episode, The Rick Shank Rick Demption, debuted unannounced and unadvertised and was uploaded as a continuous looping stream on Adult Swim as part of an April Fool's Day publicity stunt. It was the head of Adult Swim, Mike Lazo's idea to air the season 3 premiere on April Fool's Day. At first, Harmon and Roiland didn't love the idea, but eventually they came around. The biggest concern with an April Fool's Day premiere was that people would think that the episode was a joke, which of course ended up being the case. At the time of its airing, fans seemed split on whether or not the episode was real or just a really elaborate joke. Either way, the decision to play the episode on a loop was a smart one, as the premiere's ratings improved over the course of the night, with 11pm ratings almost doubling since the 8pm ones. Following the surprise premiere on April Fool's Day, the show took a brief hiatus. The second episode premiered on July 30th, 2017, and episodes were released on a weekly basis after that, with the exception of Labor Day weekend. The final episode of Season 3, The Richurian Morty Date, aired on October 1st of 2017. In January of 2016, Dan Harmon announced that season 3 would have 14 episodes at Magic City Comic Con. However, and unfortunately, during the surprise Rick and Morty livestream on June 29th of 2017, Royland and Harmon sadly announced that season 3 would only be 10 episodes. Dan Harmon blames his perfectionist nature for the show only getting 10 episodes this season instead of 14. For those who don't know, Dan Harmon can get a little picky about the quality of his work, and since he was fired before the fourth season of Community, another one of his shows, he just wants to make sure that the work he's putting out is exemplary. The good news is that Dan Dan Harmon has apparently learned from his mistakes this season and thinks the crew could successfully do 14 episodes for season 4. As of right now, the plan for season 4 is to make 10 episodes efficiently, prove to Adult Swim that they can do so without any problems, and then get Adult Swim to greenlight more episodes. Season 3's final episode, The Richurian Morty Date, was finaleified only when the crew realized that they weren't going to be able to make 14 episodes for the season. The biggest change on the third season of Rick and Morty came behind the scenes, where Harmon and Royland decided to add four new female writers to their staff. 
staff. Prior to that, Rick and Morty went two seasons without a single female writer on staff, which fueled an ongoing controversy in the public eye about the lack of female writers on Adult Swim shows. It's worth pointing out that the lack of female writers was not a conscious decision by Roiland and Harmon, and was more so due to a lack of applicants. When it came time to staff the third season of the show, they received five or six sample scripts from women, which Roiland claims had never happened before. By hiring four female writers, Harmon and Roiland created a 50-50 male-female split on the writing staff, excluding themselves. The four new writers were Jane Becker, Erica Rosby, Sarah Carbiner, and Jessica Gao. Gao previously served as a writer on Robot Chicken, while the other writers didn't have many credits prior to Rick and Morty. Carbiner and Rosby have been writing partners since college and got the gig on Rick and Morty after someone on the show saw a sci-fi comedy script that they wrote together. A balanced writer's room meant that both the men and women could increase their attention on Beth and Summer. Prior to the inclusion of women writers, the men sometimes struggled to understand how to write for a teenage girl or a mother. Unfortunately, a balanced writing staff didn't seem to speed up the process any, as season 3 took 12 straight months of writing. Concerned fans speculated that season 3 took so long because Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland were fighting, but Harmon quickly dismissed this fear in a series of tweets. In reality, part of the reason the show took so long to write was from pressure due to the monumental success of seasons 1 and 2. The writers often found themselves overthinking the script, so things that took 5 minutes to work out in season 1 took much longer in season 3. And now, of course, we have to talk about the McDonald's Szechuan sauce. What started off as a throwaway joke in the Rick Shank Rick Demption very quickly became a cultural phenomenon. According to Dan Harmon, the sauce joke was intended as a play on the obsessive consumerism of Justin Roiland, who also just happens to really like the sauce. Rick's quote about the Nintendo DS from Season 2's Total Rickall is almost verbatim the words of Justin Roiland from an event that happened one day at the office, which must mean that Roiland might have also had a Rick-like rant about Szechuan sauce? It took way less than nine seasons, though, as McDonald's sent Roiland 64 ounces of Szechuan sauce in July of 2017, just a couple months after the Season 3 premiere. In in order to bring back the sauce, McDonald's claimed to have opened a portal to Dimension C-1998M, a dimension where it's always 1998. A couple months later, McDonald's announced that it was bringing back the Szechuan sauce in limited supply for one day only on October 7th of 2017. Unfortunately, the promotion was infamously a complete backfire. The super limited amount of sauce that they released was not nearly enough to meet the demand, and people were not happy about it. If you missed out on the sauce and have a couple hundred bucks to blow, check each eBay. An offer for three sealed packs of the sauce sold for $848.88, while a single packet reached bids as high as $995. Or, if you missed out on the sauce, you can just wait. On October 8th of 2017, McDonald's announced that they would bring the sauce back in winter 2017 with a much greater supply. Although inspired by Rick and Morty, McDonald's decision to re-release the sauce has no official affiliation with Rick and Morty, Adult Swim, or Justin Roiland, or Dan Harmon. McDonald's did say, though, that Roiland approved of the poster designs for the sauces, but just as a fan. Okay, that's enough sauce facts for now. Although it's not officially canon, Dan Harmon revealed that Rick's origin story from the Rick Shank Rick Redemption may have more truth to it than we think. Rick reveals that the origin story was a construct to trap the Gromflamite, but Harmon says the best way to construct something is to take it from reality. Rick Mansing the Stone started out with the idea of Rick having a bookalyzer, which was a device that allowed you to go into any book. They were going to find a book by Jerry that he wrote when he was younger, and they end up trapped in his crappy novel. In case it isn't obvious enough, Rick Mansing the Stone is mostly an homage to George Miller and his Mad Max series of films. Harmon and Roiland have wanted to reference the post-apocalyptic franchise for a while now and thought it was the perfect way to explore themes of manhood and womanhood. Season 3 is the first and so far only season of Rick and Morty to not have an interdimensional cable episode. If the crew had been able to make the intended 14 episodes for season 3, there likely would have been a third interdimensional cable. Instead, as Rick so aptly announces in the episode, Morty's Mind Blower serves as this season's anthology-style episode. And true to form, it is the eighth episode of the season. Rick's The Minutes and Interdimensional Cable 2 Tempting Fate were the eighth episodes of season one and two, respectively. The Rick and Morty writing staff used a whiteboard and pitched over 100 ideas for Morty's Mind Blowers, including a pitch for cake stairs that never made it in. Ho oh, cake stairs. Another idea included Rick falling in love with a truck, one saw Morty transformed into a living painting and auctioned off. It seemed 
seemed like nothing was off the table in terms of ideas. Ultimately, the writers voted on what they felt were the top ideas and then further developed them. So what happened to the unused ideas? Well, the writers are gonna hang on to them and potentially use them for future episodes. In Morty's Mind Blowers, we catch a very brief glimpse of an interdimensional cable show, House Hunters. Unlike the show in our universe, though, the interdimensional version follows a group of hunters as they track down and kill sentient houses. Interdimensional Cable 3 might not have aired on television, but it did come out via comics. To coincide with the season 3 premiere on Adult Swim, the Rick and Morty comics released their 23rd issue titled Interdimensional Cable 3. Time for some little fun fact nuggets. In Morty's Mind Blowers, the truth tortoise at the beginning of the episode says, I am a beetle, Paul is dead, backwards to Morty. The quote from the truth turtle is a reference to an old conspiracy theory that claimed Paul McCartney from the Beatles died around 1966 or 67 and was replaced by a lookalike. Claims to the theory included listening to certain tracks by the group backwards that revealed clues of Paul's death, which would also explain why a fan listened to the truth turtle backwards. Vindicators 3, The Return of World Ender, featured the rapper Logic as a guest star. Logic performs a song dedicated to Noob Noob during the final scene and end credits of the episode. Vindicators 3, The Return of World Ender, marks the third time the Vindicators were assembled. According to the episode, the previous two meetings happened during Rick and Morty's adventures off-screen during Last Summer. In the real world, Last Summer would make the last time the Vindicators assembled the summer of 2016, which sadly was a summer without any Rick and Morty. The fact that Rick and Morty weren't invited to Vindicators 2 might be a nod to Season 3's delayed production. At the encouragement of Dan Harmon and against the warnings of producer Sidney Ryan, Justin Roiland actually got drunk in the booth to properly method act and portray drunk Rick for Vindicators 3. According to Sidney Ryan, the day Roiland got drunk in the booth was the least productive and messiest recording day that the studio has ever had. Speaking of getting drunk, Dan Harmon says that Rick's flask is full of vodka and that the liquor anchors Rick to reality. Vodka is also Harmon's drink of choice. He even has a sponsorship from Kettle One called the Kettle One Alliance, in which they send him monthly shipments of vodka and access to a concierge. At one point, Million Ants had a sidekick who was named Three More Ants. According to Rick's game, he has a tragic origin, so it's possible we could be looking at a Jason Todd situation here. Three More Ants made it through a couple of iterations of the script, but ultimately was cut from the final episode. Vindicators 3 is the 10th adventure Morty chooses on his Morty adventure card, which is a reference to the bet that he won in Me Seeks and Destroy. The bet allows Morty to choose one in every 10 Rick and Morty adventures, so that would mean that there have been at least 100 adventures since Me Seeks and Destroy. In the Whirly Durly conspiracy, it's revealed that Rick has cybernetic implants in a majority of his body, which could be due to the events in the Rickshank Rickdemption, where Rick switched bodies with Quantum Rick from the former Citadel of Ricks. The scanner in Whirly Durly reveals that Rick has a brain implant, a prosthetic left eye, artificial robotic arms and legs, and implants in his lungs, heart, and stomach. The augmentations have descriptions, but we haven't been able to translate the language in the terminal. Rick's skin is also augmented with a nanofiber defense mesh on his skin capable of repelling people or aliens away from him. The beginning scene of the Whirly Durly conspiracy where Rick drags naked Jerry out of his bed is an homage to the pilot episode's opening scene where Rick does the same thing to Morty. The World Toxifier device in Rest and Rick Laxation is powered by two microverse batteries. It's not explicitly mentioned, but the batteries have a striking resemblance to those from the Ricks Must Be Crazy. Toxic Rick mentions that Rick's age is around 70 years old, so I guess Rick is getting up there in age, so the cybernetic modifications make perfect sense now. Morty's girlfriend, Jacqueline, mentions that Morty is from the Midwest, which contradicts a previous statement from Royland that said that the family lives in Washington just outside of Seattle. It's possible that detoxified Morty lied to Jacqueline, but lying would probably be considered a toxin, right? Season 3 is the first season where we see Rick wear a seatbelt. He first does so in Pickle Rick, and then continues to do so in Rest and Rick Laxation. Episode 7, the Ricklantis mix-up, was advertised as an adventure to Atlantis. Technically speaking, Rick and Morty did go on an adventure to Atlantis, but what viewers actually saw was Tales from the Citadel, an episode that detailed Evil Morty's rise to power on the Citadel. During the rally attended by Cop Rick and Cop Morty in Tales from the Citadel, Mortys are shown holding signs that reference previous episodes. One says, nobody exists on purpose, which Morty told Summer during Ricksty Minutes, and another says, don't be trippin' dog, which is close to the line that Morty said in Lawnmower Dog. The Ricklantis mix-up slash Tales from the Citadel is the highest rated Rick and Morty episode on IMDb, just edging out the previous holder, the Rickshank Rickdemption. As a whole, no episode from season 3 earned less than 8 out of 10 stars. The ABCs of Beth reminds us yet again that despite whatever the box in the garage says, Rick and Morty does not mess with time travel. At the end of the episode, Rick quickly gets pizza and then goes out of his way to explain how he went to an alternate reality that didn't create daylight savings time and stole pizzas from the counter. 
Walter. Thus, he did not place an order in wait, explaining how he returned almost immediately. Rick invented nearly everything his daughter asked him to make when she was a child. The list of inventions goes by quick in the episode, so here they all are for you one more time. A ray gun, a whip that makes people like you, invisibility handcuffs, a parent leg trap, a lightning gun, a teddy bear with anatomically correct innards, night vision googly eyeglasses, sound erasing sneakers, false fingerprints, fall asleep darts, a lie detecting doll, an indestructible baseball bat, a ladybug taser, a fake police badge, location tracking stickers, rainbow duct tape, mind control hair clips, poison gum, and a pink sentient switchblade. All essentials for a growing girl. In the ABCs of Beth, Rick references Reddit and R2-D2. He compares the way he treated Beth as a child to a father who designed a toilet that looked like R2-D2 as a way of entertaining his kids and getting a claim on Reddit for it. It sounds legit, but there's no currently known real-life Reddit post or instance of such an event happening, although I'm sure since the episode has aired, some father has been hard at work on an R2-D2 toilet. Ryan Ridley calls the ABCs ABCs of Beth, the wildest episode of the show he's ever done, mostly because it deals with incest, bestiality, and cannibalism all within the span of one 22-minute episode. Royland says they didn't want to include bestiality, but apparently the fans demanded it and market research showed that the people wanted it, so I think we all need to take a good hard look at ourselves in the mirror and contemplate our life choices tonight. The end of the ABCs of Beth is intentionally vague and ambiguous. The writers wanted to leave it up to the viewers to decide for themselves if it mattered to them whether or not Beth was cloned. Even Beth herself doesn't know the outcome as she questions her own identity in the Rickturian and Morty debt and in true Rick and Morty fashion doesn't ever get an actual answer. Rick and Morty break 1,000 federal laws a day but never get arrested because they've been pardoned by the president thanks to their help in saving the world on numerous occasions. According to Rick and several of the president's advisors, Rick has a Wikipedia page which seems to indicate that he's somewhat well known on Earth. From the sound of it, Rick edits his own Wikipedia page and has included some fake weaknesses on it such as Sanchezium. However, there are some things listed on Rick's Wikipedia page that are true, such as the fact that Rick Sanchez is afraid of pirates. Strangely enough, Pirates of the Pancreas was his favorite ride in the Anatomy Park episode. Maybe he had an experience on the ride, or maybe he rode it one too many times and now the pirates haunt his dreams? The Smith family has a secret cabin located on the scenic Mount Hill where they go to occasionally hide from Rick. And before you go searching, there doesn't seem to be a real Mount Hill in our world, probably because the name is a bit contradictory and funny. Rick and Morty both play Minecraft and seem to really enjoy the game. In the Rickturian and Morty did, they blow off Saving America to mine stuff to craft with and craft stuff to mine with. A very Dan Harmon move. Terry Fold, the song from Rest and Rick Laxation, was written by Justin Roiland and Seattle duo band Chaos Chaos. In case you haven't heard it, the song features a Mac DeMarco-like guitar riff and a propulsive bass line. And of course, a nonsensical stream of lyrics from Roiland himself. Believe it or not, Terry Fold debuted at number 33 on the Billboard Hot Rock Songs chart on September 23rd of 2017 after the song was streamed in the US 1.1 million times and sold at 1,000 downloads for the week ending September 7th. Terry Fold even received a radio edit and was even played on some stations, such as Vermont Radio Station 102.7 WEQX. Justin Roiland declared a fan-made music video by Neon Robotic the official music video for Terry Fold, and it's about as disturbing and not safe for work as you'd imagine. Chaos Chaos also composed the music for Fathers and Daughters, the song featured in the ABCs of Beth, although the lyrics were written by Dan Harmon this time instead of Justin Roiland. Adult Swim released a full-length version of Fathers and Daughters online in case the abridged version from the episode wasn't enough for you. It may seem like another random Rick and Morty song, but Fathers and Daughters is actually surprisingly deep. Nerdist broke down the lyrics and came to the conclusion that the song is about Rick realizing and accepting his flaws, and while no song can make up for them, he wants to let Beth know that he loves her. A Rick and Morty coffee table art book, The Art of Rick and Morty, was released in September of 2017 and features concept art from seasons 1 and 2. In celebration of season 3, the game Pocket Mortys had weekly updates that coincided with new episodes and released new avatars based on the characters in the episodes. In an effort to help raise money after Hurricane Maria, Pocket Morty's donated all proceeds from October 1st to Puerto Rico. Beth and Jerry's divorce at the beginning of Season 3 was a creative decision by Harmon and the writing staff. Harmon felt it would be good to move away from the running joke of the dysfunctional marriage from Seasons 1 and 2. By having the two get divorced, it allowed the writers to explore a new family dynamic and better connect to viewers who have been through the same thing in their childhood. Many of the writers on the show were raised by separated parents, so their own personal 
stories were imbued into the season as well. Pickle Rick and the Ricklantis mix-up are two of Dan Harmon's favorite episodes, while Rest and Ricklaxation is one of Royland's favorites. Season 3 of Rick and Morty was the most watched comedy show in Adult Swim's 16-year history of programming. Harmon and Royland think the year-and-a-half gap between seasons 2 and 3 helped the show grow in popularity, leading to the massive success of season 3. The series doesn't just stop with Adult Swim. According to Nielsen surveys and Live Plus 7 ratings, Rick and Morty is currently the most popular comedy series on TV for adults aged 18 to 34 in the US. We mentioned the TV ratings for the season premiere, but the live stream ratings were the bigger indicator of success. The live stream season premiere recorded 3 million unique visitors, 43.3 million impressions, and 8.7 million video views combined. Based on those numbers alone, it was a clear sign that season 3 was heading for record-breaking heights. In the gap between season Seasons 2 and 3, Mr. Poopy Butthole has curbed his addiction to painkillers, settled down with a family, and earned his G. Ooh-wee! The Meeseeks were supposed to return in Season 3, but the episode would have required a rewrite, and Royland didn't want to completely change the episode just to include Meeseeks. The Meeseeks do make a very brief cameo in the background of a scene in Morty's Mind Blowers, but if you blink, you'll miss it. Luckily, you've got us to point it out. The fly code to make the Smith family garage transform into Rick's laboratory is right, left, right, right, right. During Rick's Szechuan rant in the Rick Shank Rick Demption, he mentions nine more seasons multiple times. Fans speculate that this is a reference to Dan Harmon's community, which frequently made meta-level jokes about the show receiving six seasons and a movie. Ultimately, community delivered on the six seasons, but fans are still waiting on the movie. Rick Sanchez diagnosed himself as autistic in the Rick Churian Morty Dent. During production on community, Dan Harmon took a test online and also self-diagnosed himself to be on the autism spectrum. Season four has not been officially announced yet as of recording this video on October 20th of 2017, but Harmon himself has said that the show will be returning, and in one interview said that he's about to do season 4. Also, with record-breaking numbers, it seems inevitable that Adult Swim will greenlight a fourth season, but we'll just have to wait to find out. Fans are already speculating that season 4 will revolve around the potentially cloned Beth from the ABCs of Beth and a potential Council of Beths. According to Mr. Poopy Butthole, season 4 might not come for a while again. He said that the next time we see him, he may have a big white beard and grandchildren, although the real meaning of this quote seems to be up for debate amongst fans. Some fans theorize that season 3 isn't actually over with the Richurian Morty date, and that another episode is coming in another couple of months. It sounds far-fetched, but considering the three-month gap between the first and second episode of the season, all precedent's been thrown out the window. Anything's possible. He requires no introduction. He's not the post-ironic hero we needed, but he sure as hell was the post-ironic hero we deserved. Here are seven facts about him. On August 6th, eager Rick and Morty fans tuned into Adult Swim to watch what was arguably the most anticipated episode of the season yet, and it was totally worth the hype. Pickle Rick was an instant classic, a non-stop thrill ride delivering ferocious fight scenes, gruesome gore, and an even more intense family therapy session. What's up guys, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're giving you 7 facts on Rick and Morty Season 3, Episode 3, faster than you can shout, I'm Pickle Rick! So, you know, what do you say? With that being said, let's get swift. I I I mean started. <laughs> So right off the bat, it's fairly obvious that this was a why not scenario for the zany mad scientist, but what many people don't know is that this entire concept was conceived from an inside joke. The idea came into fruition during a season 3 brainstorming session in the writer's room. Apparently, it had been a slow day at the office because 10 whole minutes of complete silence had passed before Dan Harmon and possibly blurted out, by the way, Rick is a pickle. Naturally, everyone shared a laugh, but then they thought, hey, what if Rick was actually a pickle? and the idea started to flow. Episode writer Jessica Gao claims the vision was so clear from the start that Pickle Rick wrote itself in no time. In fact, there were only two drafts written before the episode was greenlit for production, making this one of the quickest Rick and Morty episodes created so far. The story snowballed once they decided to take Pickle Rick into the sewer, and from there, the order of events seemed very clear. Then, the question of why instilled the idea of the B story with the family therapy session, and because the writers knew immediately that they wanted a bloody action sequence with Pickle Rick in the sewer, it just made sense to juxtapose that against scenes that were the exact opposite. Dan Harmon relied on his love for classic 80s and 90s action movie tropes, incorporating several timeless cliches that we'll be going over here shortly. Stay tuned for that later. Obviously, the Pickle Rick character design wasn't much of a challenge, but the rats? Those were a different story. Initially, they were considered to be way too cute for the action sequence, and people were starting to actually feel bad that Rick was slaughtering them. So, designers went back to the drawing 
drawing board to amp up the ugly, and the end result was something out of a horror film. They added hunchbacks, warts, missing patches of fur, ghostly eyes, and a ravenous taste for blood, or brine, I should say. Doo -doo. The exosuit also went through quite a design phase, in fact, everyone on the creative team got a shot at designing it. The sketches were released online in a behind the scenes featurette shortly after the episode aired, and it's interesting to see how the early designs were a bit more elaborate than the finished product. The suit that they chose was more streamlined, but the earlier sketches explored concepts that were more massive and some more humanized. Sort of. There were also a few hybrid cockroach slash rat suits and a few others that found creative ways to incorporate sewer garbage like old syringes equipped it to the arms. The second runner up was a suit that utilized a rat butt on the front as armor, but surprisingly enough the design didn't get picked, although it lasted through a few redesigns. Then on another interesting note, character designer Maximus J. Pawson took the time to drop Jaguar's daughter Katarina, even though she never appears in the episode. It was purely fun on his part and the proof is in the design because she looks like a mini version of Jaguar with pigtails and a dress. Somehow, we should have guessed. Hands down, one of the best aspects of the episode was Pickle Rick's exosuit because it was actually based on real science. In 2015, Current Biology published a study entitled Central Complex Control of Movement in the Freely Walking Cockroach, in which researchers prodded a cockroach's brain to determine which neurons control speed and movement. According to this study, every movement that a cockroach makes is encoded within the central complex cells of its brain, and when the neurons are activated, it causes the limbs to move. Essentially, Essentially, this means that these connections are saved within the neurons, so the brain is sort of pre-programmed to make these movements. Which explains why Pickle Rick could manipulate their bodies so easily. Apparently, this research is being applied to the study of robotics, giving engineers a better insight to how to recreate the motor process, but this also provides a great deal of insight on how other animals move, including humans. So, you know, we may not have technology capable of transforming people into pickles and vice versa, but gaining total control of a cockroach's body via their brain is still a pretty cool win in the name of science. This episode featured an outstanding guest star lineup, the most recognizable of which was Danny Trejo from the Machete movies voicing Jaguar, a new fan favorite character. Another big surprise was actor Peter Serafinowicz's performance as the agency director. If the name doesn't ring a bell, he's most recently known for his performance as the Tick in the new Amazon series. However, the real story here is how Susan Sarandon came to voice the role of Dr. Wong. Surely, most fans probably assumed this was simply a joke on the writer's part, but the truth is, it was merely a happy accident. Writer Jessica Gao was determined to include an Asian character on the show, because until now, there really hasn't been one. They were mid-process for casting the role and Jessica had her heart set on an Asian comedian, but out of nowhere, Dan received a notice that Susan wanted to be on the show. And as Jessica put it, you can't say no to Susan Sarandon. So she was immediately cast as Dr. Wong, but the question still remains, why the heck does an Academy Award winning actress like Susan Sarandon want to be on Rick and Morty? Dan Harmon speculates that her kid must be a fan, but we here at Channel Frederator say that the show is just that awesome. Every episode of Rick and Morty is loaded with fun easter eggs for fans that know where to look, and Pickle Rick is no exception. So we jotted down as many as we could for your viewing pleasure. Starting with the very first scene while Morty is getting ready in the bathroom, there's a picture of his dog Snuffles from Season 1 Episode 2, Lawnmower Dog. This is one of the two nods to the original universe where the series took place, now referred to as the Cronenberg universe. The second nod is when Rick tells Jaguar that he abandoned Beth in his universe. There's another more subtle throwback to the first season when Mr. Goldenfold mentions his poop eating disorder. Immediately, the alternate universe where everyone eats poop comes to mind from the Rick Steve Minutes episode of season one. Also in this scene is Dr. Wong's second study, coprophagia, listed on her door. Coprophagia means consumption of feces. I suppose the inspirational hot dog photo on the wall makes a lot more sense now. When Rick takes a glass bottle out of the trash and puts it in the recycling, it's considered an insult to the Russian bad guys, referencing California's progressively green way of thinking. Also, during the standoff theme with Rick and Jaguar in the office, there were many humanizing aspects such as family photos and personal memos hidden in the background to depict the bad guys in a more positive light. Then there was even an easter egg for all of you gamers out there. The infamous Starcraft scream, aka the Howie scream, soundbite plays when we see a bad guy get laser blasted in the hallway at the embassy. It's no secret that Pickle Rick was composed almost entirely out of action movie cliches, but there were a few unexpected references that might have slipped under your radar. For instance, the opening scene where Rick is calling Morty's name is a 
a shout out to the High Fructose Adventures of Annoying Orange, which is one of the many shows that Jessica Gao has written for before Rick and Morty. Also during the first act, Rick mentions cats being afraid of cucumbers, a very popular internet trend, and his comparison of dying on the toilet is a reference to Elvis' death. That's right, you know, the king was actually found on his throne, for those of you who didn't know. A more subtle reference is Rick's journey through the sewer. Believe it or not, this is an odd spin on Fievel Goes West, when Fievel's family journeys through the sewers. The action movies start coming into play with a loose send up to Iron Man, in which Rick's new exosuit is assembled by way of machine, similar to Tony Stark's method. The entire embassy storyline was mostly derived from Die Hard, with a few elements that seem reminiscent of the Bourne identity, diluted with several other action hero franchises. Continuing this trend is the cliche Jaguar character, whose story is similar to that of Commando, the irony here being that Die Hard was originally pitched as Commando 2, before Arnold Schwarzenegger passed on the part. Also, you may have noticed that during the standoff with Jaguar and Rick in the office, that there's a fun Rambo reference when Jaguar uses gunpowder to cauterize his wounds, much like the titular hero in the third film. Jaguar also incorporates the infamous Van Damme splits during this action sequence, a signature move that Van Damme performed in nearly every single one of his films. Then, last but not least, the most recent film to be parodied here is John Wick. It's relatively subtle, but while the Russians call John Wick Baba Yaga, aka the Boogeyman, they refer to Rick as Solnia, which translates to the Pickle Man. Honestly, I'm not sure which one is more intimidating. All it took was one promo trailer and the bizarre pickle portrayal of Rick Sanchez was already a fan favorite. That's right, even before the episode aired, people were completely taken with the idea. We're talking fan art, memes, ringtones, Tumblr blogs, Twitter pages, t-shirts, and a sudden demand for an official Pickle Rick emoji. Not to mention the power of the catchphrase, I'm Pickle Rick! The online response was so overwhelming that when it came time for the episode to actually premiere, the show tweeted out the wait is over to all the fans biting their nails in anticipation over this episode, and definitely, it did not disappoint. From helplessly falling into the sewer limbless and alone, to building a full exosuit made from rat parts, and then murdering a bunch of Russian agents, Pickle Rick is likely to have any fan fired up over the 80s action scenes, international intrigue, and campy B-movie fun. So really, hats off to the writers on this one. As always, the Rick and Morty crew gave us exactly what we wanted, bloody action and absurdity in the form of a humanoid pickle. Now that you're all jacked up on Pickle Rick, let's get into some of the finer details of Season 3. All of those sweet, sweet pop culture references everyone loves to recognize. This is a two-parter, detailing all sorts of Rick and Morty Season 3 pop culture references by episode. Enjoy! A little while ago, we posted a video detailing a whole bunch of references made by the second half of season three of Rick and Morty. Well, now that the season hiatus is officially in full swing, we've decided to revisit the first half of season three for the same treatment. What's up everyone, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're looking at references made by Rick and Morty season three, episodes one to five. Get your abnormally large arms ready, resist the urge to shout that you're Pickle Rick, and let's get started. <laughs> So where else would we start other than Season 3, Episode 1, The Rick Shank Rick Demption? The title of Season 3, Episode 1, The Rick Shank Rick Demption is clearly a reference to The Shawshank Redemption, a novella written by Stephen King but better known as a film directed by Frank Darabont starring Tim Robbins as a, according to his character, falsely accused man who attempts to break out of prison. Spoiler alert, he succeeds. And so does Rick in the season premiere. If you remember, we left off with Rick in intergalactic prison at the end of Season 2 and this episode follows his daring and masterful breakout. Out. However, his mode of escape is far different from that of Tim Robbins. There's a little more body switching and a little less rock hammer digging. How could we leave out Mulan and McDonald's Szechuan sauce? As the episode makes apparent, Rick loves the Szechuan dipping sauce from the 1998 McDonald's promotion for the Disney movie Mulan. So much so that he, jokingly, question mark, names it as the real series arc if it takes nine seasons at the end of the episode. We first encounter the sauce at the start of the episode when a Grumflamite's creature named Cornvelius Daniel holds Rick captive in his own mind. He's trying to get the secret behind Rick's portal gun, but Rick makes the creature take him to a 1998 era McDonald's so that he can taste his beloved yet long expired sauce. Even the bug alien loves the dipping sauce, asking Rick at one point, you said this was promoting a movie? Luckily for a few real life Szechuan sauce fans, back in August, McDonald's brought back the uh, delicacy through a Twitter contest thanks to this popular Rick and Morty reference. 
Total Recall. As Rick and Cornvelius Daniel bop around in Rick's mind at the start of the episode, there's plenty of references to real and fake memories. Rick uses the latter to trick his alien captor, for instance, by showing him a false memory in which he learns how to make his portal gun and then watches his family disappear. The questionable balance between real and fabricated histories brings to mind the film Total Recall, in which Arnold Schwarzenegger's character Douglas Quaid goes on a journey that takes him between real and fake memories, confusing the audience's perception like Rick does in Rick and Morty before we catch on. Speaking of sci-fi, there's also The Matrix to talk about. A brief reference, but The Matrix comes to mind when we see where Rick and his bug alien foe are in reality during this whole mind invasion session. They're passed out and hooked up to machines that transport them into Rick's mind world, and the machines look a lot like those that hook Keanu Reeves into The Matrix. The Hunger Games. Another version of Summer is referred to as Hunger Games Summer, when the Morty and Summer that we're following escape to the Cronenberg universe, which has become more primitive and clearly lacking a Mockingjay. This title comes after the alternative family survived ruthlessly in the messed up world that C-137 Rick and Morty left them with. Gravity Falls. You're going to see a whole lot of Gravity Falls in Rick and Morty's third season. In this episode, at about 12 minutes and 33 seconds into the episode, when C-137 Morty and non-C-137 Summer are walking through the Citadel of Rick's, they pass by a pair of Mortys that look very familiar if you're a fan of Gravity Falls. In the background, on the left side of the screen, the two Mortys are wearing the same headband and hat that Mabel and Dipper Pines wear in every Gravity Falls episode. Next up, and premiering four months later, Season 3, Episode 2, Rick Mansing the Stone. Romancing the Stone. Again, Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon never miss out on a classic episode title reference. Here, Rick Mansing the Stone refers to Romancing the Stone, a 1984 movie about a romance novelist and an exotic bird smuggler, played by Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas respectively, who embark on a mission to retrieve a giant emerald. Similarly, Rick Mansing the Stone revolves around Rick getting his hands on a big green stone, which he reveals is made of the powerful isotope 322 and may, some theorists believe, power his portal gun. Also, speaking of romance, Hemorrhage is wearing a Big Johnson t-shirt at the end of the episode, a sexual innuendo character which led to much controversy in the heat of the 90s. The Mad Max franchise. The post-apocalyptic world Rick, Morty, and Summer travel to in this episode closely resembles the world of Mad Max, vehicles and weapons most certainly included. The monster dude that Summer kills about three minutes into the episode has a similar mouth face mask situation thing to Mad Max Fury Road's Immortan Joe, the movie's main bad guy. Names used in the Rick and Morty episode also mirror those from Mad Max Fury Road, just like when Rick refers to Morty as Spine Eater. There's a People Eater, played by John Howard, in Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome is referenced when the inhabitants of the Rick and Morty post-apocalyptic world have a fight dome that Rick immediately identifies as their Thunderdome. One of the world's inhabitants even replies, uh, y you mean the Blood Dome? Yeah, sure, just call it whatever you want, I guess. In in addition, Rick orchestrates the Blood Dome fight using Morty as a pawn to distract everyone while he attempts to get his hands on his precious Isotope 322. In Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, the character who rules the town where Mel Gibson as Max winds up uses Max as a pawn in a Thunderdome match that will serve to keep her in power and destroy her perceived threat. The threat is Master and the fight is to take place against his bodyguard, Blaster. Westworld. Rick makes highly realistic robot versions of his grandkids which he can control with his voice. He uses language very similar to that used by Arnold and other robot engineers slash technicians in Westworld, the TV show based on the 1973 film about a Wild West-themed amusement park populated by hyper-realistic robot hosts. Towards the end of the episode, when it's time for the robot versions of Morty, Summer, and now also Rick to go away since the human versions are returning, Robot Morty decides that he not only wants to be alive, but that he is alive. This essentially sums up the entire ethical debate posed by Westworld as the robots that populate the theme park start to gain consciousness. Cloud Atlas. The bucket-headed post apocalyptic character Summer eventually marries in this episode uses language that sounds a bit like the lingo from Cloud Atlas. He uses doubles of certain words like the boom boom to name the apocalyptic event and the before four time to talk about the time before it. In Cloud Atlas, the characters in one of the early time periods use phrases like the true true to mean the truth and the far far to mean very far. This may sound like a stretch, but Cloud Atlas is also referenced in season one when the Smith parents explore an alternate reality in which they hadn't had kids and gotten married. In it, Jerry is a famous actor who plays Tom Hanks's character character in Cloud Atlas, and uses the phrase, the true true. Game of Thrones. When a murdered man gains sentience in the form of one of Morty's arms, hereby dubbed Armathy, are you surprised? The arm's previous owner goes on a quest to seek revenge on the man who caused his and his family's deaths. When Morty finally finds him, he's a skinny blonde man with a bad haircut who's being bathed by two servants in a wood tub surrounded by candles. Vaguely resembling scenes of Daenerys's now long gone skinny blonde brother getting bathed, this Rick and Morty scene is mostly just full of game 
Game of Thrones imagery and language. For example, the man in the tub threatens one of his washers by saying he will expel him to the wasteland. There is a wasteland, the Red Waste, in Game of Thrones, and that sounds like a very Game of Thrones threat. This could also be a reference to the Wizards of the Lost Kingdom, a bit that's part of Mystery Science Theater 3000 The Return, which Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland both have writing credits for. Season 3, Episode 3, Pickle Rick. Iron Man. When Pickle Rick attaches rat parts to himself to create the destruction machine he becomes, do you hear that music in the background? Yeah, it sounds a lot like the music that plays in Iron Man when Robert Downey Jr. becomes Iron Man. The close-ups of Rick getting rat bones screwed into his pickle body also mimic the way Iron Man's armor slowly and dramatically clicks into gear. Die Hard. Once Pickle Rick escapes from the sewer, he naturally finds himself in a whole new world of trouble, this time in a building occupied by Russian bad guys, and they try to destroy Pickle Rick. In the film Die Hard, the bad guys are German, not Russian, but their leader, played by the late Alan Rickman, closely resembles the leader of the Russians in Pickle Rick's episode. The outfit of Rick's nemesis looks like Rickman's in Die Hard, and his tone and voice even sound similar. John Wick. It's a given that most of Rick's storyline is partly based on the John Wick films, a series following an ex-hitman coming out of retirement and swearing revenge on the gangster world. All crazy violence aside, Rick's nickname, Solenya, is most likely a reference to John Wick's nickname, Baba Yaga. Also, as a side note, the scene in which Rick slaughters all of the rats is a parody of 2009's The Wolverine, which was a film that inspired, you guessed it, John Wick. The Annoying Orange. When Rick calls for Morty in the beginning of the episode, it's a nod to the hit 2009 web series, The Annoying Orange. The reference is further established given that Rick is a sentient vegetable, which is one step up from being a responsive fruit. Elvis Presley. Rick thinking of his utterly humiliating fate dying in the body of a pickle actually takes a jab at a certain other genius who died on the toilet. You guessed it, this is a reference to the infamous rumors of Elvis Presley's untimely death upon the common man's throne. By the way, he didn't actually die on the toilet. He died on the floor several feet away from the toilet, okay? Glad we could clear that up. Season 3, Episode 4, Vindicators 3, The Return of World Ender. The Avengers. Let's just get the obvious one aside. The Vindicators are an obvious homage to superhero teams from both Marvel and DC Comics, from the Avengers to the Justice League. The nail is driven through the head when Morty refers to the Vindicators as the Guardians of the Unguarded, which is actually also a playoff to another Marvel superhero team of a similar name. Also, the logo of the Vindicators closely resembles an upside-down Avengers symbol. Coincidence? Probably not. Saw. Rick's tricks are actually a whole reference to the Saw movie series, where individuals are forced to play dangerous games under a strict time limit by someone behind the screen, most often the killer Jigsaw himself. Morty even calls Rick out on this because really, Rick is a little more derivative than he would have you believe sometimes. Escape from LA. The three-point shot skit references Escape from LA, where in one scene, Snake, the main protagonist, is similarly forced into scoring points in basketball within a limited amount of time, so it's horror meets Kurt Russell meets nostalgic adult humor compiled in an animated alcoholic. That's just Rick and Morty in a nutshell. I don't think that needs additional explaining, do you? Season 3, Episode 5, The Whirly Durly Conspiracy. The Fly, The Big Chill, mostly Jeff Goldblum references. While Rick and Jerry sit at the bar in a resort with an immortality field built around it, Jerry points out a being that looks a lot like Jeff Goldblum's face. He and Rick even laugh together about it, a rare bonding moment for the pair. Rick then pokes fun at this Goldblum resembling creature by saying, what's up Big Chill, don't go into that telepod! While Jeff Goldblum did star in the 1983 film The Big Chill, the second part of that remark references the 1986 movie that Goldblum starred in, The Fly, a remake in which a scientist accidentally transforms himself into a fly. Goldblum is said scientist and he becomes a fly by accidentally entering a telepod that he created with a fly. The aim is to teleport himself from one telepod to another, but in doing so with a stowaway fly, Goldblum's character rearranges his molecular structure to merge with the flies. And now, hopefully, Rick's joke makes a lot more sense. Also, that movie is super weird. Alice in Wonderland. When Summer uses Rick's Morphizer XE, which acts as a grow ray, she ends up enlarging her whole body. Morty opens the door to the garage and he only sees her giant mouth and nose poking out. Summers come to fill the entire garage, like Alice does in Alice in Wonderland when she drinks the Grow Me drink inside a little house. The way Alice pokes out of the windows and doors is clearly alluded to in Summers' garage growth scene. Speed. When the locals begin to attack Rick on the Whirly Dirly ride, they fight to the potential death on a moving vehicle. This is similar to the ending scene of Speed, the 1994 film with Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves, where at the end, Reeves' character, Jack, defeats the enemy by decapitating him on top of the subway car. In this Rick and Morty episode, Rick and his nemesis take turns beheading each other on a moving vehicle, but while in the immortality zone, so their heads just grow back. Home Improvement. Anyone remember Home Improvement, that 90s TV sitcom starring Tim 
Tim Allen as Tim the Toolman Taylor. He made a lot of weird noises. Well, in the show, Tim's neighbor is Wilson W. Wilson, a man who always wears a tan bucket hat and is only seen peeking over the fence that separates his yard from the Taylors. In the Whirly Dirly conspiracy, Morty speaks to a neighbor, Gene, who appears while he and Beth are figuring out how to deal with the summer issue. Gene pops up only briefly over the fence between his yard and the Smith's driveway, and he's wearing a distinct tan bucket hat. Attack on Titan. Inside out and enlarged by the end of the episode, Summer and Beth both bear a resemblance to the Colossal Titan in the manga series Attack on Titan. Like the Colossal Titan, who stands at about 200 feet tall, Summer and Beth tower above pine trees. And of course, there's the inside out part. The Colossal Titan wears his muscles and tendons on the outside, a look that Summer and Beth acquire after playing with Grandpa Rick's Morphizer XE. Now that Rick and Morty Season 3's come to a close, we here at Frederator thought it would be a great time to look back at all of the wonderful references that the show has brought us. What's up everybody, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're bringing you Rick and Morty Season 3 references for Episodes 6 through 10. Expect the first half of the season a little later. Sit yourself down, because we're about to show you some mind blowers. Let's get started. <laughs> Today we'll start with Season 3, Episode 6, Rest and Ricklaxation. And the reference we'll start with is Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, and Episode 6, Return of the Jedi. Rick and Morty's flash adventure at the start of Rest and Ricklaxation definitely alludes to the plot of Star Wars, specifically Episode 6, Return of the Jedi, and Episode 4, A New Hope. In the former, rebel ships destroy the main reactor of the Death Star, and the scene looks a lot like what's happening when Rick and Morty destroy the giant ship in the episode's beginning sequence, complete with their swift getaway from danger and the accompanying heroic music. A New Hope ends with a ceremony in which Princess Leia gives Han Solo and Luke Skywalker medals for completing their mission, and for some unknown reason, Chewie just doesn't get one. But the speedy Rick and Morty adventure sequence ends with a similar ceremony where they're given similar looking medals. The Wolf of Wall Street. When Morty leaves his toxins behind at a spa that he and Rick go to, healthy Morty emerges, and he's a whole different beast. D did I say beast? I meant wolf, specifically. Morty's toxins are basically the self-hating, fearful parts of his psyche, so what remains is an overly self-confident, never-shuts-up version of Morty, the kind of man who would kill on Wall Street, which healthy Morty eventually does. As a broker, Morty talks, acts, and even dresses like Leonardo DiCaprio's Jordan Belfort in The Wolf of Wall Street, complete with the character's blue pinstripe suit. Gravity Falls. When the toxic versions of Rick and Morty, or let's be honest, mostly Rick, flip the switch to make the whole world toxic, a transformation overcomes the globe that is reminiscent of what happens in the Gravity Falls episode Weird Mageddon, in which Bill Cypher, the Demon Pyramid, and the show's ultimate bad guy unleashes pure madness on Gravity Falls. Viewers watch in horror as this perverse world overcomes the benign version we're used to, just as the episode of Rick and Morty when we get to see the impact of the toxins as they take over location by location. From a church that immediately falls into sin to a salad works whose patrons immediately flock to the neighboring Sparrows. Shots fired, your move Sparrows. Further cementing this reference, 8-Ball, the first monster to emerge from Bill's evil dimension can be seen in the toxic world of Rick and Morty. Well, a very melty version of him shows up about four and a half minutes into the episode, but his signature eight ball eyes are clearly visible. Season three, episode seven, the Rick Lantis mix-up. Oh boy, we're doing this. Presidential candidates. At the beginning of the Rick Lantis mix-up, the two Rick news anchors announce the candidates for the Citadel of Rick's first democratic election. They include retired General Rick, likely a stand-in for John McCain, private sector Rick, Mitt Romney with his swished back hair, Juggling Rick, Hillary Clinton, whose juggling act in politics is often mentioned in the media, and Reverse Rick Outrage, who has some serious Bernie vibes. And let's not forget Rick Guilt Rick, who is a reference to James McMillan, the political activist known for founding the Rent is Too Damn High party. And when a Morty starts looking like he's going to win this election against a bunch of Ricks, we get a little reminder of what it was like when Donald Trump suddenly pulled ahead in the polls on November 8th of 2016. Some say Evil Morty is a representation of Donald Trump, but nothing has been confirmed. Training day. When a cop Rick is assigned a new partner, he's surprised to see that it's a Morty, especially because their patrol takes place mostly in Morty Town, the crime-ridden part of town in the Citadel. This mirrors the racial relationship in Training Day, where a cop played by Ethan Hawke is sent to train under a narcotics officer played by Denzel Washington. In one Rick Lantis adventure scene, when Cop Morty drives Cop Rick through Morty Town, it looks like the scene where Denzel's character, Alonzo, takes Ethan's character, Jake, through the hood for the first time. Cop Morty gets out of the car to talk to the other Mortys in their Morty 
dialogue. A lot of, ah, oh, Jesus. Ah, oh, jeez. 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 Oh, Just like how Alonzo gets out of the car in training day and speaks casually to other people of color in the neighborhood, while Jake, the white cop, stands awkwardly by. Harry Potter. One of the plot lines in this unusual and incredibly dark episode starts out at a school that will remind all Harry Potter fans of Hogwarts. The teacher, a Rick, looks quite a bit like Severus Snape. I mean, the haircut kind of gives him away. And the classroom environment feels very much like the Wizarding World, complete with the students' cheeky quips. The students' uniforms even look a little bit Gryffindorian with their red and gold color scheme. And it's also worth mentioning that this plot line turns into a sort of Harry Potter subplot and then turns into its own Stand By Me subplot. Harmontown. During the moment where the Mortys get to the wishing portal, Glasses Morty wishes for incest porn to be more mainstream, which is a reference to episode 179 of Harmontown, Dan Harmon's podcast. In the episode, Dan goes on a rant about incest porn and why he likes it, which is similar to what Glasses Morty wishes for. Season 3, episode 8, Morty's Mind Blowers. MC Escher. The beginning of the episode takes place in ruins that seem to take influence from works by Dutch printmaker MC Escher, like the famous Relativity and Ascending and Descending, which depicts the famous optical illusion of the Penrose Stairs. These pieces have been recreated time and time again, from Jim Henson's 1986 film Labyrinth to Christopher Nolan's Inception. No surprise that Rick and Morty took its own spin on the famous artwork. The Sandman. While running through the temple, Rick and Morty are chased by a rather familiar figure from the comic book universe who's best identified as Dream of the Endless, or Morpheus, the protagonist of the Sandman from Vertigo Comics. This guy takes on appearances based on whoever's looking at him and is a personification of all dreams and stories in existence, which goes pretty well with the premise of Morty's mind blowers. Weird that he's only around in the first scene of the episode. Contact. The space plot in which Rick comes up with an escape plan is a reference to the 1997 film Contact starring Jodie Foster. It's a movie that follows Dr. Ellie Arroway after she finds conclusive radio proof of extraterrestrial intelligence sending plans for an unknown machine. Luckily for Rick, this meta plot works seamlessly well and Rick and Morty are able to escape from Morty's menagerie. Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Did you seriously think we weren't gonna round out the original trilogy in this video? Well, for anyone who has ever tried a bit of sci-fi at least once in their entire lives, they would know that the death of Bebo is a reference to the death of Hans Tauntaun in The Empire Strikes Back. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. It's further established by Rick's assertion that Bebo's sacrifice would protect them from the extreme cold conditions of Venzenulon 7, which is not Venzenulon 9. In Star Wars, the planet Hoth is commonly known for reaching temperatures of minus 60 degrees Celsius at night, and the fact that I know that has to be a testament to my singlehood. Anyway, Ghostbusters! In one of Morty's extremely brief memories, Rick is seen holding a proton pack while a ghost Morty who looks a lot like Slimer hides in fear, quite ironic given the situation. This is, of course, a quick nod to the pop culture franchise, Ghostbusters. Season 3, Episode 9, The ABCs of Beth. Video games. If you're a Final Fantasy fan, you may have noticed that Kiara's phasing power seems a bit familiar. It mimics the phasing ability used by Noctis in Final Fantasy XV. Just like Noctis can phase through solid matter, Kiara does the same, teleporting through objects without being harmed. The episode also gives a shout out to Nintendo, when the alien portraying young Beth in Tommy's place says that she's jealous of his Nintendo. Hey, I would be too. I'd also be jealous of that ray gun that Beth wants Rick to make because it's similar looking to the one in Call of Duty's zombie mode. Though let's be real, the actual star of the show was the sentient stabbing knife. It's not a reference to anything, it's just hilarious. Hi Beth, you've gotten taller. Shall we resume stabbing? Sexy Aliens. Kiara is pretty much a parody of all the sexy alien characters seen throughout sci-fi properties. For example, she shares some similarities with Ayla Secura from Star Wars, both having long heads, blue skin, and brown clothes, and they also both have the power of telekinesis. Another creature that Kiara resembles is the Navi from Avatar. They both have a feline face and blue skin, not to mention they talk about soul bonding. In addition, when talking about Kiara's body, Jerry compares it to Chitara from Thundercats. Some fans also believe that Kiara is possibly a reference to Liara from the game Mass Effect since they both have bluish skin, a similar shaped head, and a tattoo on her face, which other Asari in the series are known to have. And I'm not sure if you noticed this, but uh, Kiara has three breasts, which resembles the three boobed mutant in the film Total Recall, cause why not? Technology. The big internet related reference in this episode is Reddit, but it's also mixed with a Star Wars reference. Rick mentions a father who created a toilet that resembles R2-D2 for his kids and how it got him on the front page of Reddit, and he 
compares that to how he treated Beth. Though this isn't a confirmed real post, we definitely all know how Reddit can do that. Though if I were you, I would prepare to see a lot more R2-D2 toilets popping up on Reddit in the near future. Other quick tech shoutouts are when Rick is ranting to Beth and mentions an iPad, when Summer talks about Jerry's weird Facebook rants, and when Rick calls Tommy's play Certified Fresh, which is a reference to the review website Rotten Tomatoes, where films are either labeled rotten or fresh. Fresh meaning that most critics would recommend it. ABCs. Now that's a bit of a weird title, but that's because there are actually a few different ABC-related references in this episode. One references the 2012 film, The ABCs of Death, and that would be for the pun intended episode title, The ABCs of Beth. The other is when Beth mentions the TV network ABC and their widely popular show, The Bachelor. She names this show when she's listing the things that matter to her. I mean, I know she says she watches it ironically, but uh, she might want to reassess her TV priorities. This could also be a reference to claymation animator Lee Hardcastle's involvement in both The ABCs of Death and those terrifying Rick and Morty non-canonical adventures. Game of Thrones. The scenes with Tommy are a reference to some scenes from Game of Thrones. The play that the aliens put on resembles a play from season 6 of Game of Thrones that Arya watches. The Game of Thrones play basically recaps the first few seasons of the show, including the betrayal of Ned Stark, and we see characters from those storylines. Tommy's play does a similar thing, retelling his and Beth's history the way he sees it and how she betrayed him. Tommy also commits incest and cannibalism, which is another throw to Game of Thrones as their storylines include those themes as well. I mean, a lot of shows include parts of those things, but very few shows have both of them in one show. But we can add Rick and Morty to that list now. Season 3, Episode 10, The Rick Churian Mortied It. The Manchurian Candidate. The episode title is a pun on The Manchurian Candidate, a 1959 novel adapted to film twice in 1962 and 2004 that follows a sleeper assassin in an international communist conspiracy. It pretty much foreshadows how this whole season has been some mega conspiracy on us all. Oh, also, President Keith David is back, so that's pretty awesome. Channel 1 the president tells Rick and Morty about some alien Guga, which is a throwback to a video Dan and Justin made back in 2008 for Harmon's site, Channel 101. Their video was simply called Gugas and featured Dan, Justin, and their friends Kelsey and Mike fighting off ghoulies slash elf slash critters slash gremlin type creatures. Minecraft. The popular sandbox game got a whole Rick and Morty intro and there was no beating around the blocky bush to get this reference across. So you're mining stuff to craft with and crafting stuff to mine with? Uh-huh. Did your dad write this game? Mean. This is also partially a reference to Dan Harmon's own obsession with the game. South Park. When Rick and Morty are interrupted in the middle of their Minecraft adventure, Rick says South Park did it four years ago. He's referring to the South Park episode Informative Murder Porn, when Stan's parents discover the parental lock that prevents them from watching murder porn. Naturally, they're unable to answer the security question, how do you tame a horse in Minecraft? If we go beyond this quick summary, this video is gonna spiral out of control and the rest of our references will just be left to rot. So after we marvel at the fact that, just as Rick said, informative murder porn premiered almost four years ago exactly to the day before the Rick and Morty season 3 finale, we're just gonna move on. But of course, like The Simpsons, Rick and Morty are late to the tired video game hype. Admitting your faults is the first step to recovery. X-Files. Morty describing the alien of the week that the president tasks the duo with attacking in the Kennedy sex tunnels is a reference to the sci-fi hit television series The X-Files. With this quick pop culture jab, we can assume that Morty makes the perfect Mulder and Rick is the refined Dana Scully, or the other way around, either one works, really. But the more we think about it, the more we think that we want an episode based on that premise, but th that will probably never happen. Not gonna stop us from wanting it, though. Ghostbusters. Again. When Rick and Morty are both tired of being treated like Ghostbusters and everyone questions whether or not the Ghostbusters are still a respected organization, could be a reference to the reception of the 2016 Ghostbusters reboot. This was a rare instance in which no one from the original film saw a point in bringing back the franchise, and as we all remember, much internet rage followed. Much like how a lot of rage followed in this episode. Three is great, but how about four? That's a bigger number, we like those, right? And we also like Rick and Morty season four, which is why Channel Frederator treated everyone to 107 Rick and Morty season four facts that you should know. This one came at a weird time, February 2020. Take that as you will. Season 4 of Rick and Morty is finally here. Well, I mean, half of it is at the time of this recording. It's been a while since we've joined Rick and Morty on their adventures, so to get you caught up, we're giving you the closest thing we can manage to interdimensional cable, look, with 107 facts about Rick and Morty Season 4. Now I'm hooked. Number 1. 
The season's not even over yet, but you can expect a lot more of that Richard and Mortimer down the line. Dan Harmon left his own production company, Starburns Industries, just to focus all of his efforts on Rick and Morty for the next few years. Number two. If you can believe it, Adult Swim didn't immediately renew the series when they could. It's all because of heated contract negotiations between the showrunners, Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, and Adult Swim's parent company, Turner Broadcasting. Ha! Idiots. Number three. See, Roiland and Harmon wanted immortality, which is a pretty rad term, but at the same time, not nearly as cool as it sounds in this context. Basically, they wanted a guarantee that they'd have enough seasons and enough funds to give Rick and Morty their full attention. Neither wanted to feel pressured to take side jobs. Number four. Both Harmon and Roiland want to throw themselves at Rick and Morty because they obviously love making the show. Harmon describes it as an infinite sandbox, the perfect show. Number five. The first episode of season three famously premiered completely unannounced on April Fool's Day 2017. That was already three years ago. In 2018, Adult Swim followed up with Bush World Adventures, a very, very strange 10 minute short inspired by the show that was written and directed by prominent YouTube animator Michael Cusack. Number six. Roiland was a fan of Cusack's works, like the shorts YOLO and the Demo and Darren series, and reached out to him personally about the short. He told them that he could do whatever he wanted. Number seven. Shortly after that, we got the news that everybody wanted. On May 10th of 2018, Rick and Morty was renewed for a staggering seven episodes. For a show that's only had 31 episodes so far, that's unreal. That's basically an eternity in TV time. And based on Rick and Morty's release schedule, that, uh, that actually could be enough episodes to take us to the heat death of the universe. Number eight. Finally, in May of 2019, Rick and Morty themselves surprised everyone with an announcement that season four was legitimately coming in November of that year. Number nine. When it comes to writing, it just so happens that Roiland and Harmon are excellent counterbalances for one another. Roiland describes himself as a free associating idea man, if you can believe that, while Harmon is a notorious perfectionist. Number 10. Dan Harmon writes according to what he calls a story circle, which is essentially a simplified version of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. In Harmon's circle, the character starts in a zone of comfort, but then wants something and enters an unfamiliar situation, which they adapt to. They get what they wanted, but they pay a heavy price for it. Then they return to their initial situation, having changed. Number 11. Harmon also tends to start the path over and over again, meaning he'll attack the first scene until he finds it perfect. Number 12. However, Harmon said that by the end of season three, he could finally objectively measure the amount of early perfectionism that actually makes it into the final cut. Turns out it's uh, way less than he initially thought. Number 13. Roiland admits that the show takes so long to make because everyone on board is compelled to fix anything that might be lagging in an episode. Even when an episode comes back in good shape, the crew will still cut and add things to elevate the episode. Number 14. With all that perfectionism, it's no surprise that the Rick and Morty crew isn't blinded by hubris. They can tell perfectly well when a certain episode is the weakest point of a season, and they do everything they can to help it along. Number 15. While there's certainly a lot of difference between the two, there's a lot of Harmon in Rick's character. Around season two, Roiland even started accidentally calling him Rick. Though knowing Justin Roiland, which I don't, I doubt he was doing it by accident. Number 16. Harmon breaks down the message of Rick and Morty as, you're gonna be tempted to believe that being human is important and that is going to cause you to suffer. Uplifting, just as we expected. Number 17. Roiland's favorite aspect of the show is exploring all the different planets that Rick and Morty travel to and making unique crazy aliens for each one. He and Harmon joke that once they run out of planet names, the show is gonna end. Number 18. While the idea of revisiting planets and certain characters isn't banned, the Rick and Morty team prefers to invent new places and keep pushing forward. They worry that bringing back old favorites would just come across as disingenuous fan service. Number 19. Naturally, Rick and Morty's relationship is starting to evolve, or maybe devolve is more fitting. Harmon and Roiland acknowledge that season four is the point where Morty starts pushing back a little more and becomes more disobedient because he's seen all these sides of Rick. Number 20. With a 70 episode order to fill, don't expect this ramp up to continue to the extreme. Harmon says this won't be a linear thing where Morty kills Rick in his sleep and ends the show or anything like that. Number 21. In fact, Harmon and Roiland view the show as Simpsons-esque, meaning they don't plan on having the characters really age. Number 22. You can still look forward to some serialized content in the show, though. Harmon characterized season four as having serialized stuff we check in on now and then that's sprinkled over the top of strong episodic episodes. That seems true for the series as a whole as well. Number 23. Still, the pair certainly doesn't expect to run out of steam. Harmon comments that they've always written Rick and Morty as if there would be a thousand episodes. Number 24. Fans were initially a little disappointed, as they tend to be, but season four was revealed to have just 10 episodes. Harmon and Royal and the show continuing with the previously established 10 episode season format. Number 25, Rick and Morty merchandising started getting out of control after the show exploded following season three. Roiland and Harmon were even approached about
about a Rick and Morty perfume, which was never actually made, thank God. I can only imagine what that would have smelled like. Belches? Space? A plumbus? Number 26. In December of 2019, Pringles announced that they would be releasing Pickle Rick flavored chips. Not pickle flavored, Pickle Rick flavored. Think about that for a second. Number 27. Also in November of 2019, Adult Swim teamed up with car rental group Apturo to bring you the Morty Mobile, an actual car you can actually rent as it tours around the country that has a giant screaming Morty on top of it. Okay? Number 28. If you decide to shell out the cash for the Morty Mobile, the proceeds go to a charity advancing women in technical fields. Okay, it's less weird now that I know that it's going to a good cause. Number 29. In the very first scene of season four, the writers wanted to be sure to demonstrate that the power dynamic of the Smith family had shifted, namely that Beth was now the head of the household, which of course puts a sudden limiter on Rick. Number 30. If Edge of Tomorty, Rick Die, Rick Pete made you doubt it, Harmon affirms that Rick can in fact die, just not by conventional means. Like vampire and werewolves, there are methods one could use to kill Rick, but of course, that's a secret Harmon's keeping close to the chest. Number 31. Morty's plotline in the episode was written to be a metaphor for a rather deep existential dilemma. If you're playing it safe your entire life, are you ever actually living? But in a true, seemingly paradoxical Rick and Morty fashion, that's what causes him to mess around with crazy sci-fi weapons in Rick's garage. Number 32. Morty's subplot eventually becomes an Akira-type situation, and a news ticker even refers to him as Akira Boy. Both are referencing Kazuhiro Otomo's classic 1988 anime masterpiece, Akira. Number 33. The Akira references go way deeper than just a few name drops, though. Both Morty and Akira central troubled teen Tetsuo, or TETSUO, if you'd like, develop crazy powers that they use to overwhelm the military. And yes, to those unfamiliar, that means that just like with Link and Zelda, the name of the character Mori's mirroring is not in fact named Akira. It's, it's a common mistake, Jerry. Number 34. Plus that end scene where Morty morphs into that horrifying tree thing is definitely a nod to Akira's notable climax. Number 35. However, the title of the episode actually comes from the 2014 sci-fi film Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, which was in turn based on the light novel All You Need Is Kill by Hiro Sakurazaka. Number 36. Of course, Rick and Morty is also famous for having ridiculous guest star cameos. In Edge of Tomorrow, Rick Die, Rick Peat, comedian actress Sherry Shepard played the judge that Morty wins over with his talk of Peru. You might recognize Shepard from 30 Rock, How I Met Your Mother, or maybe you just like the penguin in The Masked Singer. Number 37. Shepard actually double dipped for the season. She also made a cameo as Tony's wife in episode two, The Old Man in the Seat, which yes, means she's the one saying, come poop with me. Number 38. Tony the Toilet Stealer was played by Jeffrey Wright, who you may best recognize as Bernard from HBO's Westworld. Number 39. The entire plot of that episode came from further wanting to explore Rick's isolation, starting with a phenomenon that isn't all that uncommon, being a shy pooper. Number 40. The team all thinks of Tony as a genuinely good person. His attempt to reach out to Rick in friendship and Rick's rejection were crafted to turn the story into one about Rick's capacity for friendship. Number 41. Come to think of it, that was a super celebrity-packed episode. There was also Rick's intern, Gloody, who was played by Taika Waititi, the Oscar-winning writer, director, actor known for films like What We Do in the Shadows, Thor Ragnarok, and Jojo Rabbit. Number 42. Gloody's boss, the Monogatron leader, is played by Sam Neill, who played Dr. Alan Grant in Jurassic Park. A bit of a shame they didn't get him for Anatomy Park, but better late than never. Number 43. The Monogatron Queen is played by Kathleen Turner. She's taken the lead in classics like Romancing the Stone, but she's also the semi-uncredited voice of Jessica Rabbit. Number 44. In one crew over the Koo Crew's Morty, Rick's disdain for the heist genre is on full display. That's one of Rick's qualities that is 100% based on Dan Harmon. In fact, Harmon encouraged Royland to watch some heist movies just to point out how ridiculous they were, and Royland ended up totally agreeing. Number 45. However, However, you may be relieved to know that the episode's writer, Katie Delany, actually does enjoy heist movies, so it wasn't entirely bred of cynicism. Number 46. And yes, that was actually Elon Musk providing the voice for his tusked cartoon counterpart, Elon Tusk. Number 47. Elon Musk has long been a huge fan of the show. He even engaged with the Rick and Morty Twitter account after the season three finale to compliment the episode and talk about singularities. Harmon quickly added that Musk was welcome on the show anytime. Number 48. Musk changed his Twitter name to Elon Tusk back in February of 2020. 2019. Considering his episode didn't premiere until November, you'd think that we would be confused by Elon Musk's Twitter decisions, but he's made far weirder Twitter posts, so this actually seemed kind of normal for him. Number 49. Everything's chummy with Elon Tusk, but Rick and Morty have a famously bizarre relationship with Kanye West. It all started in May 2018 when Kanye tweeted that Rick and Morty was his favorite show and he'd seen every episode at least five times. Number 50. Things escalated when in June of 2018, Royland recruited his friends Chaos Chaos to record a very, very
very strange and wonderful birthday song for Kanye featuring Rick doing things to Kanye in his sleep. Number 51. The ultimate unexpected turn came when Harmon and Roiland not just offered Kanye a guest appearance, but his own episode. Nothing's come of the offer yet due to scheduling, but both parties are serious about collaborating. Number 52. Daniel Radcliffe also has an open invitation to come on the show, do a voice, and just hang out in the writer's room. Apparently he's also a huge fan. Whatever. Anyway, back to people who have actually appeared on the show. Number 53. The talking cat from Claw and Hoarder Special Rictims Unit was voiced by Matthew Broderick. Broderick finally returns to felines after voicing Simba in the OG Lion King. A adult Simba, not not child Simba, but he's been in a ton of stuff. Ferris Bueller, the producers, you know. Number 54. According to Harmon, the cat represents the voice in the writer's room who says, you're overthinking it, just have fun. They took a cue from Disney films like Oliver and Company where no one ever bothers to explain why the animals can talk. Number 55. Obviously, Morty's dragon, Balthrama, had to be voiced by somebody from Game of Thrones, so they got Liam Cunningham, better known as Sir Davos Seaworth. Number 56. There will be more celebrity guests in the second half of season four, but we'll just have to guess about who they are. The first half of season four finished just before the holidays, promising that the rest would return in 2020. Nice and precise return date, as usual. Number 57. We do know that somewhere in these next five episodes, we finally get Paul Giamatti. That's all we got. Number 58. Anthony Chun, the director of Claw and Horror, points out that eroticism, in a way, is the path to defeat the patriarch, at least in the episode. But also, maybe not just in the episode, in their view. Number 59. We mentioned earlier that the Rick and Morty crew can spot the worst episode, which means they also have their favorites. Rattlestar Rick Lactica was Royland's favorite, at least of the first five of season four. Number 60. Royland and Harmon have said multiple times that despite Rick having a box labeled time travel stuff, they wouldn't do a time travel episode. Obviously, they caved for Rattlestar Rick Lactica, but... But, like... Did they? Number 61. Actually, the idea behind the episode had been around since season three, but they had trouble cracking the episode back then, but it was always going to start with getting a flat tire in space and a snake in an astronaut suit. Number 62. The team was able to flesh the premise out into a full episode once they gave it a time travel Terminator twist. They figured that diving into a society of snakes was also pretty dumb, so why not also give it the dumbest possible plot device? time travel. Number 63. As Morty's dying of snake venom, Rick jokes that he looks like a 90s Japanese ghost. That's a callback to horror films like The Ring, the original one, Ringu, or The Grudge, the original one, Juan, which came out in 1998 and 2002 respectively, but whatever. Morty's not quite that pale, but we understood that reference. Number 64. In 1985, in Snake World, there's a poster for the snake version of Back to the Future. Not only is that a fun reference to make during a time travel episode, but if you recall, Rick and Morty began life as Doc and Marty, a spoof on Back to the Future. Number 65. Although the episode was largely filled with hissing snakes, Keegan-Michael Key returned on Rattlestar Rick Lactica to reprise his role as the time cop Schleamy Pants. Number 66. Perhaps not surprisingly, the voice actors of the show don't record together, it's just one at a time. And usually, Royland and the writer of the episode will be present to direct. Royland is also obviously there when he's recording his own lines. Number 67. When voicing Summer, Spencer Grammer based her character off a particularly badass accomplished friend of hers. Summer's a not yet successful teenager, so Grammar imagined her friend was nerdy and was still trying to find herself as a woman. Number 68. Grammar says that Summer's character in a script will change a little bit after a Dan Harmon pass. Namely, she'll get more intention behind what she does. Number 69. The 2019 Adult Swim Festival featured an exclusive advanced screening of the season 4 premiere, which at the time was a pretty big deal. It was obviously highly anticipated. Number 70. Meanwhile, Royland has a ton of things happening outside of Rick and Morty. He's teaming up with the executive producers of Robot Chicken for a short form claymation show called Gloop World, which will be available on the streaming service Quibi. Number 71. Gloop World isn't some spur of the moment idea either. It's a show that Royland has been trying to make for seven years. He describes it as a tactile clay animation show with a mysterious, weird, and expansive world and really fun characters, fingerprints and all. Number 72. Additionally, Royland and Rick and Morty writer producer Mike McMahon have a two season contract with Hulu for a comedy about an alien family moving to Earth called Solar Opposites. The first season will premiere on May 8th of this year by the latest reports. Number 73. By the way, McMahon is also working on helming an animated Star Trek series for CBS All Access called Star Trek Lower Decks. It's a perfect fit for him. McMahon's cat is named after the Star Trek character Riker, and his son is named Sagan after Carl Sagan, of course. Number 74. Royland and his video game company, Squanch Games, have also made use of the time between seasons. On February 6th of 2018, they released Accounting, a virtual reality game about uh, being an accountant and nothing else. Nope, nope. 
additional content or deep rabbit holes or Easter eggs to dive down here whatsoever. Number 75. Only five months after the release of Accounting, Squanch Games released yet another VR game, Dr. Splorchy Presents Space Heroes. It's a simpler mobile experience that went on sale for just $5. Number 76. Squanch Games returned to high-end VR in 2019 with their biggest release yet, the full-length game Trover Saves the Universe. The game has been described as an extended Rick and Morty episode with new characters, so if you're watching this video, you'll probably like it. Number 77. Unlike the other games, Trover Saves the Universe is additionally available in a non-VR format. You can even get it for the Nintendo Switch. Number 78. Harmon and Royland have assured fans that long waits are a thing of the past. In other words, the gap between seasons 3 and 4 will be the longest gap between Rick and Morty seasons ever. I say incredibly skeptically. Number 79. Unfortunately, a number of fans didn't take to that wait so well. Both Royland and Harmon, especially Harmon, were harassed on Twitter by impatient, angry fans. To, like, an extremely not okay extent. Number 80. The fan base for Rick and Morty grew significantly during season 3. By the end of it, Rick and Morty was the most popular TV comedy among millennials, period. Number 81. But before the renewal, fans got the spotlight in news stories across the country. On October 7th of 2020, 2017, McDonald's did a special one-day release of the Szechuan sauce Rick famously pined for in the season 3 premiere. Number 82. It was a fun idea, but the release didn't go as planned. McDonald's dramatically underestimated the demand for the Szechuan sauce, and locations quickly ran out. Or never got any at all, cries in Canada. Number 83. The result was chaos and anger. At one McDonald's, a thousand fans camped out for what turned out to be 70 sauces. The crowd began angrily chanting, we want sauce. In another location, a guy stood on the counter and screamed at the fry cooks. I'm sure you've seen the video by now. There were basically riots. Number 84. Some people were able to make a quick buck off the whole situation, though. The next day, packets of Szechuan sauce appeared on eBay, running between 60 and a thousand bucks. Number 85. One leftover packet of Szechuan sauce from 1998 was being bid on for upwards of $99,000 in early 2017. Number 86. Anyway, the response was so intense that McDonald's promised to release the sauce again and for a longer time the following winter. They had 20 million packets in tow the next time, so no riots, and there was much rejoicing. Number 87. The vocal part of the fan base took up a new cause after the Szechuan sauce debacle, harassing season 3's two new female writers online and blaming them for what they felt was a decline in Rick and Morty's quality. And yet, uh, Jessica Gao wrote Pickle Rick, so... Number 88. Harmon and Royland both, of course, denounced this kind of behavior. Harmon was additionally concerned that once the title of your show becomes a way of describing a demographic, that is toxic. But to be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand Rick and Morty, as has been mentioned in the comments of the many Rick and Morty cartoon conspiracies we've done. Number 89. In fact, the fascist Morty who demands at gunpoint that he and Rick go on classic adventures free of politics in the season 4 premiere is in all likelihood a not-so-subtle dig to this contingent of Rick and Morty's fan base. Number 90. Thankfully, Rick and Morty has more going for it than just fan drama. Notably, the show released a soundtrack through Sub Pop Records on September 28th, 2018. Number 91. In addition to classics by the show's composer, Ryan Elder, the soundtrack includes songs from the show by Chaos Chaos, Blonde Redhead, Mazzy Star, and more. There are also new songs by Clipping and Chad Van Galen. Number 92. Mega fans can also buy a deluxe vinyl set, which includes a fancy green colored vinyl, as well as a poster, patch, sticker, bonus single, and cassette. All you're missing is like an 8-track to round out the obsolete media cornucopia. Number 93. One of the most infamous songs on the soundtrack is the Royal and Chaos Chaos collaboration Terry Folds. When it was initially released in September of 2017, it charted on the Billboard Top Rock Songs at number 33. Number 94. Getting on Rick and Morty also caused a huge spike for blonde redheads for the damaged coda. You might know it better as that Evil Morty song. In fact, when the song re-emerged in the show during season 3, it reached number 15 on Billboard's rock chart 17 years after it was initially released, and I've listened to it on Spotify no less than 4,000 times. Number 95. Bands like Blonde Redhead and Mazzy Star show up in Rick and Morty by Harmon and Royland's personal requests. They both love 90s shoegaze. Number 96. Elder's main influence for the show's iconic theme song was a mix of a few surprising sci-fi shows. There's Doctor Who, of course, but also Farscape and Invader Zim. And now that I've said that, I can, I can, I can really hear the Invader Zim inspiration. Number 97. Actually, Elder's theme was originally written for Dog World, a completely different Royland show that never made it to air. The song was just a placeholder for Rick and Morty, but the entire team fell in love with it. Number 98. One of the most memorable songs for the show is Goodbye Moon Men, which is sung by Flight of the Concords' Jermaine Clement. 
Clemens. The team only had 20 minutes to get Clemens' vocals on the song after he had recorded all of his lines for Fart, but Clemens such a pro that Elder just used his first take. Number 99. Elder gets a ton of free agency on Rick and Morty, much more than a composer gets on the average show. Most shows dictate where they want the music to go, but Elder largely gets to make that decision himself. Then he tweaks everything in collaboration with Harmon and Royland after his first pass. Number 100. Since Royland actually has a background as a musician, he tends to be the one who gives more notes to Elder. Royland often wants to experiment with the music, but Harmon is more of a this doesn't work type when it comes to that kind of stuff. Number 101. Both Harmon and Royland make a ton of cameos in the show's music. To attempt to make Harmon's job on the song Fathers and Daughters easier, Elder placed in a few doo-doos as a placeholder backing vocal, but Harmon took the doo-doos very seriously, to the point where the song is now colloquially known as Doo-Doo Butt. Number 102. The centerpiece of the inaugural Adult Swim Festival in 2018 was the Rick and Morty musical Rick Experience. Ryan Elder led a 37-person orchestra to live score the season 3 episode The Rick Shank Redemption. Number 103. This marks the first time that Elder's music for the show was played by a group of actual humans. Composition can be a very solitary process, and when composing the score, Elder brings in a live musician only occasionally to fill in the blanks. Number 104. Elder and tons of other composers typically write with the help of samplers and recordings of real instruments. However, a few songs, like Goodbye Moon Men, were recorded with a live band. Number 105. Several of the songs from the soundtrack were also performed as part of the experience, featuring a few special guests. Rappers Open Mike Eagle and Father fronted a performance of Get Swifty, and Bob's Burgers' John Roberts helped out on Terry Folds. Number 106. Season 4 isn't even done yet, but you're probably asking, what about Season 5? Actually, months before Season 4 even aired, the Rick and Morty team had already begun work on the show's fifth season. And fact number 107, rolling right into the fifth season while the fourth was still wrapping up was a very deliberate move for Royland and Harmon. They want to force themselves to commit to a quicker schedule under the new contract. We've never claimed to be good at math, which is why the next video in our compilation concerns Season 6. Don't ask us what happened to 107 facts about Season 5, alright? Some things are better left unknown. But if you really want that video, let us know in the comments and we might just put it together for you. For now, let's kick back and enjoy 107 facts about Rick and Morty Season 6 that you should know. As Season 6 of Rick and Morty has wound down, it's plain to see that it wears the crown among all the other potential kings of animation. But just how did this king get to the top of the hill with Season 6? In true Rick and Morty fashion, these latest episodes are densely packed with references, callbacks, and pop culture nods. Some obvious, some obscure. Thankfully, Channel Frederator is here to dispel the universe's ever-expanding mysteries with 107 facts about Rick and Morty's sixth season. Number 1. Season 6 of Rick and Morty first premiered on Adult Swim on September 4th, 2022. The final 10th episode of the season aired a few months later on December 11th. Number 2. That September 4 season debut date was announced back in July of that very same year. Number 3. By that same time in July, Rick and Morty had been seen over 10 billion times across the entire planet. According to Adult Swim's metrics, those views include standard, linear watching, streaming, and other digital options over Rick and Morty's lifetime. Number 4. The 10 episodes of Rick and Morty's sixth season are the latest batch of a 70-episode deal between Adult Swim and show creators Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland. The network ordered the episodes before season 4, and that season's episodes were the first to roll out as part of that arrangement. Number 5. Dan Harmon, Justin Roiland, and the rest of the Rick and Morty team started writing season 6 in the first half of 2020. That's before production on season 5 had even finished. Number 6. As you might imagine, due to the then brand new pandemic, much of the writing had to be done remotely. The writers all met in a digital writer's room over Zoom. Number 7. Harmon described the new pandemic-friendly writing process as a mixed bag. On one hand, he said the remote writer's room over Zoom felt joyless compared to the usual in-person experience. The process of writing as a team is more taxing on the human brain when you're staring at a screen, so they couldn't stay on a call for more than two hours at a time without feeling fried. Less explosive bliss compared to the old way. Number 8. 
Harmon said that remote work wasn't a complete detriment to the writing process though. Sure, being physically apart didn't facilitate the explosive bliss that an in-person writing session can bring. However, those limited two-hour blocks necessitated a more structured, focused writing process. Harmon noted that it made the writer's room feel more democratic and more like a parliamentary procedure where each writer goes around and shares ideas. While it wasn't as fun, it allowed the writers to truly hunker down. Number 9. If you ask Justin Roiland, the pandemic obstacles didn't get in the way of Season 6's way. Roiland wasn't so crazy about how Season 5 turned out, describing it as fine. But Season 6? Roiland called it a fucking quality season, and couldn't wait to show it off. He also described the newest season as a bit more canonical and rewarding for longtime fans who were deeper into the details of Rick and Morty's lore. Number 10. Justin Roiland also described Season 5 as a weird one for himself and the rest of the Rick and Morty team. This is due to the tragic, untimely death of line producer J. Michael Mandel. He died on September 22, 2019 at the age of 54. Number 11. By October 2020, Dan Harmon said that they were well on their way to finishing Season 6. At that point, he was even getting details confused between Seasons 5 and 6. They had been writing both seasons at the same time, sometimes writing one season's finale while writing the other season's premiere. Number 12. In fact, the Rick and Morty writers were well ahead of the curve. In March of 2021, at Adult Swim's South by Southwest panel, Harmon announced that they had even started writing Season 7. At the time, he said that a week from now, the Season 7 writer's room starts while we continue to work on Season 5 episodes. Number 13. Sure enough, Season 5 came and went. In August 2022, Rick and Morty fans finally got their first taste of Season 6. Adult Swim screened an episode of Season 6 at their festival block party. Number 14. The panel featured Spencer Grammer, Summer's voice actress, as well as Rick and Morty writer-producer Nick Rutherford. Number 15. Fans also got a tease of Season 6 with a very brief animation titled Wormageddon, A Citadel Secret. Well, at least they thought it was a Season 6 teaser. Now that Season 6 is wrapped up, it turns out that the teaser led to nothing. Maybe we'll see this egg again in Season 7. Number 16. In the meantime, let's dive into the Rick and Morty that we did get in Season 6, starting with Episode 1, Solarix. This episode's title is a reference to Solaris, a science fiction novel by Stanislaw Lem from 1961. Like Rick, the main character of Solaris is haunted by his dead wife. Number 17. Episode 1 of Season 6 is written by Albro Lundy and directed by Jacob Hare. Number 18. Like every episode of Season 6, this episode is dedicated to J. Michael Mandel. Season 6 is the first season of Rick and Morty that he did not work on. Number 19. If you look closely at the vending machine that Summer uses, you'll see a number of Marvel references. X-Men fans will recognize Cyclops' visor and Magneto's helmet. You can also see Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Of course, Summer goes with a true Marvel classic, Wolverine's claws. Number 20. Technically, the claws that Summer picks up aren't the classic Wolverine claws that we know. Instead of Logan's usual three claws per hand, Summer only grows two. This is a reference to Wolverine's daughter in the comics, X-23 aka Laura Kinney. Number 21. When Season 2 Jerry releases the ever-deadly Mr. Frundles, he reminds the rest of the family of their agreed-upon rule. No boogans in the house. This is a reference to the 1981 monster movie The Boogans. Basically, these weird turtle-looking alien monsters are accidentally set free and quickly wreak havoc. They're kinda like Mr. Frundles, except way less cute and way less universe-ending. Number 22. Back in the Cronenberg dimension, Cronenberg Jerry says, Fatality, Jerry wins. This, of course, is a reference to the classic fatality mechanic from Mortal Kombat. Number 23. Albro Lundy and Dan Harmon consider Morty returning to his original Cronenberg dimension as a kind of punishment for being so cavalier about portal travel. They feel it shows Morty the horrible consequences of his actions and all of his dimension hopping. It also shows him how Jerry is actually better off without him, and the rest of the Smiths, really. The writers describe this Cronenberg Jerry as a kind of perfect Jerry. Number 24. 
episode one of season six is actually the first Rick and Morty season premiere that doesn't end in the family garage. Number 25. Remember when Rick warns Morty about refeeding syndrome, forcing him to mash up his sandwich? Well, Rick wasn't making that up to get under Morty's skin. Refeeding syndrome is a real thing. When your body goes too long without food or nutrients, reintroducing too much food too quickly will mess you up. Number 26. Moving on to episode 2, Rick, a mort well lived. This title is a play on the Roy, a life well lived. The arcade game that Morty gets trapped in when terrorists attack blips and chits. Number 27. This episode is written by Alex Rubens and directed by Kyung Hee Lim. Number 28. While Rick is trying to rescue Morty from Roy, Summer's entire B-plot is one extended Die Hard reference. The villain and his entire plan is modeled after Hans Gruber. Also, he's voiced by Peter Dinklage. Number 29. Of course, Summer's heard of Die Hard, but has never seen it. So it's only natural that she completely butchers John McClane's classic line from the movie. yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. Instead, she blares out walkie-talkie Die Hard, motherfuckers. Close enough. Number 30. Even the Die Hard sequels get referenced. The Hans Gruber alien's brother tries to recreate the plot of Die Hard 3. Well, turns out the main villain of Die Hard 3 is Hans Gruber's brother. Number 31. Oh, remember that early episode screening that fans got at the Adult Swim Festival block party? This is actually the episode that they got to see. Number 32. The Die Hard 3 joke was already a deep cut, but this one has even more layers. One of the Hans Gruber alien's henchmen confesses that he once ate a kid. This is a reference to the diehard character Al Powell, a cop who helps John McClane and tells him about how he once shot a kid. But it goes deeper. Al Powell is played by Reginald Vell Johnson, who also played the dad in Family Matters, Carl Winslow. This particular henchman's name? Winslow. Number 33. The third episode of Season 6 is called Bethic Twinstinct, a reference to the 1992 movie Basic Instinct. Number 34. Episode 3 is written by Anne Lane and directed by Douglas Enar Olson. Number 35. Beth and Space Beth get their hands on some Venusian wine, which is more significant than you might think. The planet Venus is named for the Roman god of beauty, love, and desire, among other things. Also, Venus has come to represent femininity in general. It's that whole vibe of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Number 36. Also, even if you've never been to Venus, the Venusian that the Beths speak to each other might sound familiar. It's literally just French. Sarah Chalk, Beth's voice actress, is actually fluent in French as well as German. Number 37. Bethic Twinstinct is actually the third episode of Rick and Morty to get a TVMA rating from the FCC. Most of the episodes are rated TV 14, but this one has an especially high volume of foul language. The other two episodes in this distinct category are Interdimensional Cable 2, Tempting Fate, and Vindicators 3. The Return of World Ender. Number 38. Morty and Summer spend most of the episode playing video games, but you'll notice a few references tucked in there. For example, for instance, they're playing a game called Get Into a Street Fight, a parody of the classic fighting game series Street Fighter. Number 39. One of the Get Into a Street Fight characters is a reference as well, but not to a video game. The character Kick Puncher is a reference to a movie that Troy and Abed watch in Community. As you may know, Community is another Dan Harmon creation. Number 40. It's a little more subtle, but there's also a reference to Final Fantasy in the games as well. There's a character who looks like Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, and you'll see that he's struggling to lift his cartoonishly massive sword. Number 41. Morty's crying rant about Discovery Channel is likely a reference to the Discovery Warner Bros. merger in April of 2022. After the merger, a number of different animated shows got axed from HBO Max, so it could help explain Morty's apparent despair and existential crisis. Number 42. Rick accuses the two Beths of trying to sand Junipero. This is a reference to the Black Mirror episode where two women fall in love in an entirely digital paradise and live there with each other forever. Number 43. 
Oddly enough, this is actually the only episode of Rick and Morty without a musical score. Number 44. Episode 4's title, Night Family, is likely a reference to an anthology horror series from the late 60s, early 70s called Night Gallery. The show was hosted by Rod Serling from The Twilight Zone. Number 45. Night Family is written by Rob Schrab and directed by Jason Hare. Number 46. Night Family actually showed two different previews for the episode. On September 19th, Adult Swim dropped a brief promo, and on September 21st, they dropped a two to three minute extended preview ahead of the episode's premiere date, September 25th. Number 47. Rick and Morty is no stranger to pop culture and science fiction references, but episode four starts off with an old-timey literary quote. That T.S. Eliot quote at the beginning is a verse from his poem, Fragment of an Agon. Number 48. From there, the episode leans into its horror influences. To set the tone, the writers took big inspiration from old John Carpenter horror movies like Halloween and The Thing. You can even hear Carpenter's influence in this episode's dark, synthy score, including the Knight Family's own theme song. Number 49. The Knight Family calls their daytime counterparts Daymanoids. This is a reference to a horror movie called Demonoid, Messenger of Death from 1981. Number 50. There's another horror reference right at the end of the episode, but this one may have been an accident. When Rick and Morty are doing an ad read in their podcast about abs, Morty says, as above, so below. Sure, it's an old turn of phrase, but it's also a found footage horror movie set in the Paris catacombs. Number 51. While the writers may not have intended that reference, they'd intended to do a Night Family style episode for a while. Dan Harmon said that the idea of a Knight Family was a concept that the writers had been toying with for years. Number 52. Summer's Night Person is the villain, but that could have also been in the works for some time. Spencer Grammer had been asked about the idea of an evil summer as far back as August 2021 in an interview she did with Inverse. Number 53. Take a look at the four movies that Beth is burning. Independence Day, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Groundhog Day, and Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. While the first three movies ultimately get burned, Beth spares Talladega Nights because it has night in the title, as opposed to the others which all have day. Number 54. Episode 5 is titled Final Dismithation, a reference to the disaster-based horror movie series Final Destination. Number 55. The episode is written by Heather Campbell and directed by Douglas A. R. Olson. Number 56. The entire plot point of Jerry being destined to bang his mom is an overt reference to the ancient Greek play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. Number 57. The episode's villain, Jenneth Padro Chunt, is a not so subtle nod to Gwyneth Paltrow. Specifically, the episode's making fun of her pseudo scientific business ventures over the past few years with her product line Goop. Number 58. Rick's transformation is a reference to Thundercats. Before his suit magically appears, he shouts, Eye of Thundera, give me suits beyond suits. In Thundercats, the Eye of Thundera was a magical gem embedded in the Sword of Omens. When Lionel would say, give me sight beyond sight, the gem and the sword would show him far away and hidden enemies. Number 59. Sure enough, Jerry gets his own magical transformation too, but as Rick says himself, Jerry's is more like a Sailor Moon sequence. Rick even says makeup, like when the Sailor Moon characters transform. Number 60. And that's not the only anime reference in this episode. Jenneth Padro Chunt's giant horrific transformation at the end is a reference to Tetsuo's monstrous fate in Akira. Number 61. Old Man Huxby mentions someone named Margaret Howe pleasuring a dolphin in the 1960s. This was an actual NASA project back then. Howe was a NASA scientist who worked with a dolphin named Peter. Peter formed a sexual bond with her and wouldn't cooperate with experiments until Howe gave him a happy ending. Number 62. This story actually gets a dramatic recreation in the show Drunk History. In that particular episode, Carl Sagan is played by Chris Parnell, the voice of Jerry. Number 63. Remember the song that plays in Rick's ship and during the end credits? That's actually the theme song to Taxi, a TV show from the 70s. Also, let's play another round of Six Degrees of Rick and Morty. Christopher Lloyd was in Taxi and also played Doc Brown in Back to the Future, who Rick is based off of. 
Number 64. The Fortune Cookie Company is called Fortune 500, a direct reference to Fortune Magazine's yearly list of the 500 biggest companies and corporations in America. Naturally, the Fortune Cookie Company has a VIP program that offers financial advice. Number 65. This episode even has a quick Transformers reference. Rick turns one of the soldiers into a robot dinosaur that looks like Grimlock from the first generation of Transformers toys. Number 66. Forget robot dinosaurs, episode 6 is called Jurixic Mort, a reference to Jurassic Park. Number 67. Jurixic Mort is written by Nick Rutherford and directed by Kyung Hee Lim. Number 68. The way the dinosaurs show up to Earth is a reference to the 2016 alien movie Arrival. Like the aliens in Arrival, the dinosaurs have peaceful intentions, and even their pill-shaped ship kind of looks like the ship that the aliens in Arrival used to get to Earth. Number 69. The dinosaurs themselves have some famous voices behind them. The Tyrannosaurus God is voiced by Lisa Kudrow, famously known for playing Phoebe in Friends. Number 70. The Brachiosaurus is played by Jason Raz. Remember him? He had that big song, I'm Yours. Number 71. Finally, the Triceratops is voiced by Dan Harmon himself. Number 72. When the dinosaurs give Rick a new, higher-tech portal pistol, Morty says, Clever girl. This is a reference to the Hunter Muldoon's classic line in Jurassic Park when he gets outmaneuvered by a raptor. Number 73. The Bar Bo Q is a reference to the American version of House of Cards. The president's go-to restaurant in that show is a barbecue place called Freddy's Barbecue Joint. Number 74. In the Dinosaurs pamphlet, there's an alien planet called Ronconcoma. Ronconcoma is actually a town in Long Island, New York. Why the reference? Well, other than the funny sounding name, Douglas Einar Olsen, one of the directors, is apparently from Long Island. Number 75. Rick insists to Summer that every moment at the Oscars is scripted. Even that one. This is undoubtedly a reference to Will Smith hopping up on stage and slapping Chris Rock at the 2022 Oscars. Number 76. The skateboarding dinosaurs in the post credit scene could be a reference to the 1988 cartoon Denver the Last Dinosaur. In that show, a dinosaur hatches and a bunch of teenagers teach it how to skate. Number 77. If you can believe it, episode 6 actually has a subtle continuity error. At one point, you can see the ruins of the destroyed citadel of Rix in the background. However, this is in the Parmesian Dimension. The previous dimension where the citadel was destroyed has since been frundled. Keep in mind that the writers were working on seasons 5 and 6 at pretty much the same time, so this could have just been a visual oversight. Number 78. But we can't talk about Connie Tenuity Error without talking about Episode 7, Full Meta Jackrick. This title is a reference to Stanley Kubrick's 1987 war film Full Metal Jacket. Number 79. Episode 7 is written by Alex Rubens, directed by Lucas Gray. Number 80. Paul Giamatti returns as Story Lord from the first episode he was in, back in Season 4's episode Never Ricking Morty. Number 81. Additionally, Chris Maloney reprises his role as Jesus Christ, who also first appeared in Never Ricking Morty. Number 82. This is the first time we meet previous Leon, but he had been in the minds of the Rick and Morty writing team for a long while. This was the first opportunity they had to put him into the story. Number 83. Joseph Campbell also gets introduced as an in-universe character. If you're not familiar, he's the author of The Hero with the Thousand Faces, and a massive influence on Dan Harmon. Campbell's famous hero's journey was a direct inspiration for Harmon's story circle writing structure. Number 84. Fittingly, Dan Harmon actually voices Joseph Campbell in this episode. Number 85. Story Lord's creator, Jan, is actually a fictional stand-in for Harmon and his struggles as a writer. Number 86. You might have noticed that a couple of websites pop up in this episode. Well, they're actually registered. If you go to www.rick-plush.biz, you'll be directed to a storefront to purchase your own Rick plushie. They do take Visa and MasterCard, but unfortunately, the offer is limited to participating dimensions, and that doesn't include ours. Number 87. As for the other URL, www.story-train.com, it's much more straightforward. It simply links to the Rick and Morty page on Adult Swim's website. Number 88. 
Episode 8 is titled Analyze Piss, a reference to the 1999 comedy Analyze This, starring Billy Crystal and Robert De Niro. It's about a dangerous mob boss who starts going to therapy, so you can see the connection. Number 89. This episode is written by James Siciliano and directed by Phil Mark Sagadraka. Number 90. Rick decides to go to therapy, willingly this time. No pickles, no jaguar. So who else would he see but Dr. Wong again from the classic Pickle Rick episode? And once again, she's played by Susan Sarandon. Number 91. Right at the top of the episode, Mr. Nimbus is battling with Rick. Rick sends Mr. Nimbus crashing into an ocean freighter. If you blink, you'll miss it. But the freighter is actually labeled with the name Evergeese. This is a reference to an actual ocean shipping company, Evergreen Marine Corporation. Number 92. Also, once again, Mr. Nimbus is voiced by Dan Harmon. Number 93. Of course, Mr. Nimbus sounds familiar, but so does Pissmaster. He's played by Will Forte. Number 94. The writers have said that they considered Rick becoming Pissmaster as a kind of Marvel hero origin premise, but turned on its head. It's an example of Rick learning to empathize with somebody for a change. It's a subtle nod as far as Marvel influence goes, certainly more subtle than Cookie Magneto. Number 95. Episode 8 has a few DC references sprinkled in there as well. Take another look at the Space Hitlers. One of them is clearly based off the Riddler from Batman. Another is a large gorilla like Gorilla Grodd, one of the Flash's enemies. Also, the Orb Council is reminiscent of the Green Lantern Corps. They give a powerful trinket to those they deem worthy of upholding galactic peace. Number 96. Episode 9, A Rick in King Mortar's Mort is a reference to the 1995 fantasy movie A Kid in King Arthur's Court. Number 97. The episode is written by Anne Lane and directed by Jacob Eyre. Number 98. There are plenty of guest voices this time around. Two of the Knights of the Sun are played by David Mitchell and Robert Webb, a British comedy duo well known for their sketch show, That Mitchell and Webb Look. Number 99. Another one of the Knights of the Sun is played by Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter himself. At one point, he even calls Rick a wizard. Number 100. Finally, the Viscount of Venus is voiced by Jack Black. Number 101. As far as Rick and Morty goes, this particular episode is heavily self-referential. Morty questions whether or not Rick is giving him a vat of acid style punishment by handing him the reins, a reference to the vat of acid episode. Also, the way Rick and Morty fall into the sun is a visual callback to how they fell into the vat of fake acid. Number 102. Here's another small nod to a past episode. Rick describes hanging out on Pluto as some Jerry-level shit, referring to that time that Jerry went to bat for Pluto's planet status in Season 1's Something Ricked This Way Comes. Number 103. When Episode 9 first dropped, it was actually highly divisive among Rick and Morty fans. Plenty of fans complained that while Rick's character had developed some, especially after the season's previous episode, his kind and supportive attitude towards Morty felt too sudden and out of character. Number 104. Well, the writers must have anticipated the fans' split reaction because the whole kindness thing gets retconned in the final episode of season 10. Turns out that Rick was a robot, helping Morty on his adventure while the real Rick continued his search for Rick Prime. Number 105. Episode 10 is titled Rictional Mort Poon's Rickmas Mortcation, named after the classic Christmas movie National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Number 106. The episode is written by showrunner Scott Martyr and directed by Kyung Hee Lim. Number 107. From the first moment, the whole episode is rife with Star Wars references. You've got lightsabers, the president's droids, and even a legally distinct take on the Imperial March in the score. And sure enough, Rick and Morty will continue marching on into Season 7 whenever it's ready. I mean, Dan Harmon himself says it was coming all the way back around Season 5, assuming he hasn't also been replaced with a robot version of himself. I'm inclined to believe me. Now, until the anime hits Adult Swim, we've kind of run out of seasons for us to talk about. But we still have plenty more Rick and Morty content. There's just so much going on at any given moment, how could you not want to keep discussing the ins and outs of the Rickverse? Sci-fi has always had the ability to fascinate and thrill, and a lot of its power to do so came from the inventions and the technology featured throughout. 
Rick and Morty is no exception, with Rick Sanchez being a genius inventor. So we collected his best inventions and put them into one video. Make sure you name your favorite down in the comments. I think we can all agree if there's one truly awesome aspect of the science fiction genre, it's the fun, futuristic gadgets. Rick and Morty is no exception to the genre, but they definitely amp up the creativity when it comes to the realm of possibility. This is Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're counting down 14 of the best Rick and Morty inventions that we've seen so far. So hold on to your Terry folds, because this sci-fi is about to get real. Number 14, Grappling Shoes. We're kicking off this list with a throwback all the way from the very first episode of season one, Rick's Grappling Shoes. Because who could ever forget these defiant wonders of physics? If you've seen the episode, then you might recall Rick giving Morty some of these trendy, futuristic kicks on their first known adventure to another planet. These kicks supposedly allow him to stroll down a rather steep incline safely to retrieve the mega seeds. That's right, these shoes enable users to seamlessly walk through any obstacle with minimal effort, from sprinting up the side of sky skyscrapers to scaling Mount Everest with ease, these bad boys can withstand any terrain in the entire multiverse. As long as you remember to turn them on first, anyway. Otherwise, you may need to require some broken bone serum from a universe capable of supplying it. Number 13, Pickle and Anti-Pickle Serum. When you're a mad scientist with nothing but time on your hands, the phrase salt life can have an entirely different meaning. Season 3's episode, Pickle Rick taught us that lesson when Rick Sanchez whips up a nifty pickle serum just to avoid going to family therapy. I can think of about a thousand times when turning myself into a pickle would have been the perfect excuse to back out of a previous engagement, but when plans backfire, there's always the handy anti-pickle serum there to transform you back into a human, but it's crucial to keep track of the serum at all costs, and if the serum is lost or stolen, it'll take nothing short of a fully functional exosuit just to walk again. Number 12, Multiverse Goggles. Have you ever thought about what life would be like in an alternate universe? How different things would be if you continued to date that one person, took that one job, or went with chocolate ice cream instead of vanilla? In Rixty Minutes, we get a preview of what life would be like in an alternate dimension for whoever happens to be looking through these goggles. They enable users to peer into parallel timelines whenever they're feeling curious about past decisions. However, these goggles should come with a warning, whoever uses them may experience extreme buyer's remorse. After all, not every decision you make is always the best decision. Number 11, Cybernetic Helmet. For anyone who's gone through the struggle of training an animal, the thought of a cybernetic helmet capable of raising their intelligence level might sound like a godsend, until said animal realizes its ability to overthrow mankind. In episode two, Lawnmower Dog, we see this whole scenario play out when Rick whips up a cybernetic helmet for the Smith's family dog, Snuffles. Once it's securely attached, Snuffles instantly recognizes and understands commands along with his subservient place among mankind. Within a matter of hours, Snuffles figures out a way to overthrow the entire planet, even though he ultimately decides not to go through with this decision. Good boy, Snuffles. But honestly though, if the helmet works that fast and efficiently, I'd still consider buying one, even though we'd be at the risk of being totally enslaved. Honestly, totally worth the trouble. Number 10, exosuits. Diehard Rick and Morty fans had to know this invention was coming at least at some point on this list, but there's not just one version worth mentioning. The Metal Iron Man ask exosuits from Look Who's Purging Now and the more organic, fleshy roach and rat prototype seen in Pickle Rick. These fully functional suits graced us with some of the best action sequences of the entire series, from gunning down aliens with messed up class systems to a lonely pickle person fighting off dozens of ravenous sewer rats, it's pretty clear that these suits pack enough punch to make even Tony Stark blush. Of course, while the fleshy suits were simply born out of necessity, the metallic suits are the superior pick for anyone who's not temporarily a food item. Still, both versions are fully capable of kicking some major butt. The only real difference here is hardware versus software. No pun intended. Number nine, the anything magnet. We saw this glorious invention in passing recently, but the wondrous fantasies that resulted have lingered our minds ever since. Imagine an ordinary magnet remodeled with a command setting capable of attracting whatever your heart desired. Are you imagining it? That's like having a genie at your disposal, but with far less obligation and far more results. In the episode Morty's Mind Blowers, we see Rick summon a hefty amount of zip ties in a matter of seconds using this miracle of science. 
And of course, we also see Morty attempt to do the same with women. Unfortunately, this is an Axe body spray and women are quite literally attracted to the physical magnet in a sense and not the person using the magnet. Yeah, that's a tough lesson to learn once a large group of injured ladies are stuck to your house like flies on sticky paper. I guess it just goes to show always be always be careful for what you wish for. Number eight, Inception device. Regardless of your stance on the Chris Nolan film Inception, the concept of physically manipulating a stranger's dreams sounds pretty cool, right? That's why season one's Inception device makes our list here at number eight. Admit it, this is one invention any of us would love to have set aside for a rainy day, and it's conveniently designed to clip right onto the ear like any Bluetooth wireless headset. This little mechanism is quite literally a dream come true for anybody willing to live out the plot of Inception. Think of the unlimited possibilities that await you. Everything from planting unsuspected ideas into people's heads, dream jumping, hang with demons, and even attending dream orgies. There's something for everyone here to enjoy. <laughs> Number seven, interdimensional cable. We've all been caught up in channel surfing at some point in our lives, and if there's nothing good on TV, then we just keep flipping through those channels or scrolling through video apps with high hopes until something new or exciting catches our attention. That's why the idea of infinite channels tapping into infinite timelines is so mind-numbingly brilliant. As seen in the episode Rick's D Minutes, interdimensional cable does away with the dreaded nothing to watch scenario and replaces it with the far more delightful too much to watch solution. With infinite channels, you're bound to discover quality programming like ball fondlers, how did they even get there, or you might even see yourself on television. Interdimensional cable is so entertaining it's easy to obsess over or at the very least, it's a great way to pass the time. Number six, Jerry Burry. It's not a great thought, but we've all had it at some point. How can I lose the person I'm with so I no longer have to tolerate them? Hey, don't judge, I said it wasn't a great thought. Well, when Rick had that thought about Jerry, the solution varied drastically from what most people might have come up with. Unless they too built a daycare made specifically for that person and their many alternate versions, the Jerry Burry daycare for Jerry's, which made its first appearance in Morty Night Run, was an incredibly genius concept that even our Rick from C137 wishes he'd invented first. The idea is foolproof. Open business specific to one person, advertise to alternate versions of that person, and offer pastimes for said person that you know will preoccupy them every single time. You know, it honestly does beg the question, if you had a daycare specific to your needs, what exactly would that entail? Probably watching more Rick and Morty, right? Number five, Morty's Mind Blowers. It's more than just an invention. It's an entire protocol. What Rick calls Morty's mind blowers in season three, episode eight, some might call a parody of Men in Black or even a parody of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. What makes this invention so significant is that there is actually a two to three part system involved here. So we'll start with the mind eraser. Whenever Morty witnesses something he doesn't want to remember, or if Rick is just feeling like being a total D-bag, he whips out his mind eraser and sucks out the memory into a vial. And rather than disposing of the memory, Rick keeps them stored in a secret room with a helmet capable of reviewing them when needed. That's phase two. The additional step is in case of emergencies. There's a list of solutions hidden in the room for every possible scenario that could go wrong. If that's the case, then sign me up. There's, there's so many things I, I'd love to unsee. Number four. Aberdolf Linkler. Remember that time in the episode Rixie Business when Rick invented a morally neutral super leader by combining the DNA from both Abraham Lincoln and Adolf Hitler? Okay, so maybe Aberdolf Linkler wasn't perfect, but he was a person after all. That means Rick created an actual person during his career, you know, besides Beth. But this was through unconventional people making methods, and that puts Rick right up there with Dr. Frankenstein. Except Rick was smart enough to avoid using recycled body parts, so you could say this decision makes him a little less mad and a little more scientist because altering DNA to clone a superhuman makes slightly more sense than the former solution. So what if Linkler was just as unstable as Frankenstein's monster? In the end, he still put his life on the line just so Rick and his friends can get high, and that's more than we can say about the other so-called monster. Number three, Anatomy Park. It's the best Jurassic Park ripoff you could ever imagine in tiny microscopic form. There's very few people alive today that wouldn't jump at the chance to literally go on a fantastic voyage to visit Jurassic Park, I, I mean Anatomy Park, as seen in season one, episode three. Admittedly, it would probably take some time to generate interest from the general public, and I'm sure the thought of a theme park located inside an actual human body is bound to get some mixed feelings from people and surely some mild disgust. Not to 
mention, licensing and permits would be a nightmare to acquire for food vendors, which by the way, we're not surprised to see that Panda Express was was in there. Still, when you think of the thrill of being shrunk and subjected to attractions like Pirates of the Pancreas and various diseases on display, I think it's safe to say that there may be something here for everyone, families, science nerds, and thrill seekers alike. Sounds like fun for the whole family. The Microverse For a scientist like Rick, creating and producing free energy is just another day but he blew our friggin' minds with this little endeavor. In the episode, The Ricks Must Be Crazy, we explore an entire microverse contained within his ship's battery. This mini world is filled with aliens whose lives have been dedicated to producing kinetic energy under false pretenses to power Rick's flying vehicle. Unfortunately, these beings evolve and become wise to alternate forms of energy, causing Rick to intervene and convince them otherwise by means of force. So now, Rick is provided with unlimited means of energy for his flying junkmobile and the citizens of the microverse get to exist so long as they keep that energy flowing. Peace between worlds, right? Number 1. The Portal Gun Obviously, the Portal Gun had to come in at our number one spot on this list because it's the most iconic, plot-driven invention featured in the entire franchise. And of course, it appeared from the beginning, in the very first episode. It's a fair assumption to say that Rick is who he is because of this device, the creation of which was clearly a defining moment in his life, and the technology is so advanced that the entire Galactic Federation has been chasing after him ever since. But why? Because it's literally a loophole in the system. Other planets, galaxies, and dimensions aside, this thing can literally take you anywhere in a moment's time, so long as there's enough energy just to keep it powered up. Think of the countless worlds we've been exposed to because of this thing, the giant butt dimension, the couch people dimension, it even paved a way for the dimension run by cybernetically enhanced dogs to exist. Plus, we've seen Rick use his portal gun in just about any sticky situation, whether he's eluding enemies or going on intergalactic snack runs. So let's face it, without the portal gun, there is no Rick and Morty adventures, just a wacky scientist and his average kid counterpart, which is the kind of premise that sounds like it came straight out of 1985 and stuck around till 1990. We may love Rick for a variety of reasons, but it's hard to argue that he's a good person. He does what has to be done, and sometimes does stuff just for fun, and, well, his morals take a hit because of it. I wonder when all adult animation became so nihilistic. Regardless, here's a fun side quest, finding out which episodes would get Rick thrown in the slammer. This is 10 Rick and Morty episodes that would get Rick locked up. How's it going everyone? I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're taking a look at some of the reasons that Rick has such a notorious reputation. And there's no doubt that he's a wanted man. I mean, if we're going by the season two finale, we're gonna be listing this dude's infractions for a long, long while. We could probably go on forever if we wanted to, but for now, here are 10 things that would get Rick Sanchez locked up that we've seen so far. And before we get started, make sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator and click the bell icon to become part of our notification squad. Let's start off with some of his smaller offenses, like uh, destroying an embassy an aggravated murder. Rick Sanchez plays by his own rules. Once he sets his sight on something, nothing in this reality or the next can stand in his way. Not even the Galactic Federation. Well, can you blame him? It, well, yes, very much so. He's an unstoppable genius with unlimited realities in the palm of his hand, but unfortunately, Rick tends to get a little carried away, often pushing the limits of science and morality. For a wanted intergalactic criminal like Rick, murder can happen pretty much any day of the week. Still, in the season three episode Pickle Rick, the body can Count is crazy even for him. And that's not even counting the slew of sewer rats and cockroaches he kills. We're talking about the entire unnamed, possibly Russian embassy that Rick just so happens to wipe out. Suffice to say, they messed with the wrong pickle. So while some of these bad guys may have had it coming, the fact of the matter is, once Rick got started, he never stopped, even when his victims were begging for their lives. It's especially dark considering all the work the show did to humanize these men, like showing their family photos. Even so, Rick proceeded to blow up the entire building, sending everyone to their death. And while that's super messed up, it's also aggravated murder, which carries a sentence of mandatory life imprisonment with a minimum 30 years without parole. Of course, the worst part is that Rick wasn't even in human form at this time, which means it would be impossible to pin him as a suspect. But if there's one thing that we know for sure, it's that destroying an entire government facility should get you locked up for life. Creating and enslaving an alien race. Rick is a known threat to the planet. Actually, no, not just the planet, the whole universe. Multiverse, even. But he's also done some pretty messed up stuff on a smaller scale. During the season two episode, The Ricks Must Be Crazy, Rick created an evolved alien civilization with a microverse that he concealed inside of a battery. Sure, it sounds pretty impressive, 
impressive, but that's not the messed up part. He shrinks himself, travels inside the battery, and convinces the Microverse citizens that they have to constantly move on these platforms to generate kinetic energy to power their city. I mean, when I say it out loud, it just kind of sounds like slavery with extra steps. But wait, it gets even more messed up. Once their top scientist, Zeep Zanflor, voiced by Stephen Colbert, discovers an alternate form of energy via the Teenyverse, a Microverse inside the Microverse, Rick threatens to wipe them out. Just when you think Rick can't get any more selfish, he continues to surprise you. Oh, also, that's genocide on a massive scale. If you ask me, or any citizen of the Microverse, that's definitely worth getting locked up for. Rick's charges would fall under crimes against humanity and attempted genocide. Held to our standards, he would go on trial at the International Court of Justice and answer to the United Nations for these crimes. There's no definitive punishment for the crime, so we'd have to let the United Nations deal with him as they see fit. Messing with time. Now this one almost did get Rick locked up. In the season two premiere of Rickle and Time, Rick freezes time for half a year just so he, Morty, and Summer can take their time cleaning up the house after an epic Rixie business party destroyed it in the season one finale. The problem here is that there are major consequences when you mess with time. For example, if you're feeling indecisive, the timeline can split over and over again. Apparently, Rick gained the ability to manipulate time by obtaining time crystals through illegal means. Of course, there are these fourth dimensional beings that function as time police. They keep people like Rick in check to prevent crimes against time. They find Rick, fix the timeline, and attempt to take Rick into some sort of time prison, but then Rick does what geniuses always do, and he outsmarts the time police by resplitting the time into a whole whack of different timelines. He then reunites the timelines into one using time-stabilizing collars, successfully eluding the being and saving himself and his grandkids from an interdimensional prison. According to the fourth dimensional being in the episode, theft of time-freezing crystals results in a life sentence in time prison. And for a time prison, I can't help but wonder how long they consider life to be. Building unlicensed theme parks inside a human body. As awesome as this one sounds, it just ain't right. In the season one episode, Anatomy Park, Rick exploits a poor homeless man by trapping his illnesses in cages and placing them on display for another ill-fated microscopic business venture. It's basically Jurassic Park meets the Fantastic Voyage, only completely unethical. It goes without saying that Anatomy Park was not a sustainable business model because the homeless man eventually dies due to deteriorating health. But even if he hadn't died, it definitely wasn't legal and we're almost positive it could be considered a crime against humanity. But regardless on your stance here, it's apparent that this was a pretty bad investment. Rick is lucky to have simply cut his losses rather than getting locked up for such a deranged deed. Though, to be honest, I'd probably still go to Anatomy Park. In this case, Rick would most likely be facing charges of at least fraud and involuntary manslaughter. Most criminal fraud offenses are considered felony crimes and are punishable by jail, fines, probation, or all of the above. And even though involuntary manslaughter is treated as a less serious crime than murder, it could still result in prison time and other penalties. Destroying the world as we know it. Well, this one's a no-brainer. For any diehard Rick and Morty fan, one of the most epic episodes of the series is season one's Rick Potion number nine, when Rick inadvertently brings about the end of days. Even geniuses make mistakes once in a while, but for Rick, a simple miscalculation costs him and his family life as they know it. So what's a scientist supposed to do when he accidentally transforms most of the people on this planet into monstrous Cronenbergs? Well, leave the planet, I guess. Not only does Mr. Sanchez destroy the world, but he also leaves it behind. He jumps into an alternate reality where he and Morty have already died so that they can resume their lives as if nothing happened. And that's not even the worst part. He leaves the rest of the family behind, including his own daughter, who does manage to make a lovely, if barbaric, home for her family in the apocalypse, getting along just fine without Rick, but still, this is one mistake we will never forget. Considering this crime affected the entire world, it's another case of our good friend Crimes Against Humanity. The United Nations would have to get involved, but since they're probably all Cronenbergs at this point, they would probably just need him or something. Sawing superheroes. The season three episode, Vindicators 3, The Return of World Ender, shows us just how spiteful Rick can be, and just how low he'll stoop to get even with whoever did him wrong. Even if it's a team of powerful superheroes sworn to protect the universe. As we previously mentioned, murder is a cakewalk for any chaotic neutral super genius with an endless list of enemies, especially Rick, but the actual murder isn't why this episode makes the list. It's how and why he chooses to end the Vindicators. During a drunken stupor, Rick sets up a massive series of murderous puzzle traps for the Vindicators to solve, not unlike the Saw series. Unfortunately, the only one who sees through it is Morty, who just so happens to be accustomed to these kinds of randomized drunken trivia games from his alcoholic grandpa. And at the end of it all, the Vindicators are no more, and a giant celebration was set up the night prior to celebrate Rick's inevitable victory over the superheroes. So not only did he wipe out an entire super team, but he did it rather creatively and intoxicated nonetheless. The only question remaining is why did he choose to kill them off one by one? And the answer is simple, to send a pretty clear message to anyone out there who may not like him. So because Ghost Train and the guy made of Vance died by the hands of Supernova, who remains at large, that's two counts of aggravated first-degree murder for Rick, resulting in a double-life sentence 
sentence without parole, being a danger to children. In the season three episode, The ABCs of Beth, our eyes are opened exactly to how much damage has been done as the result of Rick being a less than perfect role model for Beth in her formative years. Rick claimed that his daughter was scary as a child, often wanting Rick to create dangerous science experiments that would put the other children in harm's way. So in order to curb her murderous tendencies, Rick created an alternate dimension for Beth called Froopy Land. Froopy Land is filled with lovable creatures to keep Beth company throughout her childhood. Unfortunately, this plan backfires and Beth ends up attempting to murder her childhood friend Tommy in Froopy Land during a jealous rage. In the present, Rick confronts Beth about her memories of Froopy Land and the disappearance of Tommy. The two travel to Froopy Land to discover Tommy is still alive, but he's living a horrifying existence. He sustained himself by eating the Froopy creatures and claiming to be their king. Naturally, Beth feels responsible, but in her attempts to rescue Tommy, she snaps and goes on another murderous rampage. She returns to the ordinary world with his finger so Rick can clone Tommy so that he can finally return to his family. It's a dark moment for Beth, and it doesn't exactly paint Rick as the best parent. This is a case of emotional child abandonment, meaning Rick put in minimal effort as a parent. Most states classify child abandonment as a felony, resulting in the relinquishing of all rights and responsibilities to the child. There's also a potential charge for helping conceal Tommy's kidnapping slash murder. Rick can be charged as an accessory after the fact or for aiding and abetting since he took actions to conceal the crime and help Beth avoid capture. This is considered a felony and would result in a prison sentence. Selling Super Weapons Season 2, Episode 2, Morty Night Run introduced us to one of the most lovable yet short-lived characters of the series, the assassin Crumbopulous Michael. It also shed some light on a rather shady facet of Rick's life, the fact that he makes and sells super weapons to alien assassins. But why would Rick do something as depraved as selling super weapons? Well, he wanted to use his profits at Blitz and Chits, an alien arcade. Morty tries to right Rick's wrongs by protecting Crumbopulous Michael's target, Fart, which of course results in an unintentional bloodbath. Eventually, Morty realizes he was better off not getting involved and kills Fart himself after realizing its intention is to wipe out all of humanity. So in this instance, Rick's selfish intent was justified, but he still sold super weapons to a guy that kills people. Possession and selling of a dangerous weapon is a gross misdemeanor punishable with up to one year in jail and or fines of up to $5,000. But since Crumbopulous Michael is a known assassin, this could be considered accessory to aggravated first degree murder, a felony resulting in yet another 15 year prison sentence. Smuggling Mega Seeds In the first episode of season one, Rick attempts to talk Morty into smuggling mega seeds through intergalactic customs, and he'd be smuggling them the old fashioned way, way up inside his butt. It's shady of Rick to put his grandson on the line, but as the series goes on, we learn that that's pretty much the entire reason Rick keeps Morty around anyway. He basically uses Morty as a human shield or guinea pig, even if it means taking the kid out of school and ruining any hopes he had of living a normal life, and that alone would probably already get you thrown in prison. It's not exactly explained why the seeds are illegal, but if smuggling seeds in your grandson isn't enough, the several federal guards Rick manages to kill in the process make for a clear case that he should be locked up. This one's a little tricky because we don't exactly know why these seeds are illegal, but let's assume it was a drug thing. I mean, we are talking about Rick here. Possession of drug paraphernalia is a misdemeanor and is punishable by a mandatory minimum of one day in jail and a minimum fine of $250. The maximum penalty for possession of drug paraphernalia is 90 days in jail and a $1,000 fine. Then, of course, there are several counts of aggravated first-degree murder. That's another life sentence for every federal guard that Rick and Morty managed to shoot down. More space drugs. In the season one finale, Rixie Business, Rick takes a house party to another dimension and then lies to Morty about needing Calaxian crystals to travel back. Morty and Nancy put their lives on the line to retrieve these crystals for Rick, and Aberdolf Linkler actually dies in the process, only to discover that the crystals weren't needed to travel back home at all. Instead, Rick crushes them, snorts them, and gets high as hell, proceeding to do the self-proclaimed Rick dance to keep the party going. Then, in the season two episode, Autoerotic Assimilation, we're introduced to a hive-minded alien ex-girlfriend of Rick's by the name of Unity. Right away, it's revealed that the two are a terrible match. But in the episode, we see Rick mix some unfamiliar ingredients to concoct a party drug liable to spice up their night. It was basically the sci-fi equivalent to cooking meth, and we're 100% sure that that's gotta be a big no-no in just about every federally regulated galaxy out there. In this case, Rick would be charged with drug manufacturing and would be guilty of a Class B felony facing imprisonment for up to 10 years. If the crime involved two or more kilograms of the drug, then he would be fined up to $100,000 for the first two kilograms and imprisoned as well. But knowing Rick, that's just the tip of the iceberg, and there's no doubt future seasons will bring even more reasons Rick should have stayed in that intergalactic prison. I briefly mentioned the Szechuan sauce incident earlier. For those who may have forgotten or repressed their memories of the time, people went absolutely animalistic for a specific long-lost dipping sauce from McDonald's. Rick mentioned it in an episode, and folks wanted to wax poetic about it, just like Rick. The internet became a Szechuan sauce-themed hellhole for a while, and then McDonald's brought it back. 
Channel Frederator managed to source some of this liquid gold, so here's what we thought. What's up, Channel Frederator? We have a very special video for you today. McDonald's sent us the Szechuan sauce early. Yeah, like a full like 27 hours early because you can't get until 2 p.m. on Saturday, October 7th. And we are recording this at about 11 a.m. on Friday. And we're going to be doing a taste test, and I'm super excited. But Jesse, you're the one who made this happen. I did, because I am a maniac. <laughs> I am a deals warlock. I really pulled this one out. How did you do it? Uh, Kate kept saying, no, we can't. It's not going to work. You're dumb, and I hate you. <laughs> uh, I cried, cleaned myself up, went to my computer, and Googled McDonald's press contact. <laughs> Literally all I did, sent an email, told them who we were. I didn't fully expect to hear back, but uh, you know, I, I kept saying that I believed it. But the and nice folks at McDonald's came through. They did. Uh, Kate, thank you very much for getting back in contact with me. We talked back and forth, and they said, we're going to send you some sauce. You'll have it by Friday morning. Which is today. Right. This is today. We were recording it the moments after we got it. Uh, and they said, we will send you one packet of sauce. One packet? One packet. I, I asked for some more because everyone in the office wants to try it, and they said it's very exclusive. Oh my god, so we have one tiny, okay. We have All one right. tiny packet, and now, Cade, yep. how do you think one would mail a singular packet of <laughs> Szechuan sauce? Uh, or any dipping sauce, really. If it's one packet of sauce, just like maybe a small box. A small box? Yeah, like, or I, I don't think it'd fit in anything else. It'd, yeah, it probably have to be a small. Not like a, a bubble envelope? Like, or maybe a bubble, I, th I think it gets get squished. I think right. you would want to put it in like a small rectangle box. Well, both those answers are wrong. Oh. They are hard wrong. Oh. This morning, uh, a nice man named, I believe, Nick, walked into the office about 9.30 okay. and said, I have a Szechuan sauce for Jesse. And he delivered this. this. Can we, is the, everyone able to see? This bag? They, he walked in and hand delivered this bag. I never thought we'd do an <laughs> unboxing for a sauce delivery. This is not where I thought my life would go. My parents are very disappointed. So in this bag is one packet of Szechuan sauce. Let's, Open it. let's get rid of this. All right, tissue paper. All right, Ooh, we got there, some good stuff. There are some more thingies in here. Wait, what's that? Uh, here, I'll take this letter if you want to start looking at what else is in there. Sure. Hi, Jesse. Whoa. This is it right here. That is. So this video, although they supplied us with the sauce, this isn't sponsored by them. They're not giving us any money for this. Literally, they're just giving us a packet of sauce and a post. They literally gave us uh, and, some and a nice letter. And last but not least, of course, right here. Uh, oh, wait. Coupons. Well, uh, There they are right there. It's the ones they mentioned. Um, yes, but in a, just a regular envelope, you were literally not joking. Right here. <laughs> One. <laughs> that's Szechuan sauce. So th they used the artwork from the poster. They did. So this is different than the one from the Mulan promotion 20 years ago. It's, does it taste different? Uh, I don't remember ever tasting it. I don't remember. Did you? No, I don't remember it at all. What if the sauce never existed? Do, what do you say? Do we do we bust the sauce open? We do. Let's take out our McNugs. Our ooey. This, is, this is what we're going to be using to taste test. Oh, shoot. These are fresh. What? Yo, we don't need Szechuan sauce. We got ranch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Forget the sauce. Can I? You do the honors. This is all you, man. You you made it happen. I'm, I'm, Just I'm don't doing... spill. Don't spill a single drop. Ooh. Oh, okay. It's much darker than I expected. Ooh. I, I was. Ooh I expected a, uh, a, a, like a lighter looking sauce, but it's darker. What's, yeah. What does it smell like? Well. I definitely smell the ginger, a bit of soy, probably. Now, Cade, mm. definitely give it a smell. I want to, because this isn't what I expected to smell like. I don't know what it's going to taste oh. like. I expect it to taste kind of like a tangy barbecue. Interesting. 20 years have built up to this moment. Yes. So we, we're each going to dip, and then we'll take a bite at the same time. Same time. And then we kiss. OK. That's a solid dunk. That's a solid dunk. OK. You double dunked. I, I just wanted to make sure I got the If right anyone point. deserves a double dunk, it's you. It's me. I'm only single dunk. OK. OK. Cheers. Cheers. Three, two, one. Listen to these mouth sounds. <laughs> um. Yeah. It's pretty good. It's, you know, it's not what I expected. It's not I, what I expected. I expected it to be a lot sweeter based on everyone else's recipes of yeah. brown sugar. It does have it does have a, like a hint of spice aftertaste. Like you know, like oh wait, that's that's kicking me in with like some spice flavor. Mm -hmm. That's uh, pretty good though. I yeah. like it. I, I really want to go back in and try another, but I know other people. I know other people want to, but they're not in here yet. You're right. So let's let's do one more. We'll do one more. I wish there's a little more ginger to it. But this is honestly something. Second dunk was spicier. Yeah. But it's not overwhelmingly spicy. No. I think what I would do is probably marinate some chicken in this. Smart. I think that, or like even 
pouring this over some like steamed broccoli. Mm -hmm. If you Ooh. know, don't want to eat chicken. Do a nice stir fry. Yeah. Yeah, this would be great with a stir fry. Mm -hmm. Honestly, McDonald's, hook it up. <laughs> Bring this back fully. Yo, do it. I mean, you could put this on uh, probably waffles. Might taste good. Mm. You know? Chicken and waffles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jim. This is surprisingly good though. I, I thought I was gonna be very disappointed, but I'm actually very oh, impressed. I thought we were being punked and it was gonna be like epic hack, <laughs> and the moment we bit it, we were just gonna like projectile vomit. And apparently Justin Wyland is legitimately has been talking about the sauce for years. Like the entire joke in Rick and Morty is Dan Harmon making fun of Justin Roiland. It is put in there because he's like, what is this obscure sauce that literally no one else remembers except for Justin Roiland? Should we bring in other people from the office to try this? Like, Definitely. I feel like that's kind of what we gotta do. Definitely. We, we've gotten two solid dunks ourselves, mm -hmm. but we did not uh, double dip at no. all. So there's I no, thought about it. There's no contamination yes. there. So other people are more than welcome to try. Uh, double dipping contamination is a myth. So let's see what other people in the office uh, have to say. I can tell you're excited. <laughs> uh, yeah. Excited and kind of nervous. Oh, yes, aren't we? Why are you nervous? <laughs> well, because the Rick and Morty episode built like your expectations up yeah. so high. Mm, through so the roof. I either want it to be really good or really bad. Ooh. I'm kind of worried it's just going to be okay. You say the Rick and Morty episode never happened, and this is all a big coincidence, and McDonald's <laughs> is like, Hey, remember Mulan's Szechuan sauce? We brought it back. Where do you think expectations would lie there? Would you be like, I don't think I'd care because I didn't remember them ever having this be a thing when Mulan okay. was coming out. Okay, and so I was obsessed with Mulan. Mm -hmm. so. I remember Mulan, but I right. uh, could not give a hoot about the sauce. <laughs> okay. Despite being an avid McDonald's fan. Maybe it's because I wasn't like a nugget person. Sure. Mm. I remember getting the Mulan action figure, but I oh. think I was solely devoted to ketchup. That's right. Fine. Okay, got it. You actually remember back in like the 90s when they had the Szechuan sauce promoting yeah. the Mulan movie? I was a very young father at the time, mm -hmm. and I don't remember. I remember Mulan coming out. Of course. And I I think I remember the ad campaign, but I, I was not... Uh, I was not eating much McDonald's at the time. But I am a huge Rick and Morty's fan. Okay. Oh. Yeah, and so I, I got the illusion when he brought it up. Right. And, uh, you know, it's a really funny joke. And I, of course, being in a marketing person, I think this whole thing is hilarious. So you're really excited to try it then? Yes. Art influencing real life and back and forth is so <laughs> great. What do you think this sauce is going to taste like? I have no idea. I'm interested what their conception of that flavor palette is. I, I It looks like barbecue sauce. I, mean, actually, I thought mm. it was actually going to look more like duck sauce. Right. I thought it was going to be lighter. As like well. a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's darker feels more like honey barbecue. It looks like it might maybe a little mustardy taste. Okay. I'm thinking sugary, like mm. barbecue sauce with soy sauce combined. Panda Express orange sauce. Okay. I remembered it being a different color. Do you think they changed the recipe at all? Well, I or so this some is chemicals really they can't controversial, use? right? Mm -hmm. Is that I I bet you that they did. Food science has evolved a lot since then, and I imagine that the stabilizers and the other stuff that they used back in the 90s that they are not going to be using now. But what do I know? Well, yeah. grab a nugget and get okay. a solid dunk in and dive on into that it. sweet, sweet goop. You get one solid dunk. Yeah. You can kind of like swirl it around if you want to get a little extra on there. No, I'm good. Okay. Don't trip it on the table. It's so glistening. I'm actually a vegetarian. This wait, wait, oh, is that true? Not, oh. Just kidding, just kidding, oh, just geez. kidding. I'm about I'm gonna do it. Ooh. Also, these nuggets are not exactly cr crispy. <laughs> so they're like, so like room temperature. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it really brings out the taste of the sauce. Like it's mm -hmm. an intentional thing. It's like how you smell coffee beans before. Right, right. Yeah. Something. Thoughts on the smell? Actually, it doesn't smell bad. Okay. It smells like it's something that could taste good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's see. You cook a lot, and your food is delicious, which oh, is one it. of the reasons I really want to know what you think of the Well, I'm really interested to know what these flecks are. I mean, they look like they're probably just pepper, but. Okay. Deconstructed mm. in your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Is this what it's like to go out to dinner with you? <laughs> Probably. Mm. Ooh. Mm. He's really like switching yep. around his palate. Really thinking about him. Like, what wine would you pair with? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's see what you think. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, immediate oh, reaction there. Oh, just I don't like it. <laughs> oh, it's like steamy. <laughs> It's oh, not, it was fine until I swallowed it and then right? it, it hurt me. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the aftertaste, right? That's I mean, what I was it's saying. Like, it's aggressive. Yes, it like. has like a kick. That's what I was saying. Ooh. <laughs> that sour hit came and went really quickly. Okay, yeah. I'm not really sure what I just ate. <laughs> soy sauce. You, you think it tastes like soy sauce? That's mm -hmm. it? That's it. Pretty good. You like yeah. it? Yeah, I like okay. it. Just what, it, it tastes like, um, 
like soy sauce. You know, um, yeah. when you get like beef and broccoli has like that, right. that brown sauce. Okay, you, know? you think it tastes like That's that? exactly what it tastes like. It's really nasty at first. It gets kind of better <laughs> towards the end. What does it taste like to you? Like orange sauce, like <laughs> really vinegary orange sauce. It kind of didn't taste like anything. And then it hurt me. So <laughs> I don't. Some sort of weird metaphor? I hope so. A white, maybe? Okay. okay. Something a bit yeah. more sweeter to go with, like, the. Not sweet. No, I wouldn't do oh. a dessert one with this. Peppers apparently are the most common human food on the planet, like the vegetable that, that every culture has. You know, it reminds me a little of like duck sauce, but like mm. if you put barbecue sauce in duck sauce and then water, is this oh, bad? Okay. Like, can I no, say No, you can things? say whatever yeah. you okay, want. Okay, we're not like obligated to, to no. praise. Nope. Say whatever you want. Okay. We were gonna say thank you to them, but they didn't sponsor the video. Right? Yeah, so, so. Yeah, thank you McDonald's for uh, hurting me again. <laughs> is there anything you would put the sauce on? Uh. I don't know, maybe not chicken nuggets. Maybe it's because it's on a chicken nugget. Okay. Oh, maybe if right. it was on like some grilled chicken or like a glaze. Mmm, vegetables. Everyone has said barbecue sauce. And do you think it's because of the way that Rick and Morty drew it? Because like they drew it as like that like thick kind of like goopy. Right. Possibly. You could do a stir fry with it, which makes sense with yep. a bunch of vegetables. Broccoli tempura. Oh yeah, Tempura yeah. dipped in the Fried, best. yeah, fried broccoli. That'd be or really good. Or since the holiday season is coming, if you like coat that on a turkey. Ooh. And you really wouldn't pair like a port wine with this. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. Would you recommend this to anyone? No. Not even for the experience <laughs> of being like, you love Rick and Morty, try the sauce. Not really. Uh, oh. I would buy the sauce. You I, would. I would ask for it. You that would. would. Ooh. Okay, good. so McDonald's, make it happen. Yeah, for Kenny. For Kenny. Specifically for. Hashtag, Hashtag 4K. For Kenny. <laughs> oh! High five! I mean, this is like novelty going. Uh, novelty, I would really recommend everyone should go and try this. Just try it. Just yeah. to settle the whole issue. Totally. Which is, they shouldn't keep me. Next up is a gauntlet of theories presented in a clip show style format. This is the most important Rick and Morty theories as of May 2018. Let us know how they all stand up. How can anybody read these? There's no pictures. Hello there. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and with the long Easter weekend upon us, we've all taken some time to... What does the people do at Easter again? So as you can see, we're gonna be doing things a little differently today. Instead of a regular episode of Cartoon Conspiracy, we're gonna take some time to reflect on some past episodes. Although real talk, it probably would have taken just as much time to do a new episode as it would have to put this whole setup together. Oh no. We like to have fun on Cartoon Conspiracy, but sometimes we like to dive into the meatier stuff. Stuff that only the most academic of intellectuals can grasp. People like Socrates, or Aristotle, or his son, Aristotler. You know what, I can't keep up this pompous act anymore. Today we're gonna be looking at some old episodes of Rick and Morty Cartoon Conspiracies, and I'm gonna be here with you the whole time saying random stupid shit in between. So kick back, throw this on in the background if you have to study or cook or whatever it is you do in your free time, and let's just have ourselves a, a good grand old time. And to start things off, we've arbitrarily chosen this episode about the upcoming season four. Happy belated Thanksgiving to everyone who is celebrating. I hope you enjoyed your time by eating a ton of food, probably watching a ton of football, and probably watching a bunch of YouTube videos in a desperate attempt to avoid interacting with your family. It's okay, you can admit it, I totally understand. We're your family now. And speaking of Thanksgiving, did you see that new Rick and Morty short that went up during the weekend? It was a strangely moving look into the life of Mr. Poopy Butthole between seasons two and three. I know you're waiting for a punchline, but there isn't one. I'm not joking. It was actually really touching. But having seen that, we can't help but wonder, well, what are we gonna do this break? At this point, season four could be literal years away, so there's ample time for us to ask, what's gonna happen next? I mean, the season ended on a bit of a weird note, effectively rebooting the series anew, so... Now what? Well, that is what we're gonna talk about today. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and let's do something a little different this week and take a quick look at some Rick and Morty theories that have risen to prominence since the airing of season three. Think of it as kind of like three little Rick and Morty mini-sodes of cartoon conspiracy. Mini-sodes like that Mr. Poopy Butthole short that went up last week, and I literally just made that connection now, but whatever, let's just go with it. 
We've got a lot to cover, so let's dive right into our first theory, which is that Rick and Morty actually takes place over a shuffled timeline. Not alternate timelines, not time travel, but one consistent chronological timeline that's simply presented out of order. You know, like a Christopher Nolan movie that's set in space, not that one though. This theory seems to originate from a thread by Reddit user Cali Mattress, who noticed that depending on which episode you're watching, the characters seem to act different. They always keep the same core personality traits, but the way that they act and react to certain situations seems to change randomly. Being Rick and Morty, this led them to the conclusion that all of these differences in character actions obviously mean that these are all alternate universe versions of all of these characters. And I mean, that makes sense. To give the understatement of the century, it's not exactly something that's unprecedented in this show. But this theory goes on to suggest that through the entire run of the series, we've actually been seeing two stories play out in two different universes versus but presented to us as if they were happening simultaneously. When in reality, one story actually chronologically happened before the other one. The first timeline, in what Cali Mattress calls Universe 5126, details Rick's adventures with his first Morty, who would eventually become Evil Morty. Following this less than desirable outcome, Rick leaves Universe 5126 and hightails it to good old C-137, where he starts over with a new Morty where the present day timeline begins. So instead of the series chronology looking like this, it should actually look like what you're seeing on screen right now. The common thread of this timeline, of course, being Rick, who is always the same Rick. You know what? I'm gonna need a visual for this one. Okay, so according to Cali Mattress, when our Rick inhabited Universe 5126, he was significantly more impulsive and careless than now, where he's shown to be a little kinder and significantly more depressed than previously. Meanwhile, you have other characters like Morty, whose 5126 variation appeared to be smarter, more courageous, and much more successful with women than C-137 Morty, whose more of a follower, less successful with the ladies, and not quite as smart. Based on that, it would make sense that 5126 Morty would eventually become Evil Morty. He seems to have all of the qualifications. And Cali Mattress pointed out subtle character differences in the rest of our main heroes as well. They go into way more detail, so I'll link to the thread in the comments if you want to give it a read, but this is the simple version. But, of course, how does this theory hold up? Well, this theory was proposed when season three was still airing, so they were only able to sort through the episodes up until Rest and Ricklaxation, which they claimed happened in Universe 5126. So let's see if we can't finish their job for them. Although we don't really need to, because in the very next episode, there's a massive contradiction if we're to assume the truth of this graph. In the Ricklantis mix-up, Evil Morty is already present, and by the end of the episode, he's ruling the Citadel. But at the same time, the Morty that accompanied Rick was both more abrasive and apparently had a fling with a mermaid in Atlantis. And these are both personality traits that would supposedly apply to 5126 Morty. Evil Morty, who's already present elsewhere in the episode. Not to mention that the events of this episode are a direct result of what happened in the Rick Shank Redemption, which is an episode that they claim happened in the C-137 timeline. So the whole notion of this being a 5126 episode is completely gone. So with this in mind, that leaves us with one of two possibilities. Either A, a chart like this can still be applied, it's just that the parameters of this one are inaccurate, or B, character differences are just the result of having different writers on the show. And while some motivations may appear inconsistent in the grand scheme, a lot of their actions come out of a necessity to move the plot forward. Not to mention that since this theory focuses so intently on individual character traits, it kind of ignores a lot of overarching plot details throughout the rest of the season. Things like, you know, Beth and Jerry's separation, which I guess would have to have happened in both timelines, I guess? I mean, you know, before it completely stops making sense. So with all of this in mind on the plausibility meter, as much as it pains me because I love this idea, I'd have to rate this shuffled timeline theory one eye patch out of five. Next up, let's for a bit discuss that niggling doubt that the season finale left all of us with that we may never get a straight answer for. Did Rick actually clone Beth? Well, Rick does say in the Rickturian Morty did that he didn't clone Beth, but when has Rick ever been someone we can trust when he's not trying to benefit himself? And the end of the episode, much like the ABCs of Beth, backpedals and makes it all ambiguous again. As Rick told Beth, no matter the outcome, it's still symbolic of Beth having made a choice. Which brings her a step closer to self-discovery, which means that Rick doesn't have to deal with her emotional strife anymore. It's just that as far as we can tell, he didn't realize that this would lead to him being relegated to the bottom of the family dynamic. But some theories have stated if Beth is a clone, it could open up some interesting story opportunities. What if, for example, our Beth did clone herself and then went out on a bunch of crazy adventures like her father? I mean, we all know that she still respects and kind of idolizes her father even after the ABCs of Beth. So could she eventually become her father as she previously stated in that episode? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm my father! 
Could we even see a Council of Beths in the future? Actually, more importantly, can we confirm any of these thoughts? Does it even matter in this case? Well, firstly, in the ABCs of Beth, Rick tells Beth that the clone would have zero chance of becoming self-aware and going Blade Runner. And in the very next episode, Beth starts freaking out that she might be a clone, so these two facts don't seem to gel that well. Plus, we found that earlier in the season, Rick has literally devised a method to erase memories. So if Beth did clone herself, why wouldn't Rick just start Beth's mind blowers and remove the memory of the clone being a clone to begin with? And while the idea of a Council of Beths is really cool, it's still nothing but just baseless speculation. But the reason we're not actually spending a whole lot of time on this theory is because no matter what the show teases us or whatever evidence we can pull, it really doesn't matter. In a multiverse of infinite possibilities, some Beths probably took Rick up on his offer. So regardless of what happened to our Beth, all eventualities will probably play out anyway. That's pretty much the point of this whole dilemma, and since I got served two weeks ago by the creator of Hey Arnold, I should probably take authorial intent a bit more seriously. So on the plausibility meter that I'm not gonna pull up, I'm gonna have to give this like Schrodinger's rating. It's in a constant super state of zero out of five and five out of five, because by the show's own mission, this train of thought is pretty irrelevant in the grand scheme. Next, we've got the amazing theory that's been thrown around since the season finale, which is that any discussion about season four is premature because season three isn't over yet. And as crazy as it is, there's actually way more supporting evidence for this theory than there probably should be. After all, season three was originally supposed to be 14 episodes that got cut down to 10, so... Who's to say that number isn't actually 11? Firstly, let's not forget that the first episode of season three did air on April Fool's Day several months before the season continued, which forced us to never ever trust anything to come out of the mouths of Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland ever again. See, this is why April Fool's Day is the worst holiday, because even when good stuff happens, I still develop trust issues. But because of this unorthodox method of airing episodes, this has led some people to believe that maybe there's one more still down the line for us, maybe sometime next month, which leads us to to our next argument. After the supposed season three finale, Mr. Poopy Butthole teased us about the premiere of season four, saying that the next time we saw him, I might even have a big white Santa Claus beard. Naturally, this has made people think that maybe there's a Christmas special that they've been saving for us. After all, networks like the BBC are known for airing one episode holiday specials of their long running series, with many people pointing to Doctor Who as a prime example of this. A show that Rick mentions in the supposed season three finale, comparing himself to the Time Lord. And finally, earlier, when season three was still airing, after the Ricklantis mix-up, but before the Rick Jury and Morty date, Dan Harmon himself heavily implied in an interview that Evil Morty would return at the end of the season. But then, of course, the episode aired and... nothing. No Evil Morty. So between these three things and a lot of other random pieces of circumstantial evidence, like writer Ryan Ridley being shown here in a behind-the-scenes interview from September wearing a Rick and Morty Christmas sweater, What's going on here? Is there enough evidence out there to suggest that season three isn't actually over yet? I mean, look, at this point, we pretty much can't trust anything that the creators or the writers or the staff directly say. Like, ever. It seems like the more that they want us to believe something, it's more likely that that thing probably isn't true. They are absolute masters at messing with us. While some seem to be teasing us with the possibility, others are going in the completely opposite direction. Here's a tweet of writer Dan Guterman vehemently denying the existence of a Christmas episode. But putting aside any direct remarks from creators or staff, this is surprisingly solid. I mean, my knee-jerk reaction would be to criticize this theory for aimlessly comparing the BBC's broadcast standards to America's and then calling the whole thing a desperate reach by those who were disappointed by the season finale. But Adult Swim has made a name for itself in unique broadcast methods. They've already aired one episode wildly out of step with the rest of the season. Who's to say they won't do it again? And between this, the Doctor Who remark, Mr. Poopy Butthole's remark, and the other subtler things like that Christmas sweater, I'm split in thinking that this is either totally true or a truly pointless misdirection that has had way too much thought put into it. I'm actually kind of conflicted here. The evidence is pretty solid, but I have massive trust issues. So on the plausibility meter, call it wishful thinking, but I'm going to rate the plausibility of season three not being over yet 
2.5 of Mr. Poopy Butthole's hats out of 5. And finally, we're going to end with something all around more plausible, which is the significance of the scene we see in Morty's mind blowers of Mr. Poopy Butthole proposing to Morty. The answer? Based on the newest short released last week, we see that Mrs. Poopy Butthole was proposed to in the same spot. So the most likely answer is that this was probably just a practice run, and Rick and Morty were helping their buddy get over those proposal jitters. Maybe the memory was erased because Rick didn't want Morty to know that he cared. Or maybe Morty fell in love with Mr. Poopy Butthole. Or maybe Morty wanted the engagement to be a surprise to him. No more evidence, no more discussion. This is my headcanon now, and nobody can take it from me. This theory gets 4.5 of Mr. Poopy Butthole's engagement rings out of 5. Alright, I know we kind of blitzed through a lot today, but let us know. What do you think? Whether it's about any of the theories we talked about today, or any theories that you might have for the show going forward. And if you're not sure, well then maybe you can answer this question that we didn't really get to today. What do you think Tammy and Phoenix person are up to? Now, some of you may be thinking that that Christmas special theory isn't accurate anymore because it's 2018 now and there was no Christmas special in 2017, and you know what? You're probably right. Next, we're going to go back, way back to before I owned a proper microphone and was a relatively new face on Channel Frederator, and this episode is all about just how self-aware Rick might be. Enjoy the sudden downgrade in audio quality. Rick and Morty is a pretty big rabbit hole when it comes to theories. And this is because basically anything is possible in it. The show goes out of its way constantly to remind us of this. Mostly by displaying to us that the centerpiece of the show is an alcoholic maniac who basically does whatever he wants without regard for anything. Oh, also he has access to a practically infinite number of parallel universes. Rick's mannerisms have become loved by us all partly because a lot of what he does breaks the fourth wall and has fun with the medium of TV in general. Now there are usually two different thoughts that people will have when taking these jokes into account. Either they're just that, jokes that aren't meant to be read into, but this is Rick and Morty we're talking about. Have you seen how elaborately this show is structured? There are universes, like, on top of universes in terms of content. Which leads us to the second idea. What if these jokes are in fact Rick's cries for help? Does Rick know he's a fictional character? And if so, would this be why his outlook is so nihilistic? Rick has shown signs of self-awareness before, both in the show and also directly referencing it outside of the show. He's addressed the full-on lack of a fourth wall before in outside material, like Rick and Morty's famous couch gag on The Simpsons or multiple promos for the show that appeared on Adult Swim. But events that occur outside of the show are of dubious canonicity at best. So let's focus on what we can see and extrapolate from the show itself. As said before, Rick has broken the fourth wall many times. Now, breaking the fourth wall is a pretty common trope in TV and movies, usually through an aside said by a character or something like that. But Rick seems to draw attention to it pretty often, most notably through his use of catchphrases and direct lines to the camera. I mean, who would talk directly to a camera? Who does that? But every now and again, Rick will say something a bit more obtuse that seems to show awareness of the inner workings of, say, a TV show. In Interdimensional Cable 2, Tempting Fate, he refers to the general sequence of events of his life at that moment as a sequel, also stating that they pretty much nailed it the first time. Notice that the nurse that he's speaking to has no idea what this crazy old man is babbling about. This is because you may have noticed, but every time a fourth wall joke happens, it's always Rick. No one else in the show seems to acknowledge when he makes a fourth wall joke, and they certainly don't get in on the joke themselves. But let's take a look at the most obvious evidence for this theory. In the episodes Ricksty Minutes and the aforementioned Interdimensional Cable 2, Rick, Morty, and company spend their time watching different TV shows from infinite universes leading to infinite TV possibilities. While the episodes are mainly an opportunity for the writers and the voice actors and the staff to do basically whatever they want, these episodes also have some pretty huge implications for Rick. If there are infinite universes with infinite TV possibilities, that must mean that somewhere out there, there's a universe where Rick is just a character on a TV show. And some Somewhere in the back of Rick's mind, he must know this, he's a smart guy. So Rick knows that he is a TV character in other dimensions. Rick is fully aware that Rick, as an abstract concept, is a fictional character to some extent. Possibly in an infinite number of universes. We can give him that, but can we get more specific? What about our Rick specifically? Why would the Rick that we follow throughout the show Rick and Morty do things like, say, roll credits, that's the end of season one at the end of Ricksy business? Now here's where we're going to get a bit theoretical. Scientifically, I mean. Rick is in a special situation, to say the least. The logic of Rick and Morty seems to be governed by a theory in quantum mechanics known as the Many Worlds Interpretation, first proposed by Hugh Everett in 1957. 
in the broadest of strokes, it put forward the hypothesis of the existence of infinite universes with infinite outcomes to infinite possibilities all existing simultaneously. But it also proposed that these universes exist in a vacuum. Individual universes, as well as people within these universes, exist independently of each other, and don't have any effect on or knowledge of their other selves in other realities. And this is, for the most part, true in Rick and Morty as well. And then, there's Rick himself, who is such a loose cannon that there's a whole council of Ricks dedicated to keeping him and other wildcard Ricks in line. Our Rick, Dimension C-137 Rick, has completely rejected this council and goes off on his own merry way, causing chaos and destruction in his wake. So this specific specific Rick's situation is a pretty unique one and would probably be instantly recognizable if C-137 Rick were to see it on TV somewhere. Another thing is that if there are infinite Ricks that are TV characters, would that also mean that there are infinite Ricks that aren't TV characters? The short answer is we have no idea, because concepts like infinity are really hard to talk about without getting caught up in these technicalities. And the long answer is a bunch of philosophy and quantum theory. I am not a scientist. So even if it made sense for C-137 Rick to just assume that he specifically was a TV character, why would he choose to express it so obviously and so frequently? Rick is a man of facts, not beliefs. So if he's going to continue to break the fourth wall like he does, that must mean that something somewhere must have clicked for him, right? And the answer to that is yes. In the post credit scene of the season 2 finale, The Wedding Squatchers, we see that literally everybody's favorite character, Mr. Poopy Butthole, is watching that very episode on his TV. And we can be certain that this is the very same Mr. Poopy Butthole that we've already met, since he goes out of his way to remind the audience of the trauma he endured at the end of the episode Total Recall. So we can be confident in saying that this is the same version of this character who just so happens to be very good friends with C-137 Rick. And the other important detail is that he is unmistakably watching Rick and Morty. Adult Swim's Rick and Morty. Which shows that in the canon of Rick and Morty, not only is C-137 Rick a TV character, but he's also a cartoon character in whatever universe Mr. Poopy Butthole is currently residing in. Since he and Rick are such good friends, and since Mr. Poopy Butthole is such a crazed fan of the show, that poor pizza guy. We can make the logical leap that Rick's been made aware that his personal escapades are on television. This scene, which initially seemed like an afterthought to season 2, could actually be one of the most important moments in the history of the show so far. And this revelation brings us to something that Rick says in Rick Potion number 9. While trying to convince Morty to bury their dead counterparts so that they can take their place, you know, normal stuff, Rick tells Morty that it's best to not think about realities that don't affect you directly. Could this be what he means? Could it be that ever since realizing he's a TV character, he's been finding it impossible to shake? Is he becoming more aware of just how absurd his life is? Obviously, Rick chooses to have a bit of fun with this realization from time to time, doing whatever he wants with little to no regard for consequences. But could these actually be the cries for help of a broken man who's had his foundations rocked? Why else would we be told that Wubba Lubba Dub Dub means I am in great pain, please help me in bird person's language? As far as this theory goes, there isn't much denying the fact that in Rick and Morty, Rick is aware that he is, to some extent, a fictional character. Infinite possibilities means just that in a broad sense. But that's all big picture stuff. As far as the more specific sense goes, it's still possible that C-137 Rick hasn't quite achieved full self-awareness. It's entirely possible that he hasn't discovered that whatever universe Mr. Poopy Butthole is in has Rick and Morty as a TV show. We've never seen this realization play out on screen, so there's always the distinct possibility that C-137 Rick just doesn't know. One thing though is that if Rick is self-aware, the idea of himself obsessing over his own life is kinda weird. And not just because he sometimes has the world's shortest attention span. In Rick's D Minutes, he chides Jerry, Beth, and Summer for being so self-absorbed and only wanting to watch alternate reality versions of themselves, while he and Morty, however, happily watch whatever their interdimensional cable system has cooked up for them. Isn't that crazy? In both Rick's D Minutes and Interdimensional Cable 2, they were always just one channel flip away from Adult Swim's Rick and Morty. I like to imagine that if they came across it, a scene like the one in Spaceballs would happen. What about the business we touched on before, where Rick's actions could be a cry for help? Well, how Rick operates can be... 
interesting. I mean, he has no regard for consequences or the feelings of others, as he just goes off and does whatever he wants. You could argue that the reason he doesn't care is because if he does something horrible enough, he could just hop universes and start all over again. Like he's done before in Rick Potion number 9 and Lord knows how many times before that. But that's not necessarily true. He says at the end of the episode, we can't do this every week, we've only got three or four more of these tops. Which opens up a whole other can of worms about the finiteness of the infinite possibilities constantly brought up in the show. But for our purposes today, it's just not always a viable option for him. So why does he act like this? If you knew your life was a TV show, would you do the things that Rick does? It's impossible for me to say, but since you still have things like morals and self-preservation skills, your answer would probably be no. I hope. I hope you still have these things. You should, they're good things to have. But these are, of course, things Rick lacks. Could it be that his confidence under moments of stress is because Rick knows he'll always make it out for the next episode? Is it possible that he already knows how it's all going to end, granting him the freedom to do whatever he wants? At times it seems like if he is aware, he's actively trying to break the show that is his life by doing the outlandish things that he does. Kind of like an interdimensional Truman show. It seems like the season 2 finale would be one of the only ways for the show to end solely on C-137 Rick's turn. But the one big thing to remember here is that the motivations behind Rick's actions don't necessarily have to do with him achieving a sense of self-awareness. The amount of things that he's seen and done in his life would desensitize anyone to just about everything. That we can say for sure. But it certainly wouldn't help if you knew that everything you did was just a TV show in other universes. Rick believes he acts under free will, but Rick and Morty has a writing staff, animators, voice actors, everything that would suggest the opposite. It would throw Rick's perception of everything he's ever known out of order, unknowing of what's real and what isn't. There are a few ways that Rick could choose to cope with this situation. On one of many hands, he could embrace this, knowing that everything is predetermined and just taking comfort in it. But C-137 Rick, in true Rick fashion, chooses a more nihilist approach. This philosophy is most closely associated with German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who described nihilism as, again, in the broadest possible strokes, abandonment of both moral values and a belief in an overall purpose in life. To Nietzsche, this would be brought on primarily by the rejection of religious doctrines, which... Yes, Rick has very clearly done that. But based on what Rick's seen, it's pretty undeniable that he would probably show signs of this philosophy on both the moral and existential sides regardless. This mindset isn't necessarily meant to be taken as a downer, though. In fact, a lot of people find this school of thought liberating. If nothing is of any consequence, what's to stop you from doing... anything? Responsibly, it could be a useful tool for self-actualization. But in relation to possibly just being a TV character, Rick approaches the whole idea pretty passively and just sort of rolls with it. Hence the fourth wall jokes and the catchphrases that he busts out pretty frequently. But he also seems to be brought down just as frequently by the sheer amount of unanswerable existential questions that this brings upon him. Hence the meaning behind that previously mentioned catchphrase. And this in turn leads to him mentally retreating, rationalizing everything and forcing himself not to think too hard about things that aren't worth his time. Now, there's no denying that Rick has a brilliant mind, and minds like his tend to want to know the answers to life's greatest questions. We can't be sure if Rick ever wanted that, but what would happen if you were to venture out beyond the final frontier in pursuit of life's greatest answers? Wanting to know what your greater purpose was, and finding out that one of the answers is you say wubba lubba dub dub and belch on TV. How could your first reaction be anything other than what the Butter Robot's reaction was to its purpose? Oh my god. Now there's way more to unpack philosophically with this theory. We've really only scratched the surface and we didn't even talk about all the other schools of thought presented in the show. Furthermore, we still don't know a whole lot about Rick in general, really. But with Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland saying that there may be a secret plot in the works behind the scenes, is it possible we could see Rick deal with the existential crisis of being a cartoon character in later seasons? These are all tough questions, but all in all, I'll have to give the Rick is a nihilist because he's aware he's a fictional character conspiracy. There has to be a better name for that. Four real fake doors out of five. But what about you? Do you think Rick is aware he's a fictional character? And if so, what do you make of the things he does in the show? Do you think he does all this in an effort to keep the show running? Or do you think he might be trying to sabotage the show and get it canceled? Or maybe neither. Maybe he's just doing what he does because that's what he does. <laughs> Life truly is meaningless, and we've all been dealt twos and fours in the poker game of life. Our next episode is one of the more bananas theories we've ever covered on Cartoon Conspiracy, but when the season 3 premiere aired, they asked me to talk about it. So here it is.
So there's this show that people have been talking about, but I don't think I've ever heard of it. I think it's called Brick and Mortar or something? What is this show? Do people watch this show? Are there theories for this show? All right, so unless you live under a rock, you've probably already heard of Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland's amazing reverse April Fool's prank where they actually premiered season three, episode one of Rick and Morty on the one day we all expected a fake out. Oh, who am I kidding? We've all already seen it. And if you haven't, what? You should. Then you can join the rest of us in wanting McDonald's Szechuan sauce to come back, even though the majority of us probably haven't had it, myself included. The real conspiracy will be whether or not McDonald's chooses to bring it back for next year's Mulan film. But we can look into that at a later date. Because today, we'll be looking at a few other elements of this new episode. Because one or two details have made people take another look at Rick and Morty's relationship. Or should I say, Rick and... Also, Rick, does Morty eventually grow up to become his own grandfather? So this theory seems eerily similar to our Over the Garden Wall Steven Universe theory from the other week. Except the differences here are A, we're only going to be looking through the evidence of one show, and B, that show is Rick and Morty, so it's probably going to be a lot more complicated. So what am I talking about? How could I rationalize that Morty could eventually grow up to become Rick? Well, the idea that Rick and Morty are the same person is an idea that's been floating around since the show's premiere because that seems like something that could happen in a show like this. And there have been some instances in this show that have been pointed to as evidence for this idea. First of all, and most similarly, Rick and Morty are both voiced by Justin Roiland and share similar speech patterns. They both stammer a lot, especially when pronouncing W's. Not to mention that the way they talk has got a somewhat looser feel to it. It's got almost an improvisational tone. But apart from the behind the scenes similarities, there's a lot of other stuff we can look at. For instance, Rick's idea of killing the Rick and Morty of another dimension and taking Taking their place in Rick Potion number 9 was significantly more scarring to Morty than it was to Rick. Which implies that Rick has done this many times before. And it could further explain how Rick was able to usurp the role of his own grandfather in the first place. Somewhere far enough down the timeline, Morty slash... Let's call our hypothetical Morty who eventually grows up to be Rick, Rick Prime. Rick Prime would just have to murder Morty's original grandfather and then take his place. And from that point, we've only seen alternate universes where this chain of events or something similar already happened. Which is why we've only seen Rick as Morty's grandfather in the central finite curve as opposed to whoever Morty Prime's original grandfather was. But again, moving away from the infinite yet limited amount of universes this show presents us with, the season three premiere also gives us some pretty thought-provoking tidbits as well. In the episode titled The Rick Shank Rick Demption, great naming scheme by the way for all of your episodes, it's a plus. Rick shows Cornvelius Daniel his origin story in great detail, showing us not only a younger, more optimistic Rick, but also his family. In this flashback, Rick mentions offhand that he used to wear blue pants, which in a moment as dire as it was, is a weird thing to focus on. Obviously, it could just be interpreted as a quick gag, acknowledgement of something just drearily mundane in a wild scenario. But some people are taking it as a subtle hint that Rick and a certain other character who wears blue pants might share a bit more in common than we once thought. On top of that, in that same flashback, we're shown one Diane Sanchez, supposedly Rick's wife. And some have pointed out that Diane bears a striking resemblance to someone we've seen in the past. That's right, it's Annie from Anatomy Park. And in a convenient Convenient coincidence, Annie is one of the only other characters in the show we've ever seen Morty get particularly close with. However, apart from the obvious, like their different names, there are definitely some problems with assuming that Annie and Diane are the same person. Which we will be getting to soon, so just stay your YouTube commenting fingers for just a couple of minutes. While we're still on the subject of the new episode, there was also one site we were granted when Summer and Morty were brought to the Citadel of Ricks. In the moment they arrive, we see a Morty seemingly unaccompanied by a Rick, but instead dressed as Rick, hair and all. On the surface, this looks like it could once again just be a random visual gag, not unlike the Mortys we see a few seconds later that look like Dipper and Mabel from Gravity Falls. But if we take a look at this Morty, his skin tone differs from most of the other Mortys we've met. His skin tone is actually more in line with Rick's, which may suggest that this is actually a young Rick, in the middle of his transition from Morty to Rick. I mean, after all, he is wearing blue pants. I mean, at a 
surface glance, all of this does kind of make sense to a degree. Rick does have some massive self-loathing issues, which would explain why he's so harsh to Morty. And Morty is clearly on the route to becoming massively desensitized to the unforgiving nature of the multiverse. Much like Rick has been for a, as of yet, undisclosed amount of time. But one of the big, lasting questions here is how could Morty be so smart to eventually grow up to become Rick? Because Morty's not exactly, uh, how do I put this delicately? naturally gifted. He is Jerry's son, after all. Well, it all comes back again to Season 1, Episode 1. When Rick is convincing Morty to put the Mega Seeds, which grants super intelligence, way up inside his butt, Rick says he can't do it himself because he's done it so many times before that they would just fall out, which just provides some horrifying mental imagery. But if Rick has been smuggling these seeds for as long as he says he's been, could the first time he smuggled them have been when he was younger? When his grandfather convinced him to smuggle them through interdimensional customs? If Morty kept ingesting the mega seeds, it could explain how an older Morty would have the brain capacity to do the things that would eventually lead to him becoming Rick Prime, eventually culminating in him killing his own grandfather and taking his place to set this whole chain of events into motion once again. Did you stay those YouTube commenting fingers? Because right now we're going to talk about the most pressing issue with this theory that I have not addressed yet. Rick's story about himself in the Rick Shank Rick Demption is revealed to be a complete fabrication. So we can't be sure if any of it was real, or if it was just what Rick projected to make the story seem more convincing. Though since according to Cornvelius Daniel, you're unable to change the details of a memory, it stands to reason that none of what we saw in Rick's flashback was truthful. Of course, in our real world, the details of our memories change all the time, which actually makes our own memories super unreliable. Think back to the earliest memory you ever had. Chances are, it probably never happened. Scary, right? But Cornvelius Daniel's use of the word memory seems to refer less to the subjective view of events of which your perception is constantly changing, but more as a fixed point in time with hard facts that are irrefutable. So based on all that, not only can we not confirm Diane Sanchez's appearance, we can't even confirm that she even existed. We can't even be sure if that's what Rick used to look like. For all we know, he could have been the spitting image of Morty. At this point, any evidence that relates to Rick and Morty being the same person based on this flashback is impossible to confirm or deny. But there is a very heavy skew towards the deny column. The one detail that seems to stick out from this emotionally charged scene is Rick's comment about blue pants. It's such an innocuous thing, why mention it at all? A well-known tactic in Bad Liars is that they'll often try to fill in extra details to make their story seem more believable, when in reality the inclusion of these small details makes the story sound rehearsed. If one of your friends were late to meet you, which one of these excuses would you be more likely to believe? Them saying, Sorry, traffic was brutal. Or them saying, Sorry, I know I took forever, but like, you know, traffic just took a really long time and there was this really old person who was trying to cross the street and they were just taking forever because they had this umbrella that just kept getting caught in the wind and then I was just sitting in my car. We all know exactly what you're doing, Eric, you inconsiderate. Rick, being the subverter of every trope known to man, must be aware of this rookie mistake. So why would he try to force such a meaningless detail as blue pants to make his story more believable to Cornvelius Daniel? That's not the genius Rick we know. Daniel would have believed anything he showed him anyway. So based on these assumptions, which they admittedly are assumptions, he would have to be telling the truth about the blue pants because what would be the purpose otherwise? I'm talking like from a grander story perspective here. What would be the significance? We know that the... I'm gonna call him the Rick Morty from the season three premiere also wears blue pants as well as most other Mortys. But you know who else wears blue pants? A ton of people. In fact, way more than a ton of people. A ton of people is not that many people. Not the least of which both Beth and Jerry. What if Rick and Jerry are the same person? So can we really be confident in saying that Rick's admission that he used to wear blue pants is evidence of him and Morty being the same person? Well, not really. Now, moving away from the season premiere, while the whole thing of the speech patterns is a curious similarity within the context of the show's universe, you could just as easily write it off. I mean, Rick and Morty, even if they aren't the same person, are still related after all. And on top of that, when you spend enough time with a certain person, you begin to adopt certain mannerisms from them, which to a large degree includes speech. And of all the people in the family, Rick and Morty definitely spend the most time with each other. So this doesn't actually seem 
seem all that weird. As for the Mega Seed theory, the idea that Morty could use these seeds to further his own intelligence, well, that has its own share of problems. First, since we haven't really seen Morty indulge in these seeds since the pilot, it would mean that any events which would lend him the intelligence to eventually become Rick in the future would have had to have happened after everything we've seen in the series. Which, to be fair, isn't a deal breaker here. We have no idea how long the series will go. That's my series arc, the Morty! Hell? If it takes nine seasons, I want my McNugget dipping sauce, about, Szechuan man? sauce, Morty! Okay, well, we have some idea. But maybe after the series run, Morty could start regularly ingesting Mega Seeds. It could happen. But there's also the matter of the brain ceasing multiple functions after a few hours of the seeds dissolving in Morty's body. It seems like the only way to stop this from happening would be if Rick Prime were constantly drinking the seed juice from some sort of flask or something. If only there was another theory that covered that more in depth. Unfortunately, if the only thing we can turn to substantiate one of our theories is another one of our theories, that doesn't really hold water. Or juice. And with all the talk of Rick and Morty being the same person and a major catalyst in this weird, ridiculous, infinite time loop, I just have another quick point that I need to get off my chest. If this theory is true, my god, how messed up would Rick Prime's family be? Beth would be both his mother and his daughter, Summer would be his sister and his granddaughter, Jerry would still just be Jerry, and Morty would be his own grandfather, like Philip J. Fry. And it would only be slightly less weird than what Fry did to reach the same result. And actually, there is one more thing that makes all of this iffier. And of course, it's timelines because timelines ruin everything. If Morty grew up into Rick Prime, destroyed his own universe through some chain of events, hopped universes like he's previously done in Rick Potion number 9, and then killed his original grandfather to take his place, this causes just a bunch of problems. Why would Rick Prime choose to become Morty's grandfather rather than just killing that universe's version of himself like he's done in the past? How would Rick Prime have convinced Beth that he was actually her father? Maybe he brainwashed her with one of his infinite gadgets? And if he instead did this before Beth was born to sidestep the whole issue, would that universe's Morty even be born to begin with? It's kind of like the dead grandfather paradox. Only instead of going back in time to kill your grandfather, you did it across multiple universes and then took his place. Okay, so it's not entirely the same thing, but depending on how far back in time Rick Prime would have gone in order to accomplish this, it could be comparable. Here's the thing with this theory, as well as a bunch of other theories for this show. Narratives that take place across multiple timelines and universes are absolute beasts. And yet, Rick and Morty manages to keep many elements of its narrative intact, often drawing attention to the particularly important elements, like the Rick and Morty buried in the backyard and the Cronenberg universe. But much of the time, since this show takes place across a massive variety of universes, Rick and Morty seems to take things like timeline issues or time paradox and just adopt its own absurdist philosophy, which is basically, meh, f it, just cause a lot of carnage across multiple universes and don't think about it too much. Nothing really matters anyway, unless it's to serve our own Rick and Morty. This philosophy is even illustrated in Rick's day-to-day -day complete disregard for every other conceivable universe. With the virtually infinite Ricks and Mortys we've seen throughout the series, any consideration of things like timeline paradoxes seems almost laughable. We have practically no choice but to take what we see in the show at face value, and only really deem worth to the slices of continuity that were given. Like the aforementioned Cronenberg universe and Bird Person, I mean Phoenix Person's post credit sequence of the season 3 premiere. Basically, I'm just washing my hands of trying to hard science this show. Please understand. Does that mean there's nothing to be inferred from certain hints we see in the show? Of course not, that Morty dressed like Rick is still a big unanswered question in all of this. But for a great deal of the other evidence in today's theory, there are a few too many holes for us to confidently say that Rick and Morty might actually be a redundant title. With all that in mind, I'm going to rate the plausibility of Rick and Morty being the same person one packet of McDonald's Mulan Szechuan sauce out of five. But maybe I'm wrong on this one. What do you think? Do you think Morty could eventually grow up to be Rick, raising a Morty of his own? How do you think the show would go about revealing something like that? And of course, what discontinued fast food item do you want to come back more than any other? So by now you're probably...
That made a louder noise than I thought it was going to. So by now, you're probably getting sick of my big stupid face, which first of all, ouch, but second of all, thanks for your dedication for actively watching this entire video. But before we go back to me throwing to other videos of me, here's an episode from the before time, the long, long ago when Evil Morty had only appeared on the show once before, as opposed to now, two and a half years later, where Evil Morty has appeared twice. It's not me, it's Emily. Here's, here's an Emily episode. Take it away, Emily. With the newest season underway, it's easy to say that Rick and Morty has quickly become one of the best adult animated shows on TV right now. Not only is it totally hilarious and mostly improvised, it's got a surprisingly deep and complex plot. And naturally, with any show involving time travel or dimension hopping, several theories have come up about alternate realities. But this one is probably the biggest. Is the Morty we know and love not Rick's first Morty? Could Rick's original Morty actually be evil Morty? For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, Rick and Morty is an adult swim show created by Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon. The show follows the crazy misadventures of super scientist and alcoholic Rick, who comes to live with his daughter's family after skipping out on them 20 years ago. Rick immediately bonds with his wimpy teenage grandson, Morty, and recruits him to be the Marty McFly to his Doc Brown. Rick and Morty spend their days traveling through alternate dimensions and universes, usually causing more harm than good. Rick's backstory is crazy, confusing, and most notably, very vague. We have almost no idea of what Rick was doing before he returned to the Earth dimension of C-137. So naturally, this sparked a lot of conspiracies in the Rick and Morty fandom. This particular theory stems from the episode Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind, in which Rick and Morty are accused of crimes against alternate Ricks, where they are then arrested and taken through an interdimensional portal to the Council of Ricks, which is made up of every Rick from every dimension with their own unique Morty. The pair spends the majority of the episode trying to find out who is killing off these Ricks to kidnap their Mortys. At the end of the episode, it's revealed that Evil Rick, who was their main suspect, was actually being controlled by Evil Morty. Now, who is Evil Morty really? And how has one Morty, out of infinite realities and universes, become a hyper-intelligent mastermind with a deep hatred for Ricks? Especially the Rick we know from Dimension C-137. Why, out of infinite Ricks, does he pick this Rick to frame for his crimes, download his brain contents, and then murder? Well, it could be that Evil Morty was Rick C-137's original Morty. This would explain why Evil Morty has such a personal vendetta against Rick. But Evil Morty is like straight up evil. What could have happened to him that made him want to murder all of the Ricks in all of the universe? Well, some believe that Evil Morty, or Rick's original Morty, was abandoned, which we can actually see in the show's title sequence. Yeah, in that quick second, Rick jumps into a portal and Morty is left to fend for himself in an unknown dimension, building up quite possibly the biggest grudge ever against his grandfather. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you realize that at the beginning of the series, it stated that Rick has been absent from his family for 20 years, and Morty is only 14. So there's no way Rick could have any memories of this Morty. But in close Rick counters of the Rick kind, we see Rick get teary-eyed over a memory of Morty as a baby. How is that possible if he never knew him as a baby? Unless it was a different Morty. A Morty he left on some planet many, many years ago. Another idea suggests that Evil Morty is actually the reason Rick constantly berates this Morty. It kind of seems like he's purposefully making Morty stupid. Because in the dimension where Rick was probably a good grandfather, he taught Morty too much making Morty too smart and too cocky, ultimately transforming him into evil Morty. So could the Morty we know and love actually just be a replacement? And could Rick's original Morty be out to erase all Ricks from existence? With a show that has dozens of different universes and multiple dimensions, a conspiracy like this might be tough to solve, but thankfully, this isn't our first rodeo. The theory of this Morty being version 2.0 isn't entirely impossible. 
Towards the end of close Rick counters of the Rick kind, Rick says, Bad things happen with a cocky Morty. I'll tell you when you're older. And then it cuts to Evil Morty. So it seems more likely that Evil Morty, Rick's original Morty, is the baby in Rick's memory. It's possible that the guilt from what he did to Evil Morty many years ago, what ultimately turned this Morty evil, is what made Rick tear up. It also explains why Rick got so emotional when Evil Rick said all Mortys are replaceable. Because to this Rick, they definitely aren't. It's funny, for being such a crude show, this theory is actually really sweet. And with the newest season well underway, I think we still have a lot to learn about the crazy Rick and Morty universe. So, on the plausibility meter, I give the Rick and Morty conspiracy four Aberdolf Linklers out of five. Anybody notice there's a fire over there? Two and a half years after Emily gave us her take on Evil Morty, we decided to revisit the idea as well as a couple of other theories about Evil Morty because we felt like it. And that did not sound nearly as epic or authoritative as it did when I wrote it, but here it is. I don't need to reintroduce Rick and Morty, right? Adult Swim Show, created by Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, Crazy Interdimensional Travels, we're all on the same page here, right? So as you may recall, we've taken a look at, uh, a handful of theories that cover the spectrum of just how chaotic this show can be. But among all of them, there is one theory that's worth revisiting with the upcoming season. And that's concerning the identity of the evil Morty in close Rick counters of the Rick kind. He was quite the departure from the general idea of Morty that we've come to accept. But other than a Morty, obviously, who is this? What could his intentions be? And most importantly, will he finally make his return in season three? So, because this is Rick and Morty, and because a lot of details can get lost in the shuffle, let's approach this pragmatically and first establish everything that we know. And let's start with what we can infer from the one, the only, Evil Morty. Or Eyepatch Morty, as some people call him for... I don't know, some stupid reason. It's in Close Rick Counters where it's revealed that Evil Morty was actually remotely controlling Evil Rick, so we can pretty much discount Evil Rick entirely and attribute all of his words and actions to Evil Morty. However, we can also be pretty confident in saying that Evil Morty and Evil Rick probably don't share any other connection. You know, like Evil Morty being Evil Rick's... Morty. How can we be so sure? There are a couple of reasons, but most prevalent is that Evil Morty appeared to view Evil Rick as just means to an end. Also, because of the blending in with the Rickless Mortys, we can be confident in saying that Evil Morty is a Rickless Morty and has been one for quite some time. Since Mortys are a virtually infinite resource to Ricks, there isn't really any reason for most Ricks to pursue a Morty for too long before giving up and reapplying for a new Morty to be assigned to them. But notice how I said most Ricks? Well, that's because there's at least one Rick that may care more about Morty than he actually lets on. And that's our hero, good old Rick from Dimension C-137. On second thought, good old is really not the descriptor I should be using for him. So we know that C-137 Rick cares a mite more about his Morty than a lot of other Ricks do, since he tears up at viewing memories of Morty in close Rick counters. But he also seems to be the Rick who is the most uncompromising in his beliefs when compared to all of the Ricks in the central finite curve, with his tenuous relationship with the Council of Ricks being the primary source for that claim insert clip of the Council of Ricks being destroyed by C-137 Rick here. But even at the end of Close Rick Counters, Rick doesn't grant Morty any sort of positive reinforcement as he doesn't believe Morty will gain anything from it, further illustrating just how set in his ways that Rick is, whether others like it or not. So with that preliminary information in mind, we're next going to establish what I'm going to call the Rick and Morty relative alignment spectrum, or Ram Ramras for short although we're probably never going to call it that. We'll be referring to this chart throughout this video to hopefully give us a bit of insight on the nature of different iterations of Rick and Morty. As revealed once again in Close Rick Counters, Ricks use Mortys as camouflage. This is because their brainwave patterns perfectly cancel each other out, effectively making them diametrically opposed foes. And based on Rick and Morty's conversations in Close Rick Counters, their two respective defining character traits seem to be related to intelligence and empathy. We can relatively easily place most incarnations of Rick and Morty on a four-way spectrum consisting of these two axes. On the x-axis, we have a spectrum ranging from Rick's super intelligence to Morty's Morty brainwaves, while on the y-axis, we have Morty's empathy at the top and Rick's cold, uncompromising outlook at the bottom. Obviously, given the infinite possibilities of Rick and Morty, a study of a 
couple dozen Ricks and Mortys would probably result in a scatter plot that looks something like this. But there are a few extremes that may be important to figuring out who exactly Evil Morty could be. Firstly, in the bottom right, the most uncompromising and the most intelligent, the Rickest Rick, is arguably our good friend C-137 Rick. If for no other reason than he self-identified himself as the Rickest Rick in Rick Counters. Perfect. And just as Rick says, it should go without saying that the Rickest Rick should have the Mortiest Morty. So we can place the Morty we follow through most of the show at the opposite extreme, possessing the standard Morty waves as well as displaying the most empathy of all Mortys. And just to quickly fill out the other extremes, the oddest Rick out that we've met so far would obviously be the Rick from Universe J19 Zeta 7, who we'll from now on just refer to as Doofus Rick. After all, he's a total outcast from all of the other Ricks for seemingly no other reason than he's just more empathetic to other people, especially Jerry, which, like, why? No wonder he's weird. But since Doofus Rick appears to, oddly, still be a genius capable of interdimensional travel, he's still intelligent, which would comfortably place him in the top right corner, earning the title of the Mortiest Rick. As for our missing corner here, seems like a cold, uncompromising Morty who still possessed a Morty brainwave pattern would fit comfortably there. So are we good to assume that evil Morty is, in fact, the Rickest Morty? And before we go any further, yes, I'm aware of how problematic this chart can be for a show whose core concept is about infinite parallel universes. But the show doesn't seem to concern itself much with this problem, so we won't either. Yes, there are practically infinite Ricks, but for all intents and purposes, there has to be a limit. After all, we still don't even know what the limitations of the central finite curve even are, so there's no sense dwelling on it. Okay, with all of this preliminary stuff taken care of, let's get to some theories about Evil Morty. Three of them, to be exact. And from there, we might be able to determine if Evil Morty is poised to come back in Season 3. Okay, we're a bit all over the place right now, but before we dive any deeper, it's important to keep in mind that taking literally anything in Rick and Morty at face value is kind of an exercise in futility. So all we can really do is speculate. Alright, now with that in mind, let's get rolling. First up, one theory that surfaced is that Evil Morty could actually be Doofus Rick's Morty, given how completely opposite they are to both each other, as well as our general perception of Rick and Morty, this seems like a pretty good idea. And that's not even factoring in that both characters were introduced in the same episode. And if we refer to the Ramraz, Oh my god, we actually used the name. Seems like Evil Morty and Doofus Rick would cancel each other out and fill out the main four corners of our spectrum, so slam dunk, right? Well, no. It never is, you should know this by now. The massive problem with this is that Doofus Rick mentions to Jerry that he never had any kids. And to counter this, some fans have theorized that just as Doofus Rick is a Rick without a Morty, maybe Evil Morty is a Morty without a Rick. But that's more difficult to justify because that's not how time or genetics works. Not every Rick needs a Morty, but every Morty would probably need a Rick. I mean, unless they were a clone, in which case this theory could still work, but that's a whole other can of worms that we honestly don't have time for today. Another idea concerning Doofus Rick is that maybe he and Evil Morty were originally a normal Rick and Morty who had their consciousness swapped for some unspecified reason, most likely to hide Rick from the Council of Ricks. After all, what better Morty camouflage is there other than actually being a Morty? And as of the Rick Shank Rick Demption, we know that this technology exists and can be used without any ill effects. So it's definitely an interesting idea. However, it doesn't quite explain a lot of things. Like why Evil Morty feels that he needs to kill other Ricks to gain power. Or why Doofus Rick, if he's a Morty in the body of a Rick, would decide to continue this act long after he was abandoned by Evil Morty. And that's under very little scrutiny. Given more time, there's probably a lot more threads that don't quite add up. Next up, we have the theory that regardless of who Evil Morty is, he set off on a Rick kill rampage in order to free other Mortys of the oppression that they endure. And honestly, regardless of who Evil Morty is, that's not the craziest idea. For the purposes of this theory, it doesn't really matter who Evil Morty originally belonged to, but regardless, it would serve to make any other theory about Evil Morty way more interesting. Also, funnily enough, Evil Morty would essentially be setting himself up as the savior of the Church of the Good Morty, being the one Morty to rise up and deliver all Mortys from their oppressors. If he were to lead a revolution against the Ricks, it would stand to reason that all followers of the religion would rally behind him. Look at how quickly they stood behind the Morty we follow throughout the show in close 
close rate counters. However, if this were the case, Evil Morty doesn't seem to have any problem oppressing other Mortys as long as it's for his benefit. Case in point, the protective wall of Mortys. Granted, puppeteering a Rick throughout Rick counters would require him to employ some diabolical Rick-like tactics, but it's still a point worth mentioning. Though it can be easily waved away by, well, you know, he was undercover. You can't make a god complex omelet without breaking a few Mortys. I just realized I was super mocking there, but you could actually wave all of that away with that exact logic. But finally, we're going to examine one more theory which has a bit more for us to bite into. And this is that Evil Morty is actually C-137 Rick's original Morty. But notice how I'm not saying that he's Morty C-137? This is because Rick's original Morty is not C-137 Morty. By the way, if this theory sounds familiar, it's because we've briefly looked at it before in an earlier cartoon conspiracy. But there are some additional details that make this theory a bit meatier that we're going to take a look at right now. We never hear our Morty mention anything about originating from a dimension that was anything other than the now Cronenberg C-137. And usurping the positions of the Rick and Morty of the dimension that they currently occupy was pretty scarring to him. So seeing as these all seem to be new experiences for him, this would make our Morty unquestionably C-137 Morty. As we know, since Beth has mentioned it no less than 400 times, Rick left her family quite some time ago before recently coming back. Most fans have come to accept that Rick was gone for about 20 years, but it's never specifically stated in the show. Though we can definitely assume that it's longer than Morty has been alive. So we have all of this time in Rick's life that's just unaccounted for. So, and here's the million dollar question, what was he doing? Actually, let's answer that question with another question. How did Evil Morty get to be so intelligent? 99.9% .9 of all other Mortys his age are of about the same intelligence. That is to say, nowhere near Rick's ability. But Evil Morty is consistently way more clever than normal. And how else could this be accomplished unless he, at one point, spent an inordinate amount of time with a Rick who taught him from a very young age? And I forget, which Rick has very vivid memories of a young Morty again? Oh, that's right, C-137 Rick. Not to mention the photo of Rick holding a baby Morty in Bird Person's home. So let's entertain this thought just a little bit longer. Let's assume that C-137 Rick actually raised his original Morty, but then screwed the kid up, causing him to then return to Dimension C-137 to raise his... original... Morty? Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Unless, of course, C-137 Rick isn't actually from Dimension C-137. By turning our thinking around, may I present to you the best possible- No, I immediately retract that, I don't want that kind of pressure. A possible explanation for the origins of Evil Morty. Meticulously crafted from some evidence, assumption, and a lot of speculation. In an unknown dimension, Dimension X, our Rick, C-137 Rick, raises his original Morty to be just like himself, but goes a little too far. Over the course of several years, this young Morty is slowly corrupted and eventually desensitized to all aspects of interdimensional travel, including the disposability of Mortys themselves. This, combined with the intelligence gain, displaces this Morty from the natural order and makes him essentially equal with our Rick, and that's a situation which obviously won't end well. This Morty, now Evil Morty, inevitably turns on Rick, which results in the two parting ways under less than amicable terms. Rick flees to a dimension in which Beth's father left and died, or left and never returned, to assume the role of that universe's Rick to try all over again with a fresh new Morty. And this dimension is Dimension C-137. C-137 could be a dimension in which the original C-137 Rick had already died, leaving our Rick to take his place, like in Rick Potion number 9. Based on his actions in that episode, it seems like he's done this before. This would explain why Rick still pushes Morty to chase scientific pursuits. Rick may have screwed up with his original Morty, but he uses these mistakes to teach a new Morty more responsibly. It's slightly more responsibly. It also explains a couple of other niggling questions, like why exactly Evil Morty would go after C-137 Rick in the first place. I know he says it's because of his evil factor in his evil database so that he can kill him and then gain his knowledge, but honestly, just vengeance for his mistreatment of his original Morty is more than an acceptable motive. After all, we do see a memory of a Morty being electrified who could very well be Rick's original Morty, so it's not like C-137 Rick's hands are clean, really. It would also explain 
explain Rick's welling up when he sees his memories of baby Morty. Rick's not one to admit his regrets easily, but this would definitely be something he could feel genuine remorse for. And finally, the biggest piece of evidence that links C-137 Rick to evil Morty is the exchange held at the end of Rick Counters. Rick tells Morty not to let anything get to his head, because a Morty that gets too cocky can cause problems and be a real bad thing for everybody. On top of Rick sounding like he was speaking from experience, he also tells Morty that he'll explain more when he's older. From there, the episode cuts to literally what evil Morty was doing. Basic film language would dictate that ending a scene on an unanswered question and then cutting to a seemingly unrelated scene would denote meaning between the two. A cut like that generally foreshadows or implies a connection between the two events. Granted, with Harmon and Roiland at the helm here, they could be intentionally burying the lead because that's what they do. But traditional conventions do support C-137 Rick and Evil Morty having a strong connection. Based on the evidence we've seen, it looks like Evil Morty being C-137 Rick's original Morty would be the most likely and most dramatic answer to who exactly Evil Morty is. As for whether he'll return in Season 3, with just how much from the past was called back to in the first episode of Season 3, like Phoenix Person and the Cronenberg Universe, it looks like Season 3 will largely be a season for revisiting unresolved plot threads. And Evil Morty is one of the biggest, so I would rate the plausibility of Evil Morty revealing himself to be C-137 Rick's original Morty and returning this season 3.5 vouchers for a free replacement Morty out of 5. But this is Rick and Morty, and everybody and their mom has theories about it. So let's open up the floor. What do you think? Who do you think Evil Morty slash Eyepatch Morty really is? Do you think he's going to show up in Season 3, or do you think that that plot thread is just going to be left dangling, just tantalizing us with possibilities? I'm not trying to accomplish anything, I just like poking fires. I almost died. About two months after that episode aired, Evil Morty actually did come back in the show, so chalk one up to us for calling it. But ever since that episode, we started getting messages from people asking us what we thought was going to happen with Evil Morty, and uh, oh boy, it's uncomfortable. A couple of weeks ago on Cartoon Conspiracy, we found ourselves diving into Rick and Morty's The Ricklantis mix-up to dissect the bubbling tension within the Citadel of Rick's, as well as the oppressive environment therein. And today, we're bringing you what is pretty much part two of this theory. And while we are going to revisit some discussion about the Citadel, our main focus today, of course, is our boy, Evil Morty. By the way, this is a Rick and Morty episode, so if you still somehow aren't caught up on Rick and Morty, there are going to be some pretty major Season 3 spoilers in this video. But yes, since we last took a look at the perpetual mystery that is Evil Morty, not only has he returned, but he's also become the new democratically elected leader of the Citadel of Ricks, which is a interesting path for Evil Morty to take. I think we can safely say none of us were expecting this moment, especially since it was kind of just shoved into the middle of the season, as opposed to leaving it at the end for some sort of epic, mind-blown cliffhanger thing. But while that reveal was pretty shocking, it's kind of hard to know what to think about it, since we know so little about Evil Morty, much less his M.O. or his end goal. So today, that's what we're gonna try to figure out. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and let's examine the enigma that is the inner machinations of Evil Morty's mind to figure out what exactly is his plan for the Citadel of Ricks. Let's first take a look at Evil Morty within the context of the show as a whole, as well as within the context of the Ricklantis mix-up. And from there, we'll dig a little deeper into his plans. One of the overall themes of Season 3, driven home by the season finale, seems to be what Rick has been saying since the very beginning. Which is that A, nothing matters, and B, the answer to whatever question you have is don't think about it. With Season 3 stretching to re-establish the status quo that Seasons 1 and 2 seem to be edging away from. While it doesn't completely discount some of the unanswered questions of the show, it's quick to remind us that once Rick explained his philosophy to Beth, the fact that Beth used her choice to embrace what she already has is just as valid as Rick's disdain and apathy towards the same situation. Any satisfaction we may take from our lives or the choices that we make is directly dependent on how we choose to perceive them. Which honestly could also say a lot about how Rick and Morty is received by the public as a whole. But of course, that's not gonna fly with us today. While this show definitely plays fast and loose with the idea of continuity, the show absolutely 
absolutely maintains little vertical slices of story that we're constantly reminded of. Things like Tammy's role, Phoenix Person, who is currently MIA, the Cronenberg C-137 universe, and of course, the Citadel of Ricks. So as we take a look at the Ricklantis mix-up, let's examine Evil Morty through a few different lenses. First, how did he gain his popularity? Second, what were his immediate actions upon gaining power? And third, could knowing Evil Morty's ideology allow us to better understand his actions? And before we get started, it's worth noting that Evil Morty's actions may or may not be tied to his true identity. And while we did come to the conclusion that Evil Morty could be the Rick that we follow throughout the show's original Morty, this has never been confirmed, so we're going to sidestep this for now. For all intents and purposes today, Evil Morty is just a Rickless Morty with an unknown agenda. So how was Evil Morty able to use the Citadel's politically fragile state to his own advantage. Well, what does that even mean? In what way could the Citadel be considered politically fragile? Firstly, it seems like Evil Morty's most fundamental step in his playbook is to cater to those who are marginalized by the rest of society. Mortys are often seen as second-class citizens and have a pretty strong bias against them in the Citadel, as evidenced by one of the Citadel's primary news sources openly mocking the Morty Party at the beginning of the episode. The newscasters vastly underestimate the Morty Party's potential, going so far as to insinuate that Evil Morty looks a adorable simply playing politics as opposed to posing an actual threat. Another factor of Evil Morty's strategy can be seen on the whiteboard behind the initial conversation between Evil Morty and his campaign manager. We see a whiteboard that cites Divided Citadel as an aspect of the Morty advantage. So it seems like a big part of Evil Morty's strategy is to also cater to those Ricks who feel marginalized by other Ricks who are placed higher in the social hierarchy for seemingly arbitrary frivolous reasons. Evil Morty also appears to be the only candidate who brings up the issue of the Citadel facing a systemic problem from the top down, rather than the other way around, as most Ricks seem content to see the issue. While the majority of Ricks see their society crumbling because of vagrant homeless Mortys and disgruntled Ricks, Evil Morty brings to light that these are all symptomatic of the real problem, which is those at the top who are content with the current system that, whether it means to or not, only strengthens the divide between the disenfranchised and the entitled. And Evil Morty takes it upon himself to be that voice for the voiceless. He tells the metaphorical 1% that their days are numbered, and the revolution is coming for them. D democratically, he means. For now. And like we mentioned a few weeks ago, there's also the factor that the Citadel is an absolutely soul-crushing environment. On top of all the systemic problems already mentioned, this is a world where the feeling of toppling the oppressive machine is itself branded, packaged, and sold as a commodity. This is a world where the mystique of a Morty throwing himself into a wishing portal in the fleeting hope of things improving is immediately ripped away with the reveal that the portal is just a garbage dump. Even if Slick Morty's wish did kind of come true, the reality check we're given seemingly robs his message of its meaning. This kind of environment would also play to those who felt abandoned by the system, and they would probably become more willing to do something to impart actual change. Do something to actually disrupt the system, as opposed to buying that feeling through simple ricks. Do something like vote for a fringe political candidate. As we all know, in the world of politics, talk is cheap. Words are just words, and speeches are for campaigning. And once Evil Morty wins the election, now is the time for action. I just spilled water everywhere. But even before his odd anti-monologue, we do see some changes take effect as a direct result of Evil Morty winning the election, so... What happens? Well, firstly, the new Citadel's codes apparently absolve Cop Rick of everything he did, from being caught up in the warring gangs of Morty Town to killing his own partner. His own partner, a Morty who believed himself to be freer than most other Mortys by leaning into the oppressive nature of the Citadel. But in the end, his own brash outlook of Mortys being the underlying problem of the Citadel eventually caused his downfall. Same old story. Rick's killing Mortys. Evil Morty also immediately abandons the curriculum of the unnamed Morty reform school that we see throughout the episode. And while a rework of the classes is hinted at, all we know right now is that it doesn't seem like these Mortys are going to be assigned any new Ricks anytime soon. And of course, the last thing we see Evil Morty do in this episode is immediately execute all of his dissenters in the Citadel's shadow government as a show of force, which is an interesting detail. In a lot of democratic societies, there are those, you know, actual real conspiracy theorists that suggest that either the country or the world or the universe is 
is actually governed by some sort of ominous shadow government. Which would of course mean that whoever was elected into office doesn't have any actual real power. In the Ricklantis mix-up, this is shown to be 100% entirely the case, even when the Citadel of Ricks was purportedly run by the Council of Ricks. But with Evil Morty's actions at the end of the episode, he is left as the singular, unequivocal ruler of the Citadel. So based on these actions, coupled with his rise to power, can we pin down Evil Morty with any sort of ideology? It's uh, actually a little bit more difficult to do than it seems at first glance since the actual political platforms of each party in the episode aren't very well defined, especially within the Ricks. But in any case, let's see what we can uncover. First off, the rigid class system within the Citadel pretty much uses Morty's as shorthand for the idea of systemic discrimination present in many societies. There's even a short scene where the Mortys are throwing a pride parade to hammer this home. Evil Morty plays not only to these oppressed Mortys, but also to the downtrodden Ricks. Acting as a voice for the common folk who will unite to displace the bourgeois Ricks from their ivory towers. Now, this sort of populist political movement wherein politicians mess with the current social order in the supposed interest of the common people is nothing new. This sort of strategy has been in play for pretty much as long as democratic elections have been. All the way from the disruptiveness of Roman Tribune Publius Claudius Pulcher in the first century BCE, all the way to how populism's marriage with identity politics created symbols on all sides of the political spectrum in last year's presidential election. But that's not where it ends with Evil Morty. While his campaign claims to be for the people, this all seems to dissolve when you actually look at it closely. As we've seen before, while he does choose to be the voice for all of these abandoned Mortys, he's not exactly above exploiting them himself. And I'm not talking about political exploitation. In close recounters, he literally tortures hundreds, thousands of Mortys in order to cloak himself from the Citadel as well as the Rick that we follow throughout the show. So it seems fair to say that Evil Morty doesn't exactly help out his own kind through any sort of empathy. Everything and everyone exists solely to progress his unknown Machiavellian agenda. Evil Morty seems intent right now more than anything else to be the sole undisputed leader of the Citadel. And that actually segues us pretty neatly into the dreaded topic of fascism. Fascism, in its colloquial definition, generally involves practices like silencing dissenters and autocratic dictatorships. Of course, there are way, way more defining characteristics, but these are just a few of them. Fascism is a big umbrella term that encompasses a lot of stuff that we frankly don't have time for today. But even based on those two things that we looked at, Evil Morty seems to be well on his way to establishing some sort of authoritarian dictatorship. Based on his first immediate acts when taking the office of president that didn't seem to be subject for for any approval, as well as his murder of the shadow government? Yeah, that seems to be where we're going with this. Not only that, but going back to the whiteboard during Evil Morty's campaign, we can see a note that lists alternative news sources as another aspect of the Morty advantage, with alternative noticeably in quotation marks. Now, to be fair, there are a few different ways we can interpret that. I mean, we could give Evil Morty the benefit of the doubt and say that he's planning some sort of huge, brand new, unbiased news network. But within dictatorships, the silencing or restriction of certain news media outlets in favor of those that are more acceptable sources is a well-known practice. This strategy, again, has been used throughout history, but it's still used in parts of the world today within certain states that value propaganda above all else. So could Evil Morty's plan for alternative news sources include shutting down the Rick-centric news present in the Citadel in favor of anti-Rick propaganda? But with all of this talk of Evil Morty's ideology and fashion, Fascism, there is one rather large issue. Fascist leaders typically gain power through a rise in rampant nationalism, something that the Citadel should be uniquely free of. What other powers would the Citadel feel the need to feel superior to? There don't seem to be any wavering tensions between the Citadel or any countries or planets or universes or any governing bodies at all. Heck, the whole point of the Citadel is to hide Ricks from all other governing bodies. The Citadel for the moment doesn't even seem all that concerned with the Rick that we follow throughout the show. Even though the last time they crossed paths with him, he took the whole place down. So without a common enemy for the entirety of the Citadel to unite against, what's Evil Morty's plan now? So here's the million dollar question. Why the Citadel? What does Evil Morty have to gain by running the Citadel of Ricks? He seemed to be doing just fine on his own. Well, many theories still hold steadfast that this is all a plan to get back at the Rick that we follow throughout the show, which would make sense if he is indeed our Rick's original Morty. And yes, at first glance, this idea may seem a tad overly simplistic. But Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland seem to revel in subversion, so this idea is totally still on the table. That said, it still does have its share of small problems. While it's true that Evil 
Evil Morty might have a better chance at locating our Rick with the Citadel's resources backing him up, Evil Morty has already been face to face with our Rick. From there, it would seem relatively easy for him to find a way to track our Rick, right? It's a leap in logic, but Evil Morty has more than proven his capability to create a tracking device of that caliber. Furthermore, when Evil Morty actually had our Rick in his clutches, he didn't seem that intent on killing him, despite whatever Evil Rick was actually saying. Knowing how Rick thinks, if he really wanted our Rick dead, he would have spared the theatrics and just done it. So assuming that Evil Morty's goal isn't to exact revenge on our Rick, what are we left with? Well, a common theory about Evil Morty is that the influx of Rickless Mortys in Morty Town and the Morty School is a direct result of the events in close Rick counters of the Rick kind, which would mean that the political unrest that we see in the Citadel would have been a long, calculated con by Evil Morty, stacking the deck in his favor by increasing the Morty population right under the nose of the entire Citadel before the political race even began. Now, ignoring the issue that Evil Morty would have had to have started this long before the Citadel ever became a democracy, why would he feel the need to increase his political power through these displaced Mortys? Based on what we've seen, upending the previous power dynamic was a pretty high priority of Evil Morty. Could Evil Morty's intention simply be to elevate the status of Mortys within the eyes of all Ricks and Mortys? Abandoning the notion that Mortys are forever bound to be the sidekicks of Ricks, a common theme found in the Ricklantis mix-up? Finally, realizing Mortys as their own individuals? Maybe we've been looking at this all wrong. After all, evil is a subjective term. Looking at things from an unbiased perspective, Evil Morty doesn't seem that much worse than the Rick that we follow throughout the show, in that they're both horrible people. I'm not saying that Evil Morty is a saint or anything. But keep in mind, the reason we call him evil is not necessarily because he's evil, it's just because he's an antagonist to our Rick. Besides, Evil Morty's actions might actually be a little less extreme than our Rick. Yes, he may have murdered Ricks and exploited Mortys to climb the political a ladder and a reprehensible display of the ends justifying the means, but so far he still seems at least somewhat intent on pushing some sort of social reform with his newfound political power. And then we have our Rick, who murdered just about everyone in the Citadel before outright destroying the whole thing, as well as the entire economy of the Galactic Federation as means to, above all else, separate Beth from Jerry. Not to mention it was also all in pursuit of that damned Szechuan sauce. When comparing the two, it seems like Evil Morty has a much more structured plan for social reform within the Citadel compared to Rick's general apathy towards literally everything. Evil Morty just happened to go about all of this in one of the most objectively evil ways imaginable. You could probably even make the argument that Evil Morty could be an extension of the dilemma Beth faced in the ABCs of Beth. When faced with how to utilize the opportunities you're given, is it better to make any choice, as Evil Morty does, or no choice, as our Rick seems committed to? Of course, there are issues with this idea, like campaign manager Morty insisting that Evil Morty is up to something much more sinister, as well as the reason for absolving solving Cop Rick of his crimes. I mean, we could speculate that Evil Morty is planning on running the Citadel in a sort of Caesarist fashion, ruling with an iron fist, promoting a violent social order, and pardoning Cop Rick for purging the streets of Mortys who only encourage their negative stereotype. It's all possible, but with the vast amount of unanswered questions, this is all just a projection of what could be. Good God, the Rick Lantis mix-up is so dense. Every single image has so many things going on. But with everything we've taken a look at today, there are so many unanswered questions about Evil Morty and his plans with regards to the marginalized population of the city as well as the Rick that we follow throughout the show. And since we didn't really enter this episode with a hypothesis in mind, we can't really assign this conspiracy a rating, so this week, I'm gonna leave it up to you. How many envelopes filled with secrets out of five do you rate our conclusion that Evil Morty might actually just be looking for equality for Mortys? Do you think that Evil Morty's plans could be something different? Does the name Morty even mean anything anymore? I've said Morty hundreds of times this week. It's, it's just a collection of sounds now. Morty. Our last theory for today is one that we came across doing its rounds on the internet, and I just couldn't resist talking about it because it was so dumb. It was so dumb, and I really wanted to talk about how dumb it was. Okay, that's not entirely fair. No fan theory is truly dumb except for the really dumb ones. But this one just had so many holes, we could not stop ourselves from going after it. And it is, of course, the suicide helmet theory. So let's just jump into it because I've been sitting here for over an hour and I'm getting really tired because this is a lot more exhausting than you think it is. My arm's getting hot. Here's the episode, go.
Well, we've been taking a look at Rick and Morty quite a bit, haven't we? But I mean, we have to. The new season just ended, so we gotta get all of our discussion out there before the inevitable torrential downpour of shit posting that's going to come with this season break. But seriously, with the end of season three, we're all left wondering, what's next for Rick and company? Rick's now been relegated to the lowest status member of the family, even below Jerry, so we might as well just stick Rick in his own personal hell. But even for someone with as many demons as Rick, this might just be the last straw for him. And one theory suggests that Rick has actually been planning to end it all ever since the show first premiered. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to stumble into this incredibly dark theory and try to figure out once and for all, has Rick been building his very own suicide helmet? Yes, I am aware of how weird that last thing I just said was. Suicide helmet? H how does that even work? Helmets are supposed to protect your head. Well, strap in because this one gets pretty gruesome. So throughout the series, we've been treated to several views of Rick's garage, full of his unique gadgets and machinery. But there's one piece of equipment in his garage that's appeared more than a few times. This weird looking helmet thing that looks like a colander with a few boppet appendages sticking out of it. The show has even times shown Rick tinkering with it, most notably at the beginning of Vindicators 3, so it's not like this is some sort of stock asset that the animators use. There's thought put into this helmet, with its first appearance being in the very second episode of the series. At first glance, many people have pointed out that this helmet is probably a throwback to Doc Brown's brainwave analyzer from the Back to the Future films. Which makes sense, because Rick was initially based on Doc Brown. But what kind of fan theory is that? That's not nearly dark enough we have to go deeper. This theory gained traction recently because people started to notice a similarity in design between Rick's helmet and another helmet with strange protrusions that's been making its rounds on the internet lately. As the story goes, the guy who originally posted these photos had a brother-in-law who shadowed a coroner. And during this time, the coroner shared with the brother-in-law the most disturbing thing he's ever seen. Apparently, back in the 60s or 70s, there was a young man who constructed a helmet that was designed to fire eight shotgun shells into his head simultaneously. And this was was made possible by a complex trigger mechanism that the suicidal man designed himself in an amazing show of engineering prowess. And while the credibility of the story is kinda shaky since it's been through the internet machine and basically turned into an urban legend, these photos have endured all that. And this helmet's design bears a lot of similarities to the helmet that we see in Rick's garage. It even has similar appendages sticking out of the top of the helmets. So could Rick be designing his very own version of this so-called suicide helmet? Meticulously crafting a way to end it all in the rickest way imaginable by engineering the means himself? I mean, it's no secret that Rick has a bit of a death wish. Assuming that the Rick we follow throughout the show is the same one, just based on his adventures, Rick has had ample opportunity to die pretty much any time he wants. But of course, so far, he's never actually taken that opportunity. But this is Rick that we're talking about, and Rick seems like the kind of guy who believes that nobody, not even other versions of himself, gets to kill him but him. Philosopher Thomas Zaz wrote on the topic of suicide that it is the ultimate freedom of man. It's the ultimate way for someone to declare ownership of themselves. And for someone like Rick, who is more than aware that infinite versions of himself not only exist, but try to govern his life, the act of suicide would serve as the ultimate middle finger to all of those other Ricks who believe they have any control over him. It would become his one final act of self-destructive rebellion that Rick has become so synonymous with. And pushing all of that aside, there's one more piece of evidence that's always brought up when talking about Rick's death wish. Rick never wears a seatbelt on his ship while Morty is always strapped in. And since this show is very careful with its details and little to nothing is an accident, this is a very interesting detail to consistently animate. And that's pretty much the suicide helmet theory. And while it's incredibly dark and gruesome to imagine that Rick has been secretly planning to kill himself at any moment throughout the entire run of the series, is there anything that could convince us otherwise? Ugh, okay. We got a lot to cover here. First, let's take a look at the helmet's basic design. The helmet doesn't just cover the eyes, it provides lenses so that the wearer can see what they're doing. But given the possible nature of the helmet, wouldn't it make more sense for the helmet to have a consistent shape all the way around just to mitigate any sort of mess that might happen? I mean, not to nitpick someone's suicide for technical reasons, but for something so calculated, if this helmet's purpose is what this theory says it is, 
what's the benefit of having an eyepiece there? Next, just because the helmet has made multiple appearances in the show, that doesn't actually guarantee anything. Case in point, the almost obnoxiously labeled time travel stuff box that has appeared not just in the show on multiple occasions, but also in the VR game Rick and Morty Virtual Rickality. This box is a constant in Rick's garage, but the show has gone out of its way on multiple occasions to reference that they will never do anything relating to time travel. It's actually a pretty funny visual representation of all time travel plots being shelved. But unless the staff does start to do time travel plots, it seems like this box on the shelf is not some sort of Chekhov's gun waiting to go off. And because of that, we can't guarantee the eventual use of Rick's helmet either. But okay, I'll admit that that's not exactly the strongest point. After all, the time travel box is more of a joke, and we've never seen Rick interact with it in the same way that we've seen him interact with this helmet. So, let's examine Rick's death wish a little more closely. While Zaz's writings on suicide can be thought-provoking, the philosophy can just as easily be turned around. Rick lives in a world where the pursuit of meaning in the absence of any sort of higher power is, well, absurd. Say it with me now, nobody exists on purpose, nobody belongs anywhere, everybody's gonna die, come watch TV. And French absurdist philosopher Albert Camus wrote pretty much the opposite of Zaz, saying that suicide was ultimately the rejection of freedom, and that to flee from the chaotic world is not the way out. And instead, one must grab life by its absurdly large balls and just see how long they can hang on. That may or may not be a direct quote from him, I may have paraphrased that last part. But depending on which episode you're watching, this philosophy could totally apply to Rick. So his outlook isn't as clear cut as it might seem. His philosophy, like many others, is complex and contradictory in a lot of areas. And despite all waxing philosophical, there's one more thing here that relates a bit more directly to the suicide helmet theory. We've already seen Rick try to kill himself in one of the most emotional episode endings of the entire series. And what's more, no suicide helmet in sight. Would this not be the time for it to be visible more than any other time, if nothing else for the sake of symbolism? Okay, so moving right along, I want to talk about the seatbelt. Many theorists point to this as some sort of smoking gun that proves that Rick secretly wants to die. Why else would he do something so reckless despite only needing to take five seconds to make his journey so much safer? It's a valid question, but I think I have something a bit more convincing than just immediately assuming that Rick doesn't care if he lives or dies. And what else would it be but the real world? First off, I'll admit that yes, Rick doesn't wear his seatbelt, that much is obvious. But you know who else doesn't wear their seatbelt? My grandparents, and probably yours too. Most of us probably think it's unfathomable and reckless to drive without a seatbelt, which is good because it is. But the thing to keep in mind is that most of us were probably born in the late 80s or the 90s or the 2000s. We grew up with seatbelt laws, but older generations like Rick's just didn't. Seatbelts didn't become mandatory for American car manufacturers until the 1960s. And wearing a seatbelt wasn't made mandatory by law in America until New York passed the first legislation in 1984, which led to every other state passing similar laws, with Maine being the last state to enact mandatory seatbelt legislation on December 26th of 1995. Except New Hampshire, which is the only state to have still not passed any legislation forcing adults to wear seatbelts. What are you guys doing over there? I mean, I know your state motto is live free or die, but you don't have to be so damn literal about it. And all right, I'm just gonna throw a couple more numbers at you real quick. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, in 2013, American seatbelt usage was at 87%. Pretty good, right? Now, take a guess as to what that number was a little over 30 years ago when that first law in New York was passed. Got your guess? Okay, well, I obviously can't predict what exactly your guess was. Was it 27? Well, to all of those who said 27, and also most of the rest of you, you're wrong. It was lower. Way lower. It was only a measly 14%. And to bring this back to Rick and Morty, we know that A, Rick is 70, and B, the Smiths live in Washington state. So if the show takes place in the same time as our world, then that would mean that Rick was 39 years old when these laws were first enacted in Washington in 1986. So combining the facts that Rick didn't grow up with seatbelt laws and the fact that Rick isn't the kind of person to let any government tell him what to do, him not wearing a seatbelt seems a lot more like a grandpa thing and 
not a suicidal thing. The reason his ship has seatbelts in the first place was more likely to accommodate Morty than anything else. And finally, let's come back to this idea that Rick's suicide helmet is actually a throwback to this internet story about the supposed real life suicide helmet. Rick and Morty, more than any other show, seems to have its finger on the pulse of what's popular. Although these days it seems to be setting internet trends rather than referencing them. In any case, thanks to some backwards Google engineering, we found that the suicide helmet story most likely originated on an Imgur thread on November 22nd of 2014. Which of course lines up perfectly with the helmet's first appearance on the show on December 9th of 2013. Huh. Turns out Rick and Morty's helmet actually came a year before the real-life suicide helmet story. Which would make it kind of difficult for the show to reference, especially since, you know, it had to go through the animation pipeline even before it was on TV. The only way for this theory to still be true would be if the writers sort of retroactively decided that Rick's helmet is now a suicide helmet. Or if the staff somehow already knew about this helmet before its rise to prominence on the internet. But even given the incredibly small chance that that is the case, it doesn't really deal with any of of our previous counter arguments which have taken a lot of wind out of the sails of this theory. When examining the idea of Rick's suicide helmet closely, pretty much every aspect of it falls apart rather quickly. This just seems like one of those theories that just goes the extra mile to be dark for the sake of being dark. Which is funny because Rick and Morty is plenty dark already. I mean I can't deny that Rick is at least a bit suicidal, but some pieces of evidence that this theory points to are just a little bit too much of a stretch for my taste. I know I bring up Occam's razor a lot, but in the case of this helmet, the simplest answer probably is the correct one, and it is just a reference to Rick's original Back to the Future inspiration. But even though the arguments against this theory are pretty overwhelming, I'm not going to rate it zero because on the off chance that the writers do decide to go in this direction, I'm gonna look like a complete idiot. So with that in mind, I'm going to rate the conspiracy of Rick's suicide helmet 0.5 boxes of time travel stuff out of five. But what do you think? Do you think that Rick has secretly been working on a suicide helmet throughout the duration of the show? Do you think that the helmet might serve some other story purpose? And how emotionally struck were you by the end of the episode Autoerotic Assimilation? Because I can tell you, it just wrecked me for like a good week or so. To get even more granular about Rick and Morty facts and to ensure that you didn't miss a single thing, we've handpicked a few episodes and broken them down. Tell us if you already knew all of these down in the comments. It was so long since we saw any new episodes of Rick and Morty before suddenly, burger time, a new episode appeared out of nowhere in April 2017. Whether you're a Rick and Morty fanatic keeping up with every episode or someone new wondering why everyone is suddenly talking about a McNugget sauce from 1998, we got the details of the season 3 premiere covered. Hi, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator and we're here to give you 7 facts about Rick and Morty season 3, episode 1, The Rick Shank Redemption. Let's get started before you can cry out, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub! Before the surprise premiere of season 3, we hadn't had a new episode of Rick and Morty since the season 2 finale in fall 2015, and quite understandably, the multitudes of hardcore Rick and Morty fans have been chomping at the bit for more. Well, Dan Harmon invited fans to place the blame for the delay entirely on himself. Quote, Rick and Morty keeps taking longer and longer to write, and I don't know why, he said in January 2017. Though of course there's an entire room of writers on Rick and Morty, and Harmon also mentioned that there was more in good spirit fighting going on about the show's direction. Not like I hate you, I'm gonna choke you fights, more like this joke is funnier fights. And lastly, at the end of the day, it's up to Adult Swim, not Harmon or Roiland, when Rick and Morty airs, so us kids have to wait for the prime time or whatever. Also, drawing things does take a while, but hey, at least we had their recreation of the Georgia vs. Denver Fenn Allen trial to tide us over. The season 3 premiere was the most epic April Fool's joke that's not actually joke in recent memory. It was completely unannounced, taking fans by absolute surprise when Adult Swim began began looping the episode on air and on their website on the night of April 1st. It was so sudden that many were initially skeptical that this could be possibly the real deal. Adult Swim Australia, in their infinite wisdom, promised fans an exclusive look into the opening scene of season 3. They gave the video the very ominously vague title, Rick and Morty New Clip, and when fans clicked on it, it was just a super cut of characters saying the lyrics to Never Gonna Give You Up, all taken from seasons 1 and 2. This made many fans angrier than Mr. Meeseeks, who, if you remember, has been forced to stay alive for a grueling 24 hours. But early 
earlier on April 1st, a fan nagged Harmon on Twitter for season three. Harmon's reply in retrospect was a dead giveaway. Quote, what if I waved a magic wand and made the first episode of season three premiere tonight? Is that what you'd want? End quote. Of course, the fan as well as everyone else wanted that, but no one dared to think Harmon was this serious, which he obviously enjoyed. As he rubbed in the fan's face as soon as the episode aired, happy now, mother but that was literally the only hint we got. If that agent's voice sounded familiar to you, it's probably because you've watched Firefly or Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog or Castle. In other words, you recognize Nathan Fillion. By the way, since he's met with such an unfortunate demise, we may also mention that the agent has a name, Corvelius Daniel, and he's a Gromflamite. There have been Gromflamites in Rick and Morty dating all the way back to the pilot, including objectively one of the best one-episode wonders, Crumbopolis Michael. Anyway, it's also worth noting that the season 3 premiered followed Rick and Morty's tried and true titling method of taking on unabashedly terrible puns. This one's called The Rick Shank Redemption, an obvious reference to the 1994 film The Shawshank Redemption. In case classic 90s dramas aren't your vibe, The Shawshank Redemption is about Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins planning a jailbreak through some tunnels. See what they did there? It all happened so fast and in such a whirlwind of excitement that you probably didn't have the breath when the episode was over to sit back and contemplate everything that happened. But The Rick Shank Redemption did the most violent shaking up of the universe since season 1's epic Rick Potion number 9, known to most as the Cronenberg episode, and this will contain major spoilers, so you're warned. Remember, we know that our Rick is Rick C-137. We actually don't know that about our Morty though, but we'll get to that soon. And we know this universe is neither our Rick nor Morty's original. Anyway, Summer first digs up the body of her original Rick and steals his portal gun just in case you've wondered if she forgot about that. Then, Rick body jumps multiple times, so that mind of Rick C-137 is no longer in the body of Rick C-137, which has the potential to be incredibly confusing for intergalactic authorities if any kind of government can keep itself together after that economy crash. In any case, it's great for our Rick, bad for, uh, like, literally anyone else. Lastly, let's briefly talk about how the Smith family that we followed for the first five and a half episodes of the series until Rick and Morty jumped dimensions to escape the Cronenberg catastrophe died in this episode. Let's repeat, the protagonists that introduced us to the series were killed. Do you feel that weird numbness to that knowledge? That's the price of interdimensional travel. Just to warn you guys, more major spoilers are ahead. Morty spends the entire episode trying to prove to Summer that Rick is not a hero and that bad things happen when you get involved with him. There's been ample development of Morty's dark side throughout season 2, perhaps most notably in the penultimate episode, Look Who's Purging Now, where Morty basically discovers his capacity to kill. After harping on why Rick is a damaging presence again and again, Morty uses that capacity in a very deliberate way and attempts to shoot Rick to kill. Of course, the gun was a fake, but Morty, uh, totally, he totally knew that. This thread of character development has led some to speculate that our very Morty, often called the first Morty in fan communities, is destined to become the evil Morty from season 1's Close Encounters of the Rick kind. Oof, those puns. However, it seems unlikely, considering that evil Morty appeared concurrently in time with the first Morty and that Harmon and Rowan have both said they are adamantly anti-time travel, despite the contents of Rick's supposed fake origin story from this episode. And stopping time is different, apparently. Besides, the theory that evil Morty is actually Morty C-137 and that the first Morty is not is quite intriguing indeed, but that's another matter entirely. Regardless of how the first Morty relates to evil Morty, it's pretty clear that our own Morty's arc is headed into some pretty dark territory indeed. The other popular fan theory that seemed for one bright, shining moment to get its own Rick Shank redemption was Rick's origin story, i.e. why did he abandon Beth and what happened to his wife? Many fans have capitulated for a long time that Rick's backstory featured a tragedy, very similar to the one shown in this episode, which led to Rick C-137 jumping into an alternate universe where Beth wasn't dead. Except, psych, that memory was a total fake, or was it? Honestly, given Rick's tendency to cover up his emotions behind all kinds of diversions, brash excuses, and non sequiturs, fans have been quick to point out that it's not impossible that there was some truth to that memory behind all of that pizzazz of Shoney's and Szechuan's sauce. So, you know, speaking of that sauce, Rick's craving for McDonald's 1998 Mulan Szechuan McNugget dipping sauce becomes a rather unexpected central plot point of this episode, and potentially the whole series. Nine more seasons, Morty. <clears throat> and no sooner had the episode aired than Rick's craving literally became all of our craving too, and the whole ordeal went legitimately viral. To the supreme annoyance of all McDonald's employees, April 2nd was largely spent telling waves of Rick and Morty fans that no, they haven't carried that Szechuan sauce since 1998. But it didn't stop there. McDonald's was immediately bombarded with tweets from Rick and Morty fans in their wild yearning. Even a change.org petition to bring back the sauce appeared that almost had 35,000 signatures at the time of the writing of this video. The frenzy got so intense that McDonald's actually responded to the Rick and Morty Twitter account, simply with McNugga Lubba Dub Dub, which, you 
you know, <laughs> how, how cute, I guess, right? Think it doesn't get any weirder? Well, the collective craving got so intense that a container of the sauce sold for $14,700 on eBay. Yeesh. If you think the sauce was lovingly kept by someone waiting for this unavoidable, long destined moment of cultural craving, well, you'd be wrong. The sauce packet in question was found by a man who bought a really old car and was cleaning it out. Meaning it was sitting Miss Dust in a car for 20 years, and in defense, whoever bought that auction, it came with some McDonald's wasabi sauce as well, so I guess you could say they got a pretty great deal. But will the rest of us who don't have tens of thousands of dollars to spare on this ever get to taste this legendary sauce? A McDonald's spokesperson told USA Today that, quote, we never say never, end quote. And the corporate chef of McDonald's said, quote, he'd see what he can do, end quote. With the live action version of Mulan coming out in 2018, it looks like we might not have to wait 97 years after all. Now that you've more or less come to terms with the fact that craving that sweet, sweet, spicy Szechuan sauce is now an essential part of your core being, you might naturally be wondering, when are we going to get the rest of season three? Unfortunately, right now we can say nothing more specific than this summer, but chin up old pal, because there's a widespread rumor that season three will contain 14 episodes, a swell upgrade from the usual 10. Plus, we know the name of episode two, Rick Manson the Stone. Meanwhile, if you're lucky enough to own an Oculus Rift or HTC Vive, there's a brand new Rick and Morty VR game called Virtual Rickality to keep you occupied. It's supposedly pretty great. Better than a Plumbus? Uh, hmm. And that's the way the news goes. I'm Justin from Stuff with Scoutfly, and thanks for watching 7 Facts About Rick and Morty Season 3, Episode 1. Rick and Morty is finally back. The highly anticipated follow-up to Adult Swim's epic April Fool's charade marked the first time we've gotten weekly multiverse adventures in almost two years. And thankfully, Rick Mansing the Stone is packed with detail and character nuance, leaving us plenty to talk about. Hi everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're going on a joyride with 7 Facts About Rick and Morty Season 3, Episode 2. Let's talk about it. You probably picked up on this, but this episode owes a teeny tiny bit to Mad Max Fury Road. The cars, the desert, the character design, I mean the first guy Summer kills is obviously based on the villain of Fury Road, a Morton Joe. And there are a couple references to the whole Shining and Chrome ordeal as well, like when that guy jumps on Rick shouting my body is Chrome. Even the formations the cars chase in are right out of Fury Road. But if you're not up to speed with the whole Mad Max franchise, there's quite a few details you probably missed. The most obvious of these is the barely discussed homage to the Thunderdome from the appropriately titled 1985 film, Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome. Even though this universe calls their version the Blood Dome, Rick cuts right through the illusion just as Rick usually would and calls it the Thunderdome. One key easy to miss detail is Summer's outfit, and let me just take this moment to say that that look suits her. But the outfit is basically a carbon copy of Tina Turner's Auntie Entity costume from Beyond the Thunderdome. Turner's character is the leader of the post-apocalyptic civilization and is generally described as ruthless, so interesting overtime tones there. On the other side of things, Hemorrhage, which itself is an A plus faux Mad Max name, looks like the designs were channeling Lord Humongous from Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior. But you know what's not a Mad Max reference? The episode's title, Rick Mancing the Stone. Nope, Romancing the Stone is a Robert Zemeckis film in which Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner go gem hunting in the jungle. It's more of a reference to Rick's determination to bring back that giant chunk of Isotope 322. There are way, way, way more Mad Max Easter eggs to be found, but we got lots more to cover, so so let's move on. Sometimes it's the little things that really make an episode stand out, and there are a lot of details in this episode. Every single car, person, and background had to be designed anew. Take for example the shot of the Blood Dome with the bleachers in the background. The crew estimates that there are 80 characters in that one shot, and to make things even harder on themselves, every single character has a unique design. Every single one of them. No wonder why this season took so long. It should come as no surprise then that the characters, costumes, and designs were painstakingly planned out and detailed. Character designer Elisa Phillips describes that this is a reality as a place where shit went down in the 90s. As a result, the characters look like 90s punkers. They also paid homage to Mad Max by, uh, you know, really one-upping the whole BDSM gear thing. One character, for example, has a gas mask with a tube that goes right to his crotch. There's also a very, very obvious S&M strain running through these characters. Writer Ryan Ridley sees this as a reflection of the post-apocalyptic mindset, going back to prime 
primal, sex, and violence, and how they intertwine. Can't wait. But the heart of the episode isn't its plethora of Mad Max references. It all serves as a platform for Summer and Morty to start coping with their parents' divorce. This is, after all, the very first time we see them after Beth and Jerry have split. The fact that Jerry has a moving truck in the beginning of the episode signals not too much time has actually passed. By the way, that Yuto truck is the exact same one that appears in the pilot, where it appears in the exact same position in front of the garage. But back then, it was Rick who was ostensibly moving out. Just to rub it in, Jerry. Loser. Anyway, the Mad Max setting has a real purpose to play here. Dan Harmon commented that Summer and Morty are attaining unexpected nourishment from the wasteland because it's a real form of chaos. And they're coming from what they perceive as an unnecessary chaos, which is their parents' divorce. So in this context, Summer is shown struggling with the divorce right from the beginning of the episode in the form of pent-up aggression. Mike McMahon, one of the show's writers, said that they wanted Summer to go through a small lifetime over the course of this episode. Suppose so she can work through all that anger and come out a little bit more mature on the other side. Justin Roiland added that she and Morty have different perspectives on their parents and their relationship. After all, in Total Recall, Summer sees Beth as a person who got pregnant too early and constantly makes it our problem. It feels like, for Summer at least, that the divorce is finally bringing a lot of long-standing frustration and resentment to the forefront. You might also have noticed, with a shiver down your spine, that when Summer comes into the room with Rick and Morty and says Hemorrhage and I are taking some time apart, it bears a lot lot of similarities to when Beth tells Rick, Jerry and I are going to spend some time divorced. There seems to be a theme cropping up this season of children slowly becoming their parents. Uncomfortable, isn't it? While Summer is arguably the focus of Rick Mancing the Stone, Morty still has plenty to cope with. He acts separate from and alarmed by Summer's murderous behavior until he gains Armathy, a giant deadly arm who helps him realize that he was sealing off pent up frustration as well. Primarily, he was angry at Jerry for acting like a baby and not a man. Harmon acknowledges that this is political politically incorrect by the way, but concedes it's an appropriate line of thought for a frustrated 14 year old boy. He just feels like his dad is giving up on his family. In fact, the writers fully intended Armathy to become a foil to Jerry in Morty's eyes, a literal strong armed father figure or role model, as opposed to Jerry, <coughs> loser. Armathy is also representative of a time tested trope, the evil hand, where a transplanted limb has autonomous thought and movement while granting the owner's body some kind of new power. In this case, it's super strength and uh, the ability to start working through your parents' divorce? Uh, I don't know. In case you were wondering, perhaps the most famous example of the evil hand is the impulsive hand of the titular character in Doctor Strangelove. There's also a movie called The Hand, starring Michael Caine. I bet you can you can guess what that one's about. We've grown as accustomed as we're ever going to be to Rick's status as the smartest being in the universe. But when he tells a Death Stock to save it for the semantics dome, E.B. White, the joke went over a lot of people's heads. Death Stalkers and viewers alike, except with the viewers, there was a certain level of shame and guilt involved because I'm certain every single one of us searched through our memories of elementary school and high school English classes to try to remember who the hell E.B. White was. But let us remind you, and ourselves, honestly, E.B. White is probably most familiar to you as the author of Charlotte's Web, Stuart Little, and Trumpet of the Swan. Yeah, he's actually that guy. No, the joke lies in the fact that in 1957, White revisited a 1918 text called Elements of Style and turned it into one of the preeminent guidebooks outlining the essential rules of the English language. Yeah. Time Magazine actually rated the guide as the 11th most influential work of nonfiction since 1923. They also called the guide a timeless reminder of the simplicity of proper writing. So there you have it, all that explanation for one joke. If you think that this wasteland is a generic wasteland location, oh boy, you know, you'd be mistaken. We've already discussed how much detail they've given the character design, so of course, there's more to the location as well. If you look real closely at the establishing shot of Summer and Hemorrhage hunting in the city, you'll notice the Space Needle in the background. And that sign right next to the Billy Board looks a hell of a lot like the famous Pike Place Market sign. That's right kids, this desert-like post-apocalyptic wasteland is Seattle, or at least driving distance from it. Also, one of the zombies they shoot has a plaid shirt tied around his waist, and let's be honest, that's probably the biggest giveaway of all. So to wrap up, let's talk about the new Season 3 intro, which actually debuted in this episode since 301 got no opening sequence during its original April Fool's broadcast, because boy, there's a lot to unpack here. 
here. With any new Rick and Morty opening sequence, half the fun as the season unfolds is seeing which tidbits are actually part of an episode and which are jokes confined to the intro. In Pickle Rick, we already unveiled the concerto scene with Rick and Morty tied to giant piano strings like a damsel on some railroad tracks. I'd also bet that our summer fighting alongside an alternate dimension cyborg summer is actually from an upcoming episode. There's precedent in the Rick and Morty comics for a badass multiverse fight in summer, so we're gonna have to be on the lookout. While I'm guessing that Buttface Morty watching Rubhub.tv is not going to pop up in any episode, the jury's actually out on four Mortys escaping what looks to be some kind of Morty University or boarding school for Mortys. But considering that none of them look like our Morty, one's a greaser, one's an insectoid, one has glasses, and one looks a little chubbier, though I have my doubts. One bit that's caught a lot of attention is when Rick is shopping at some kind of Morty store. For one thing, there's actually a bin of plumbuses that are on sale to Rick's left, so score there. But there's also the matter that the Mortys come stocked with very nerdy accessories. The purple Morty comes with a bath that looks suspiciously like Negan's from The Walking Dead, and the green Morty actually comes with what looks to be an awful lot like the Master Sword from the Legend of Zelda series. Which isn't surprising, because Roiland hasn't been exactly subtle on the show about his desire for attention from Nintendo. We can't forget about Squanch Tendo, his indie game studio. There's also the very, very conspicuous absence of Jerry from any of these scenes. Beth technically makes an appearance in the buttface dimension, but Jerry, nothing. The darkest year of our adventures, indeed. If you thought the season finales of Game of Thrones and Twin Peaks left your Sunday nights high and dry, boy, have we got news for you. With Rick and Morty spiraling its way into yet another stressful interdimensional close, fans can't help but nitpick all of the tiny details hidden in each 22 minute adventure because who knows when season four is going to happen. It's a legitimate question. The break between seasons two and three was literally 4,000 years long. With that being said, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to revisit seven facts about Rick and Morty season three, episode eight, AKA Morty's Mind Blowers. And away we go. <laughs> Morty's Mind Blowers premiered on September 17th, 2017, and is the eighth episode of Rick and Morty Season 3. The episode is just one of many clip show styled episodes Dan Harmon has produced, from Community's Paradigms of Human Memory to Rick and Morty's very own Total Rick All. For those of you who don't know, a clip show is a form of storytelling built in the same structure of a sonnet, a phone book, or a haiku, borrowing from various different elements and scenes to create one cohesive narrative. Though while traditional clip shows tend to borrow from scenes from previous episodes, Harmon has shown in the past that he just... He doesn't do that. In this episode, grandfather and grandson go through Morty's displaced memories, giving the audience insight on Rick and Morty's previous adventures and building on Rick's flaws as a character. By removing all of his own mistakes and embarrassments from Morty's memory, it's clear that Rick fears Morty's level of self-awareness and can't bear to admit that taking things for granted is indeed not a proper grammar conjunction. However, all self-deprecation aside, this episode allowed the writers to throw the show off its existential high horse. And only six of the show's writers contributed to the episode, so we really shouldn't take them for granted. From its jab at religion to acknowledging the media story that the creator's own quarrels inadvertently caused the show delays, as hinted by Summer just before the end credits, this chapter briefly brings the show back to the regular Rick and Morty formula. Morty's mind blowers came from the initial concept of Morty figuring out why aliens were <coughs> showering him with love all the time. There's just no correct way to say it, so we're just gonna leave it at that. When he figured out the truth, it apparently blew his mind, thus the creation of Morty's mind blowers. So how exactly were these mind blowers created? Well, a lot of them began as simple ideas in the writer's room. While initially each mind blower acted as an individual premise for a Rick and Morty adventure, they evolved into incredibly short sequences to fit episode 8's accessible storyline. Plenty of mind blowers were written, so of course a lot of them didn't make the cut. One in particular was a memory of Morty transforming into Jessica's hands. While he imagines a more sensual night with his crush, he's slapped silly, quite literally, by her clapping continuously at a concert, and the other two are just not safe for work. Let your imaginations run wild. While the episode wasn't heavy with guest stars, two names stood out to those familiar with classic Warner Brothers cartoons, Maurice LaMarche and Rob Paulson, the original voices of Pinky and the Brain. Even though LaMarche has played many side characters within the Rick and Morty universe, his reunion with Rob Paulson can be best heard in the squirrel bit where Morty causes an inevitable dimension jump. Never mess with the squirrels, Morty. God, those are like one step above mice and we know what mice do when Maurice LaMarche and Rob Paulson are voicing them. Also, the alien overlord was voiced by none other than and Jonas Breedus, the man who won the have a cameo role as an alien overlord who gets killed by Rick contest, because dreams do come true. All of this was done in support of Red, a charity that provides life-saving ARV pills to prevent HIV positive moms from passing viruses to their unborn babies. So in essence, while one alien overlord's life was lost,
lost, many other lives were saved. Let's backtrack to that Squirrel event for just a moment. According to the memory, both Rick and Morty had to relocate to an entirely different dimension. This effortlessly explains the events of the Rick Lantis mix-up, the last episode when Citadel Rick and Citadel Morty had to double-check their paperwork as if they were expecting to approach a different Rick and Morty. This goes with an interview in which Harmon explained that certain plot points are not canon unless they improve the overall story in some way. This rule allows for countless possibilities that don't necessarily trap the writers in a corner. With that being said, Morty's Mind Blowers leaves us to question, how many dimensions are we removed from the original Rick and Morty universe? This episode also plays into many evil Morty theories. During the compilation sequence, fans may notice that much of Morty's forgotten memories follow along the lines of constant abuse. This is a wonderful juxtaposition to evil Morty's first act in close Rick counters of the Rick kind when he forces Rick to revisit his own memories. With all that being said, these could be instances in which evil Morty was inspired to destroy Rick C-137. Maybe we'll have to revisit a cartoon conspiracy sometime in the future. It was a tough pill to swallow when Dan Harmon revealed there would be no interdimensional cable special for season 3. However, Morty's Mind Blower serves as this season's replacement to those hilarious snippets of TV shows and commercials from cable channels across the universe. In fact, it's still a refreshing anthology episode given season 3's intense turn of events and the need to build on its increasingly complex narrative. However, we do still receive bits of an interdimensional cable episode regardless of episode 8's premise. For instance, the show House Hunters, a parody of an HGTV show of the same name, is also a nod to the fictional show Bear Hunt on Weeds. I told you! Whoa. You can't miss the bear! While that half hour probably wasn't enough time to catch all of the Easter eggs, you have us to thank for the 2 a.m. hunt. Actually, it's 6 a.m. right now as I'm recording this. Mr. Meeseeks makes a brief appearance in Morty's menagerie in one of the bottom cells. Also, the women of Gazorpazorp are enclosed in the upper right of Rick and Morty's cell. Amongst the series of memories Morty binges back into his subconscious, Mr. Poopy Butthole appears to be proposing to a young and delighted Morty. So many raised questions right there. At the end of the episode, in which Jerry discovers his own mind-blowing device, the two cassettes within the box are labeled Sleepy Gary and the Apples Campaign, both referring back to previous Rick and Morty episodes. Also, are you all aboard the Gravity Falls Rick and Morty crossover conspiracy train? Well, at the beginning of the episode, one of the vials has a familiar name written on the label. Stanford. Now, we're a cartoon channel, so we're going to ignore the other vial that everyone else is talking about, for now. In addition to Stanford mingling in Morty's affairs, there's also a brief moment in which the terrorizing and terrifying Bill Cipher makes an appearance. Let's get all the references aside as well. The temple in space in which both Rick and Morty retrieve the truth tortoise is actually a setting pulled from the famous M.C. Escher lithograph, Relativity. While running through the temple, they're chased by a rather familiar figure from the comic book universe, who is best identified as Dream of the Endless, or Morty. Morpheus, the protagonist of The Sandman from Vertigo Comics. This guy takes on appearances based on whoever's looking at him and is a personification of all dreams and stories in existence. Seems pretty fitting for an episode based on Morty's lost memories, but this character is only seen within the first five minutes. In the midst of Morty's memories, there's a plot that borrows equally from films like Contact and The Martian. The death of Bebo is a killer reference to the horse gutting scene in The Revenant, or was it the Tauntaun in Empire Strikes Back? Then there's that Ghostbusters nod with Rick holding a portable containment unit, the Doolittle Quip you know what? It doesn't matter. Rest in peace, Bebo. While we would love to blurt out all of the other references, you can stay tuned for our inevitable Rick and Morty reference videos coming soon, right here on Channel Frederator. Rick and Morty is absolutely stacked with references. Those videos are definitely gonna happen. Also, bonus fact, for those of you who need the details on that Mr. Poopy Butthole scene, writer James Siciliano clarified that Mr. Poopy Butthole bought Morty his favorite bottle of wine, played the song of when they first met, let's get this party started, and proposed to Morty thereafter. True True love can cross dimensions, Morty. And there you have it. Once again, I'm Jacob, and thanks for watching 7 Facts About Rick and Morty Season 3, Episode 8, Morty's Mind Blowers. And to finish it all off, here's a fun breakdown of some aliens that people definitely wanted to see again during Season 3. Some did indeed make a comeback and have become mainstays in the series, but did they all survive the culling process? This is the top 10 Rick and Morty aliens we need in Season 3. One of the many reasons Rick and Morty stands out is the huge colorful array of weird aliens that constitute the show's supporting cast. Diving into the multitude of alien species can feel like opening up Pandora's box, so we're here to sort through the best of the best. Hi everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're counting down the top 10 Rick and Morty aliens. Before you can say garga blog blog, let's lay down some ground rules about what an alien species is. 
First of all, an alien can't come from Earth, which means hyper-intelligent dogs, scary Terry species, and Cronenbergs are out. Unfortunately, we reluctantly concluded that Meeseeks don't count either. Meeseeks are created on the spot from a device, so they don't come from somewhere else. We're also going to avoid hive minds. Beta-7 is referred to as a neighboring hive mind species, meaning that Beta-7 itself is a species. It's murky territory, and we're going to jump right over it. Now on with the show. If there's a standard alien in Rick and Morty, it's the Gromplumites from Gromplum Prime. These insectoids with genitalia that look just like their abs were prominently introduced in the pilot as bureaucrats worth shooting. They've continued to be Rick's victims ever since, right up to and definitely including the premiere of season 3. You see, not only were the Gromplumites in charge of the <clears throat> Galactic Federation, but they were also the guards and workers on the ground keeping the whole thing afloat. No wonder why Rick hates them so much, after all, he, Bird Person, and Squanchy were a rebel group. So, even though Gromplumites appear to be as much of an alien norm as could possibly exist, their history, influence, and imposed structure in the Rick and Morty multiverse is quite complex and pronounced. Or, you know, they're just a bunch of stupid bureaucrats who can produce asexually just to cook up their larva. Except Crumbopolis Michael, who is arguably the single best character in Rick and Morty, like, ever. He just loved killing so much. I'll never forgive you for that. Morty. Number 9. Zygerians. Zygerians are an entire species of con artists and bad ones at that. Not for lack of trying, they go to extensive lengths in M. Night Shama aliens to retrieve Rick's recipe for dark matter, a recipe that they've been after for years. They're desperate enough to stage a simulation, inside a simulation, inside a simulation, but are still extremely unsuccessful. Even though Rick and presumably everyone other than Jerry easily outsmarts them, the Zygerians' constant failure also stems from one very easily exploitable weakness and intense aversion to nudity. So if you're ever caught by a Zygerian, just pull down your pants and you'll be fine. Except you won't be caught by a Zygerian because Rick might have killed their whole species, or at least a very good chunk of them. We also salute the Zygerians for their lowest power simulation of Earth, specifically for the Appleys and the gift that is human music. Hmm, human music, ugh. I love it. Number 8. Gear People Gear people are pretty self-explanatory. They're people made out of gears. And they really revel in their bodily constitution, boasting epic names like Revolio Clockberg Jr., not Gearhead, that's rude, because naming a gear child Gearhead is kind of like naming a human Frederick Skinstein or Melissa Joan Hart. Uh, oh yeah. We're not going to weigh in on whether or not gear people are robots, they're made out of gears and are great engineers, but can have sex. The issue feels almost as contentious as the infamous gear wars themselves. One major downside of being entirely made out of similar looking gears, or upside if you have a twisted mind like Rick, is that certain parts of a gear person's body can become interchangeable when they really shouldn't be. Like their mouth and their, uh, Gear stickles. I suppose that's what you get for having your genitalia accessible through a small glass door. Seriously, you'd think they could at least lock it? Number 7. Alien Parasites Okay, fine, you know what, we admit it. This one is kinda, kinda like cheating. At the same time, the alien parasites from Total Recall provide an incredibly unique situation. When you see them for what they actually are, they're ugly, tubular buggers with horrible mouth tentacle things. But you only see their true one-of-a-kind form once you've killed one. You see, these parasites are telepathic. When they come to a new planet, they invent and embody a new persona and insert themselves into your memories. And the characters aren't the kind to just blend into the planet's logic. They're usually zany weirdos like Pencil Vester, Photography Raptor, or Tinkles, the Flying Fairy Sheep. The parasite multiply by making their targets actively remember a situation, and when they've multiplied enough, they take over the planet and enslave entire races. So yeah, that's a pretty dramatic downside, but the upside is when you're suddenly sharing a room with Hammer-Eye, Ghost in a Jar, and Reverse Giraffe, which makes them amazing, though from a distance. Number 6. Plutonians Okay, you know what, I'll admit it, I'm a bit biased towards the Plutonians. There's a large part of me that sort of agrees with Jerry. I think many of us remember Pluto's planethood being stolen in the anger we felt. No, just, just, just me and Jerry. Point is, it's rather hilarious to turn the irritation of Earth's non-scientists into a species of adorable, very short aliens who go bonkers for anyone who still asserts that Pluto is a planet. And the real genius is to undercut the Plutonians' dogged assertion about their planet by showing that their own mining is causing Pluto to shrink. Well played, Harmon. But is that why Plutonians rank so high? Well, uh, only partially. They're also wondrously named. You got King, F King Flippy Nips? 
You got the uh, the outcast scientist Scroopy Noopers. I mean, you know, the Rick and Morty naming game is is very high, but these were some of the early standouts of the series. Number five, Cromulons. Cromulons are gigantic heads that pretty much just float around in space. The presence of just one change to Earth's climate and their voices can presumably be heard over the entire planet. It's easy to see how Principal Vagina was able to start a cult religion so quickly when they appeared, but the Cromulans don't really care about being worshiped or gaining power, no. They care about entertainment. You see, the Cromulans have run 988 seasons of a reality show that's kind of like American Idol, except if your planet's band loses, your entire planet is exterminated, or in other words, deleted. They're fun guys. Maybe the Cromulans would have seemed less intimidating if anyone hadn't noticed the huge, weird butts that they have on the opposite side of their face. Really though, we're just hyper curious on how they reproduce since it seems like their whole species is male. And you know, other reasons as well. Shoot me what you got. Number four, Gazorpians. Gazorpian society is arguably the most fascinating in Rick and Morty to date. It all started during the Great Passive Aggression, which is an extremely good name. But this is when female Gazorpians separated themselves from the males, built a gorgeous city, and established a matriarchy. The males got to play outside, but don't feel too bad for them, male Gazorpians are notably primal, brutal, and aggressive. The females, on the other hand, are highly intelligent and can perform telekinesis. Their technology is so advanced that they invented and sent out sex robots to the males. Their species can therefore continue without the females ever directly dealing with the males. They can just kick back, relax, and drink mojitos. Unfortunately, female Gazorpians can be a bit harsh and judgmental, like planet-wide silent treatment for bad bangs harsh, like a uh, fart warrants the death sentence harsh, or on the other hand, their customary greeting is, I'm here if you need to talk, which is something I could I could definitely get used to. Plus, you can't forget that this species also gives us Gazorpazorp fields, so, you know, that definitely counts for something. Number three, gaseous antimatter, aka, you know, the fart species. Who doesn't love gaseous antimatter who views all carbon-based life forms as a disease. Don't get me wrong, as much fun as universal genocide sounds, that's not really why we're here. No, Fart had way more going for him. And if we dig deeper into this, he doesn't have a mouth, ears, or eyes for that matter. He's just a floating ball of gas with some balls of light, and he communicates through telepathy. And he can use that telepathy with a quick, decisive, lethal precision that makes even Rick momentarily speechless. Most importantly though, Fart sings awesome songs about moon men. That would be special enough, but Fart also accompanies his songs with psychedelic imagery reminiscent of all the trips you never took in the 70s. It's honestly quite overwhelming to think there's a planet, perhaps a whole dimension, filled with clouds like fart. It's, it's really too bad that a species would have killed us all. Number two, bird people. Even though bird person is one of the few recurring characters outside of the Smith family, we don't actually know that much about bird people or their home world. For example, is every bird person named bird person or were every bird person's parents just really really uncreative. Actually, the species itself is not wholly original. It's very, very likely a reference to the character Hawk and his species, the Tangara Mantu, from the early 80s sci-fi adventure series Buck Rogers in the 25th century. In any case, Dan Harmon's totally deadpan performance as Bird Person instantly made the character a fan favorite to the point where we savor every new detail we get on his species and the home world. When Morty ends up on Bird World and Get Swifty, it felt like we were presented with something that we only really that we wanted so bad the moment we got it. I'm not sure if you're going to agree, but I think Bird World seems pretty awesome. Everyone lives in giant nest-like houses, and they have cool technology like robotic eggs that you can crack to see a personalized holographic message. Who doesn't want that? All I'm saying is that I would totally consider moving there and living a quiet life on a worm farm. Number one, Garblovians. Here at Frederator, we love the underdog, and as far as we know, Garblovians are irritable, straightforward creatures. They're ugly little guys who basically only say garga blog blog and they're prone to spontaneously combusting into blue goop. And they're amazing. Harmon and Roiland know exactly when to pull out a Garblovian and it's comedy gold like every time. There's yet to be a named Garblovian character, except of course for Glorp de Blorp, a video game streamer who appeared in a teaser for season three. They're relatively new to the series as well, only coming into play during season two, although Morty met one in the Simpsons couch gag. So for us hardcore Garblovian fans, there's plenty of room for these wonderful weirdos to develop and have their day. But you know, to be honest, if they keep popping up every now and then and dropping a Garga blog blog, that's cool too. Just just don't go Garblovians, please, please, just don't go. And there you have it, our top 10 Rick and Morty aliens. Which is your favorite and did we leave any out? Let us know in the comments section down below. There are so many runners up. 
Cat People, Nuptians, Shlami, the list is as long as the multiverse is expansive. Wow, congratulations on making it to the end of this video. I'm honestly surprised that you managed to absorb all this information without your brain leaking out through your ears or you entering like a cosmic horror coma. Hopefully you learned something new about Rick and Morty, and if you didn't, congrats. You could probably make your own video or teach a course on it. Before you get up and do a thousand push-ups, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching, and remember, Frederator loves you.